Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. In the bustling city of Mumbai, there lived a diligent student named Ravi. Ravi was not just an average student. He had an insatiable thirst for knowledge, particularly in the realm of finance and taxation. One afternoon, while preparing for his upcoming exams on the direct tax code, he found himself bewildered by the complexities of its provisions, particularly those of Section 1. As fate would have it, his mentor, a renowned chartered accountant named Mr. Sharma, was in town, and Ravi seized the opportunity to seek his guidance. Mr. Sharma, known for his exceptional storytelling skills, welcomed Ravi with a warm smile. Ah, Ravi, I can see the curiosity in your eyes. Let's embark on a journey through the provisions of Section 1 of the Direct Tax Code. We will weave this information into a real-life case study. He began, imagine a scenario where a middle-class family in Mumbai, the Khanna family, is trying to understand how these provisions affect their financial decisions. The Khannas have a modest income, and like many families, they wish to understand the implications of taxation on their savings and investments. Firstly, Ravi, Mr. Sharma explained, the direct tax code simplifies the understanding of various tax provisions. Section 1 lays the groundwork for the code, Introducing the very essence of taxation in India. The section begins with the title and objectives, highlighting the need for a comprehensive framework that encompasses direct taxes. As Ravi listened attentively, Mr. Sharma continued, Under this section, we encounter several subsections. The first subsection emphasizes the applicability of the code. This means that the provisions of the direct tax code apply to all individuals. Hindu undivided families, firms, and corporations unless explicitly stated otherwise. Take the Khanna family as an example. Their income from salaries and investments falls under the purview of this code, making them subject to its provisions. The second subsection focuses on the definition of key terms, Mr. Sharma elaborated. In the context of the Khanna family, understanding what constitutes income is crucial. Income can arise from various sources, such as salaries, house property, business profits, and capital gains. For instance, if Mr. Khanna sells an inherited property and makes a profit, that profit is considered income under this provision. Ravi was captivated. But what about the different rates of tax, Mr. Sharma? Ah, that is indeed an important aspect, Ravi, Mr. Sharma replied. While Section 1 does not delve into tax rates, it lays the foundation for subsequent sections that address these matters. The Khanna family, being middle class, would benefit from certain exemptions and deductions available to them. For example, under the direct tax code, individuals can claim deductions for investments made in specified savings instruments, thereby reducing their taxable income. As they continued their discussion, Mr. Sharma highlighted the importance of compliance with the code. Ravi, the Khanna family must maintain proper records of their income and expenditures to ensure accurate reporting. Noncompliance could lead to penalties, the reality they must be aware of. To illustrate further, Mr. Sharma shared a real-life case study. There was a family similar to the Khanas who were unaware of certain deductions available under the direct tax code. They paid more tax than necessary due to a lack of understanding. However, once they consulted a financial advisor, they realized they could claim deductions for their children's education and home loan interest. This knowledge saved them a significant amount in taxes. As the sun began to set, casting a warm glow over the city, Ravi felt enlightened. Mr. Sharma concluded, Ravi, the provisions of Section 1 of the Direct Tax Code serve as the cornerstone of understanding direct taxation in India. They ensure that every individual, like the Khanna family, is aware of their rights and responsibilities concerning taxation. The key takeaway is to be informed and proactive in financial matters. With newfound clarity and inspiration, Ravi thanked Mr. Sharma for his invaluable insights. He left with a determination to not only excel in his exams, but also to help families like the Khanas navigate the complexities of the direct tax code in the future. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. In the vibrant city of Bengaluru, Ravi, a dedicated student of finance, was deep into his studies of the direct tax code. Despite his efforts, he found himself struggling to grasp the intricacies of the provisions outlined in Section 2. Seeking clarity, 
he decided to reach out to his esteemed mentor, Mr. Sharma, a chartered accountant known for his engaging storytelling and ability to simplify complex topics. One sunny afternoon, Ravi visited Mr. Sharma's office, a cozy space filled with books and mementos from his successful career. Mr. Sharma welcomed him with a smile and gestured for him to sit. Ah, Ravi, I hear you're grappling with Section 2 of the Direct Tax Code. Let's explore it together through a real-life case study. With a twinkle in his eye, Mr. Sharma began, Imagine a fictional character, Priya, a young entrepreneur in Bengaluru. She runs a successful startup that manufactures eco-friendly products. Priya is keen to understand how Section 2 of the Direct Tax Code impacts her business and personal finances. Section 2 primarily deals with definitions and the scope of income tax, Mr. Sharma explained. The first subsection outlines the definition of various terms that are crucial for interpreting the code. For instance, it defines person to include individuals, Hindu undivided families, firms, associations of persons, and companies. This means that every entity, like Priya's startup, falls under the scope of the code. Ravi nodded, absorbing the information. So, this definition broadens the applicability of the tax code? Exactly. Mr. Sharma replied enthusiastically. Now, let's delve into the next subsection, which defines income. This provision states that income includes profits, gains, dividends, and any other earnings that a person or entity may receive during the financial year. For Priya, this encompasses not only the profits from her business, but also any dividends from investments she may have made. To illustrate this, consider that Priya also invests in shares of a tech company. When she receives dividends from those shares, that amount is classified as income and is subject to taxation under the direct tax code, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Ravi was intrigued. What about capital gains? How does that fit into this framework? Great question, Mr. Sharma said, pleased with Ravi's curiosity. Section 2 also addresses capital gains, which arise when an asset is sold for more than its purchase price. Suppose Priya buys land to expand her business and later sells it at a profit. The profit she makes from that sale is treated as a capital gain, and the provisions of the direct tax code dictate how that gain will be taxed. He then shared a real-life anecdote to solidify the concept. There was a case involving a startup founder similar to Priya who sold his shares in a successful venture. Initially unaware of the capital gains tax implications, he was surprised by the tax liability that arose from the sale. However, once he understood the provisions of Section 2, he consulted a financial advisor and was able to plan effectively, mitigating his tax burden through exemptions and deductions available for long-term capital gains. As they continued their discussion, Mr. Sharma emphasized the importance of documentation. Ravi, it is crucial for Priya to maintain proper records of her income, expenses, and transactions. Accurate documentation will ensure that she can justify her income and claim any deduction she is entitled to under the direct tax code. He then pointed out the significance of compliance. The provisions of Section 2 require all taxpayers, including Priya, to file their income tax returns accurately. Failing to do so can lead to penalties, which is a reality she must navigate. Ravi absorbed these insights, feeling a sense of clarity wash over him. Mr. Sharma concluded, the essence of Section 2 lies in its definitions and scope, providing a framework for understanding how income and its various forms are treated under the tax system. For individuals and businesses alike, like Priya's startup, it is vital to grasp these concepts to make informed financial decisions. With gratitude in his heart, Ravi thanked Mr. Sharma for his invaluable guidance. Armed with this newfound knowledge, he left with a determination to excel not only in his studies, but also to assist future entrepreneurs like Priya in navigating the complexities of the direct tax code. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. In the bustling streets of Chennai, Ravi, the ambitious finance student, was preparing for his examinations on the direct tax code. After successfully unraveling the mysteries of Section 1 and Section 2, he found himself eager, yet anxious to tackle Section 3. Recognizing that this section delves into the scope of income, he decided to consult his esteemed mentor, Mr. Sharma, 
a chartered accountant renowned for his engaging storytelling and practical approach to complex subjects. One sunny afternoon, Robbie visited Mr. Sharma's office, where the air was filled with the scent of freshly brewed coffee. Ah, oh, Ravi, ready for another enlightening session? Mr. Sharma greeted him warmly. Robbie nodded enthusiastically, and Mr. Sharma invited him to sit. Today, we will embark on a journey through Section 3 of the Direct Tax Code, using a real-life case study to illustrate its provisions. With a gleam in his eye, Mr. Sharma began, let us imagine a character named Suresh, a hard-working individual from Chennai. Suresh is an IT professional with multiple streams of income, including a salary, freelance work, and rental income from an apartment he owns. He is keen to understand how Section 3 affects his overall tax liability. Section 3 is pivotal as it outlines the scope of income that is taxable under the direct tax code, Mr. Sharma explained. The first subsection clearly states that all income earned by a person during the financial year is subject to tax unless specifically exempted. This means that every source of income Suresh receives will be scrutinized under this provision. Ravi listened intently, pondering how this applied to Suresh's various income sources. Mr. Sharma continued, For instance, Suresh's salary from his IT job is straightforward. It falls under the category of income from salaries. However, what about his freelance work? That income is also taxable and would be classified as income from business or profession. To illustrate, there was a case involving a friend of Suresh who, like him, was an IT consultant. This individual started freelancing on the side without realizing that his freelance earnings were also taxable. When he finally filed his income tax return, he faced penalties for not reporting that income. However, once he understood the provisions of Section 3, he was able to rectify his mistake and claim deductions related to his business expenses. Now, let's consider Suresh's rental income, Mr. Sharma continued. This income would fall under the category of income from house property. Under Section 3, the code specifies how this income should be calculated, including permissible deductions for expenses such as property taxes and maintenance costs. Robbie's eyes lit up with understanding. So, it's important for Suresh to keep track of all these different sources of income and their respective deductions? Absolutely, Ravi, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Proper documentation is crucial. Suresh must maintain records of his salary slips, invoices for his freelance work, and details of rental agreements to ensure accurate reporting. He then touched on the importance of exemptions. Another key aspect of Section 3 is that it outlines certain exemptions. For example, Suresh can claim exemptions on income earned from investments in specified savings instruments, such as public provident fund or national pension scheme. This provision encourages individuals to save for their future. Mr. Sharma further explained, there was a real-life case involving a couple who invested in a tax-saving fixed deposit scheme. They initially believed that their entire investment would be tax-exempt. However, they learned through proper consultation that only the interest earned on such investments is tax-exempt up to a specified limit. They were grateful for the guidance they received, which helped them plan their finances more effectively. As their discussion progressed, Mr. Sharma emphasized the consequences of noncompliance. Ravi, it is essential for Suresh to file his income tax return accurately and on time. Failure to do so can lead to penalties and a potential audit. The provisions of Section 3 serve as a reminder that ignorance is not an excuse when it comes to tax compliance. Feeling enlightened, Ravi took a moment to reflect. So, Section 3 really highlights the importance of understanding what constitutes taxable income and how various sources contribute to one's overall tax liability? Precisely, Ravi. Mr. Sharma concluded with a smile. By comprehending these provisions, individuals like Suresh can make informed financial decisions, maximizing their deductions and ensuring compliance with the tax code. With newfound clarity and enthusiasm, Ravi thanked Mr. Sharma for his invaluable insights. He left the office with a determination to excel in his studies and a commitment to assist others in navigating the complexities of the direct tax code. The lessons learned from Suresh's case would serve as a guiding light in his future endeavors. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. In the lively city of Hyderabad, Ravi 
the eager finance student, was making significant strides in his understanding of the direct tax code. Having mastered the intricacies of sections 1, 2, and 3, he was now poised to delve into section 4. This section primarily pertains to the taxation of various types of income, and Ravi was keen to grasp its provisions. Remembering the engaging storytelling approach of his mentor, Mr. Sharma, Ravi decided to pay him a visit for guidance. On a bright Saturday morning, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, which was filled with the soft hum of conversation and the aroma of fresh coffee. Mr. Sharma greeted him warmly and invited him to sit. Ravi, I see you are eager to tackle Section 4 of the Direct Tax Code. Let's explore this together through a real-life case study, he said, settling into his chair. Let's consider a fictional character named Anita, Mr. Sharma began. Anita is a young professional working as a software engineer in Hyderabad. She has various sources of income, her salary, freelance projects, and interest from her fixed deposits. Anita wants to understand how Section 4 impacts her tax liabilities. Section 4 is critical because it outlines the taxation of different income types, Mr. Sharma explained. The first subsection addresses income from salaries. For Anita, her salary is her primary source of income. The direct tax code provides clear guidelines on how this income should be calculated, taking into account deductions for professional tax and certain contributions. Anita should also be aware of the tax slabs that apply to her income level. If she earns a substantial salary, she might fall into a higher tax bracket. To illustrate, there was a case of a young professional who, like Anita, was unaware of how his salary would be taxed. Upon receiving a significant raise, he suddenly found himself in a higher tax bracket, resulting in a larger tax deduction from his salary. Understanding the provisions of Section 4 would have helped him anticipate this change. Mr. Sharma continued, The next subsection of Section 4 deals with income from house property. Suppose Anita owns a small apartment that she rents out. The income generated from this rental property is classified as income from house property. She can claim deductions for property taxes and maintenance costs. If Anita were to sell the property later, any profit she makes would fall under the capital gains tax provisions, which we discussed earlier. Ravi nodded, comprehending the link between various income types and their tax implications. So, it's essential for Anita to keep records of her rental income and related expenses? Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Proper documentation is vital for accurate tax filing. If Anita fails to maintain records, she may miss out on potential deductions, resulting in a higher tax liability. There was a real-life scenario involving a family that rented out their property but neglected to document their expenses. When it came time to file their taxes, they realized they could have significantly reduced their taxable income if they had only kept better records. Now, let's move on to income from business or profession, Mr. Sharma continued. If Anita takes on freelance projects, this income would be classified as income from business or profession. The direct tax code allows her to deduct expenses incurred while earning that income. For instance, if she buys a new laptop for her freelance work, that cost can be deducted from her taxable income. Ravi raised a brow, intrigued by this deduction aspect. What about interest from fixed deposits? How is that treated? Great question, Mr. Sharma said, impressed with Ravi's curiosity. Interest earned on fixed deposits is categorized under income from other sources. Under Section 4, this income is fully taxable. However, there is a threshold for interest income that is exempt from tax. For instance, if Anita earns less than a certain amount from her fixed deposits in a financial year, she may not need to pay tax on that interest. Mr. Sharma then shared a pertinent anecdote. There was an individual who relied heavily on interest income from fixed deposits. Initially, he was blissfully unaware that his interest income exceeded the exempt limit. When he filed his tax returns, he faced an unexpected tax liability. If he had consulted a financial advisor and understood the provisions of Section 4, he could have adjusted his investments accordingly to optimize his tax situation. As their discussion progressed, Mr. Sharma highlighted the significance of compliance with the direct tax code. Ravi, it is crucial for Anita to file her income tax return accurately and within the stipulated deadline. 
Failure to comply can result in penalties and interest on the unpaid tax. Ravi, feeling enlightened, summarized. So, Section 4 clearly delineates how various types of income, including salaries, rental income, business income, and interest, are taxed, providing a comprehensive framework for individuals like Anita. Precisely. Mr. Sharma concluded with a smile. By understanding the provisions of Section 4, individuals can make informed financial decisions, ensure compliance, and maximize their tax efficiency. With gratitude and newfound clarity, Ravi thanked Mr. Sharma for his insightful guidance. He left the office with a determination to excel in his studies and assist others in navigating the complexities of the direct tax code, just as he had learned from Anita's case study. The journey through Section 4 had enriched his understanding of income taxation, empowering him for the future. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. In the historical city of Jaipur, Ravi, a passionate finance student, was delving deeper into the nuances of the direct tax code. After comprehensively studying Sections 1 through 4, he was eager to explore Section 5, which focuses on the various provisions regarding the computation of income. To aid his understanding, he sought the wisdom of his mentor, Mr. Sharma, a renowned chartered accountant known for his engaging narratives and practical examples. One bright morning, Ravi made his way to Mr. Sharma's office, where the walls were adorned with awards and photographs from his successful career. Upon entering, Mr. Sharma greeted him with a warm smile and gestured for him to take a seat. Ravi, ready to unlock the mysteries of Section 5, he asked with enthusiasm. Ravi nodded eagerly, excited for the lesson that lay ahead. Let's dive into the story of a character named Ramesh, Mr. Sharma began. Ramesh is a middle-class professional living in Jaipur who works as a financial analyst. Recently, he started investing in the stock market and renting out a small portion of his house. Ramesh is curious about how Section 5 of the Direct Tax Code will impact his income computation. Section 5 outlines the provisions related to the computation of income under various heads, Mr. Sharma explained. The first subsection deals with the computation of income from salaries. Ramesh receives a monthly salary, which is straightforward. However, he should also be aware of the deductions available, such as contributions to the Employee Provident Fund and professional tax. Ravi listened intently, taking notes. So, if Ramesh contributes a portion of his salary to the Provident Fund, that amount could be deducted from his taxable income? Precisely, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Understanding these deductions is vital for Ramesh to minimize his taxable income effectively. There was a case involving an employee who did not claim his Provident Fund contributions as a deduction, resulting in a higher tax liability. Once he realized this oversight, he was able to amend his return and reclaim some of the taxes paid. Now, moving on to the next subsection, we address the computation of income from house property, Mr. Sharma continued. In Ramesh's case, if he rents out a portion of his home, he must consider the rental income he receives. This income is subject to tax, but he can also deduct expenses such as property tax and maintenance costs. For example, if Ramesh pays property tax of 20,000 rupees annually, he can deduct that amount from his rental income. Ravi's eyes widen with understanding. That's a significant saving. But what happens if Ramesh incurs expenses while maintaining the property? Great question, Ravi, Mr. Sharma replied. Any reasonable expenses incurred for the maintenance of the property can be deducted from the rental income. However, it is essential for Ramesh to keep accurate records of these expenses to substantiate his claims. As they delve deeper, Mr. Sharma explained the provisions related to business income. The next subsection covers income from business or profession. If Ramesh decides to start a small consultancy on the side, he must consider the income he earns from that venture. Under this provision, he can deduct business expenses incurred, such as office supplies and travel costs. For instance, if Ramesh spends 10,000 rupees on marketing his consultancy, he can deduct that amount from his taxable income. Ravi contemplated this. So, maintaining proper records is crucial for Ramesh's business expenses as well. Absolutely, Mr. Sharma emphasized. Proper documentation ensures that Ramesh can claim all eligible deductions reducing his overall tax liability. 
There was a real-life example of a consultant who neglected to keep track of his expenses and ended up overpaying taxes. Once he organized his records, he was able to reclaim some of the overpaid taxes. Continuing with their discussion, Mr. Sharma introduced the topic of income from other sources. The last subsection of Section 5 pertains to income from other sources. In Ramesh's case, any interest earned from his savings account or fixed deposits falls under this category. This income is fully taxable, but Ramesh should be aware of any applicable exemptions for certain amounts of interest income, particularly under the Income Tax Act. To illustrate this, let me share a story of an individual who earned significant interest from multiple fixed deposits. Unaware of the tax implications, he was surprised to discover that his total interest income pushed him into a higher tax bracket. If he had understood Section 5 and the nature of his income, he could have adjusted his investments to optimize his tax situation, Mr. Sharma added. As their session came to an end, Mr. Sharma emphasized the importance of compliance with the direct tax code. Ravi, it is crucial for Ramesh to file his income tax return accurately, reflecting all his sources of income and claiming eligible deductions. Noncompliance could lead to penalties, interest on unpaid taxes, and potential scrutiny from tax authorities. Ravi, feeling enlightened, responded, So, Section 5 provides a detailed framework for computing income from various sources, allowing individuals like Ramesh to understand how to minimize their tax liabilities effectively. Exactly, Ravi, Mr. Sharma concluded with a proud smile. By mastering the provisions of Section 5, individuals can make informed financial decisions and ensure compliance with tax regulations. With gratitude and newfound clarity, Ravi thanked Mr. Sharma for his invaluable guidance. He left the office inspired and motivated to excel in his studies, determined to assist others in navigating the complexities of the direct tax code. The lessons learned from Ramesh's case would serve as a foundation for his future endeavors in finance and taxation. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. In the vibrant city of Pune, Ravi was advancing in his studies on the direct tax code. Having thoroughly explored sections 1 through 5, he was now ready to tackle section 6, which delves into the deductions available under the tax code. Eager to deepen his understanding, he once again sought the expertise of his mentor, Mr. Sharma, a chartered accountant well-known for his storytelling prowess and real-life case studies that made complex topics relatable. One afternoon, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office a cozy space filled with books and awards. Ravi, excited to uncover the treasures of Section 6 today. Mr. Sharma greeted him with enthusiasm. Ravi nodded, ready for another engaging lesson. Let's meet a new character, Nita, Mr. Sharma began. Nita is a young marketing professional who recently bought a home and is eager to understand the tax deductions available to her under Section 6 of the Direct Tax Code. With the rising cost of living, she is keen on maximizing her savings through effective tax planning. Section 6 is crucial because it outlines various deductions that individuals can claim to reduce their taxable income, Mr. Sharma explained. The first subsection focuses on deductions available for interest paid on housing loans. Nita, having taken a loan to buy her home, can claim a deduction for the interest component of her EMI payments. This deduction can go up to 2 lakh rupees per annum if the loan is taken for the purchase of a self-occupied house. Ravi's eyes widened in interest. So, if Nita pays, for instance, 1 lakh 50,000 rupees in interest during the financial year, she can claim that entire amount as a deduction? Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. However, if she pays more than 2 lakh rupees in interest, she can only claim up to that limit. Let me share a real-life case. There was an individual named Amit who, like Nita, had taken a substantial loan for his first home. Initially unaware of this provision, he missed out on claiming a significant deduction when filing his tax return. It was only later that he realized he could have significantly reduced his taxable income. Ravi nodded, grasping the importance of this deduction. What about deductions for principal repayment? Great question, Mr. Sharma continued. The second subsection of Section 6 allows deductions for the principal repayment of the housing loan. Nita can claim a deduction of up to 1.5 lakh rupees on the principal repayment, which adds to her overall tax savings. 
This is particularly beneficial for first-time homebuyers, as it encourages them to invest in property. To make it more relatable, Mr. Sharma shared another anecdote. I once advised a couple who were first-time homebuyers. They were delighted to discover that in addition to the interest deduction, they could also claim a principal repayment deduction. By optimizing their deductions, they managed to reduce their taxable income significantly, leading to a much lower tax liability than they anticipated. Now, let's discuss deductions available for investments in specified savings schemes, Mr. Sharma said. Under Section 6, individuals can claim deductions for investments made in certain instruments, such as the Public Provident Fund or Equity Link Savings Scheme. If Nita invests 50,000 rupees in these instruments, she can claim that amount as a deduction under Section 80C. Ravi was quick to connect the dots. So, these deductions are an excellent way for Nita to save on taxes while also planning for her future? Absolutely, Mr. Sharma replied with enthusiasm. Moreover, the direct tax code encourages saving and investment, which is vital for financial stability. Let me tell you about a client of mine who invested in a combination of these savings schemes. He was amazed at how these deductions reduced his tax burden while simultaneously building a secure financial future. As they continued, Mr. Sharma elaborated on the next important deduction concerning health insurance. Another critical aspect of Section 6 involves deductions for premiums paid on health insurance policies. Nita can claim deductions for premiums paid for herself, her spouse, and her dependent parents. The deduction limit is up to 25,000 rupees for her and her spouse, and an additional 25,000 for her parents if they are below 60 years of age. If her parents are above 60, the limit increases to 50,000 rupees. That's fantastic, Ravi exclaimed. So, if Nita pays a total of 30,000 rupees for health insurance, she can deduct that amount from her taxable income? Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. However, just like with other deductions, proper documentation is crucial. I remember advising a family that was unaware they could claim deductions on premiums for their parents' health insurance. By utilizing this provision, they managed to significantly reduce their tax liability. As they neared the end of their discussion, Mr. Sharma introduced the topic of donations. The final subsection of Section 6 discusses deductions for charitable contributions. If Nita donates to specified charitable organizations, she can claim deductions under Section 80G. The percentage of the deduction varies based on the type of charity. For instance, Donations to certain relief funds may qualify for a 100% deduction, while others may only qualify for 50%. Robbie pondered this information. So, Nita can support causes she cares about while also reducing her tax burden? Precisely, Robbie. Mr. Sharma replied with a smile. This provision not only encourages philanthropy, but also ensures that individuals like Nita can contribute to society while managing their tax liabilities effectively. As their session wrapped up, Mr. Sharma emphasized the importance of strategic tax planning. Ravi, understanding Section 6 allows individuals like Nita to optimize their tax liabilities through available deductions. It is essential for her to keep track of her investments and expenses to claim these deductions accurately. Feeling enlightened and motivated, Ravi expressed his gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Your real-life examples have made the provisions of Section 6 much clearer for me. With newfound knowledge and clarity, Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, inspired to apply the lessons learned in his studies and to help others navigate the intricacies of the direct tax code. The story of Nita and her journey through Section 6 would serve as a guiding framework for his future endeavors in finance and taxation. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. In the bustling city of Chennai, Ravi was eager to expand his knowledge of the direct tax code. Having successfully navigated sections 1 through 6, he was now ready to explore section 7, which focuses on the taxation of capital gains. Recognizing the value of practical insights, he once again sought the guidance of his mentor, Mr. Sharma, a chartered accountant renowned for his storytelling skills and ability to simplify complex subjects. One sunny afternoon, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, where he was greeted with warmth and enthusiasm. Ravi, 
Are you ready to dive into the fascinating world of capital gains taxation under Section 7? Mr. Sharma asked, his eyes sparkling with excitement. Ravi nodded, eager to learn. Let's meet a character named Suresh, Mr. Sharma began. Suresh is a software engineer living in Chennai who has been actively investing in the stock market and real estate. Recently, he sold a few shares in a property, and he wants to understand how Section 7 impacts his tax obligations regarding these capital gains. Section 7 deals primarily with the taxation of capital gains arising from the sale of capital assets, Mr. Sharma explained. It categorizes these gains into two types, short-term and long-term. The duration for which an asset is held determines its classification. If Suresh sells a capital asset, such as shares, within 12 months of acquisition, the gains are considered short-term. Conversely, if he holds the asset for more than 12 months, the gains are classified as long-term. Ravi listened intently, eager to grasp the distinctions. So, if Suresh buys shares in a company and sells them after six months, any profit he makes will be considered a short-term capital gain? Precisely, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Short-term capital gains are taxed at the applicable income tax slab rates. This can lead to a higher tax liability for Suresh, especially if he has a substantial income. There was a case of an investor who sold shares after a few months, not realizing how significantly it would affect his tax return. Once he learned about the short-term capital gains tax, he adjusted his future investment strategy to hold assets longer whenever possible. Now, let's discuss long-term capital gains, Mr. Sharma continued. If Suresh holds his shares for over a year before selling them, any profit will be classified as long-term capital gains. These gains are currently taxed at a flat rate of 20%, which is more favorable compared to short-term gains. This encourages investors to hold their assets for a longer duration. Ravi pondered this information. That sounds like a smart strategy for tax efficiency. But what about Suresh's real estate investments? Excellent point, Mr. Sharma replied. The taxation of capital gains from real estate works similarly, but there are some specific provisions. If Suresh sells a property he has owned for more than two years, the profit will be considered a long-term capital gain and taxed at the same flat rate of 20%. However, he can benefit from certain exemptions if he reinvests the gains in a residential property under Section 53. To illustrate this, let me share a story, Mr. Sharma continued. I once advised a couple who sold their apartment after living there for over five years. They were initially unaware that by reinvesting the proceeds into a new residential property, they could completely exempt their long-term capital gains from taxation. This exemption significantly impacted their financial situation, allowing them to invest their money in a new home without the burden of tax liability. Ravi was intrigued by the potential benefits of reinvestment. What happens if Suresh sells a property that has appreciated significantly in value? Good question, Ravi, Mr. Sharma replied. In such a scenario, Suresh may face a substantial tax liability on the capital gains. However, he should keep in mind that he can also deduct certain expenses related to the sale, such as brokerage fees and the cost of improvements made to the property during his ownership. This can help reduce the overall taxable capital gain. As they continued their discussion, Mr. Sharma introduced the concept of indexation. Another important aspect of long-term capital gains is the provision for indexation. This allows taxpayers to adjust the purchase price of an asset for inflation. When Suresh sells an asset after several years, he can increase the purchase price based on the cost inflation index, effectively reducing his taxable gains. Can you give an example? Ravi asked his curiosity peaked. Certainly. Let's say Suresh bought a piece of land for 1 million rupees 10 years ago. If he sells it today for 5 million rupees, the nominal gain would be 4 million rupees. However, if the indexation factor for the past 10 years is, say, 1.5, Suresh can adjust his purchase price to 1 million multiplied by 1.5, resulting in a higher adjusted cost. This means he can reduce the capital gains tax on the sale by claiming the benefit of inflation. Wow, that's a valuable strategy, Ravi exclaimed. It's amazing how indexation can affect the tax outcome. Indeed it is, Mr. Sharma agreed. Understanding these provisions can significantly impact one's financial decisions.
Now, let's talk about the importance of maintaining accurate records. Suresh should keep track of all relevant documents, including purchase agreements, sale agreements, and records of improvements made to the property or assets. This documentation will support his claims for deductions and exemptions. As their session drew to a close, Mr. Sharma emphasized the significance of strategic planning in capital gains taxation. Ravi, by understanding Section 7 and its provisions, Suresh can make informed decisions about his investments, minimize tax liabilities, and optimize his financial outcomes. Feeling enlightened and motivated, Ravi expressed his gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Your real-life examples have made the provisions of Section 7 so much clearer for me. With newfound knowledge and clarity, Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, inspired to apply the lessons learned in his studies and to assist others in navigating the intricacies of the direct tax code. The story of Suresh and his journey through capital gains taxation would serve as a guiding framework for his future endeavors in finance and taxation. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. In the scenic city of Hyderabad, Ravi was excited to delve into another important aspect of the direct tax code. After exploring sections 1 through 7, he was now ready to tackle section 8, which covers the taxation of income from various sources. Eager to learn more, Ravi sought the expertise of his mentor, Mr. Sharma, a well-respected chartered accountant known for his engaging storytelling and real-world case studies that brought complex subjects to life. On a sunny afternoon, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, where he was greeted with his usual warmth. Ravi, ready to explore the diverse world of income sources under Section 8? Mr. Sharma asked, his eyes filled with enthusiasm. Ravi nodded, eager for another enlightening session. Let's meet a character named Priya, Mr. Sharma began. Priya is a young entrepreneur who runs a small cafe in Hyderabad. Recently, she has been receiving various forms of income, and she wants to understand how Section 8 affects her tax obligations concerning this income. Section 8 primarily addresses the taxation of income from sources such as salary, house property, business or profession, capital gains, and income from other sources, Mr. Sharma explained. It categorizes these incomes and specifies how they should be treated for tax purposes. To illustrate this, let's start with Priya's income from her cafe, Mr. Sharma continued. Since she operates a business, the income she earns from selling food and beverages falls under the category of business income. This income is calculated by subtracting the allowable business expenses from her total revenue. Ravi was intrigued. So, if Priya earns 5 lakh rupees in revenue but spends 2 lakh rupees on supplies, rent, and other expenses, her taxable income would be 3 lakh rupees? Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. However, it's crucial for Priya to maintain accurate records of her income and expenses. I once advised a small business owner who didn't keep proper records, resulting in a higher tax liability. Once he organized his books, he was able to claim legitimate business expenses and significantly lower his taxable income. Ravi nodded, understanding the importance of proper documentation. What about Priya's other sources of income? Good question, Mr. Sharma replied. Next, let's discuss her income from house property. Priya owns a small apartment that she rents out for additional income. This rental income is also taxable under Section 8. She can claim deductions for property tax and maintenance costs, similar to how we discussed in previous sections regarding the taxation of rental income. Let's say Priya earns 30,000 rupees a month from rent, but she pays 10,000 rupees in property tax annually, Ravi interjected. That means her taxable income from the property would be 350,000 rupees, right? Correct, Mr. Sharma said, pleased with Ravi's comprehension. However, she must also keep records of any expenses incurred for maintenance to ensure accurate reporting. Now, let's move on to another potential source of income, Mr. Sharma continued. If Priya invests her savings in fixed deposits or mutual funds, the interest earned from these investments falls under the category of income from other sources. This income is taxable, but it's essential for her to keep track of the total interest earned throughout the year. Ravi was quick to ask. So, if Priya earns 20,000 rupees in interest from her investments, that amount will also be included in her taxable income? Absolutely, Mr. Sharma replied. 
But it's crucial to remember that some forms of interest income may qualify for exemptions up to a certain limit. For instance, under Section 80T, interest income from savings accounts can be exempt up to 10,000 rupees. As they continued their discussion, Mr. Sharma explained the provisions regarding capital gains. If Priya sells any investments, such as shares or property, the profits from those sales may also be taxable as capital gains. We discussed this in Section 7. But it's essential to remember that the nature of the asset and the holding period will determine whether the gains are classified as short-term or long-term. Let's consider an example Mr. Sharma proposed. Suppose Priya bought shares in a technology company for 50,000 rupees and sold them a year later for 70,000 rupees. The 10,000 rupees profit would be a short-term capital gain and taxed at her applicable income tax slab. Ravi nodded, grasping the concept. And if she held on to those shares for more than a year before selling, it would be considered a long-term capital gain, taxed at a lower rate? Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Understanding these nuances is essential for effective tax planning. As their session approached its conclusion, Mr. Sharma emphasized the importance of compliance with the tax code. Ravi, it's crucial for Priya to file her income tax return accurately, reflecting all her sources of income and claiming any eligible deductions. Failing to do so could lead to penalties and interest on unpaid taxes. Feeling enlightened, Ravi expressed his gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Your real-life examples have made the provisions of Section 8 much clearer for me. With newfound knowledge and clarity, Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, inspired to apply the lessons learned in his studies and to assist others in navigating the complexities of the direct tax code. The story of Priya and her various sources of income would serve as a guiding framework for his future endeavors in finance and taxation. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. In the vibrant city of Bengaluru, Ravi was eager to continue his exploration of the direct tax code. Having successfully studied sections 1 through 8, he was now prepared to tackle section 9, which addresses the taxation of income deemed to accrue or arise in India. Recognizing the complexities of this topic, Ravi sought the guidance of his mentor, Mr. Sharma, a chartered accountant celebrated for his storytelling prowess and practical case studies that transformed intricate subjects into relatable lessons. On a crisp afternoon, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, where he was welcomed with a warm smile. Ravi, are you ready to navigate the intriguing world of income deemed to accrue or arise in India under Section 9? Mr. Sharma asked, his enthusiasm palpable. Ravi nodded, eager for another enlightening session. Let's meet a character named Aman, Mr. Sharma began. Aman is an international business consultant who frequently travels to India for work. He has clients across various sectors, and he wants to understand how Section 9 impacts his tax obligations concerning the income he earns in India. Section 9 primarily deals with income that is deemed to accrue or arise in India, regardless of whether the recipient is a resident or a non-resident, Mr. Sharma explained. This section specifies the types of income that fall under this category, which can include income from business operations, property, and royalties, among other sources. To illustrate this, let's consider Amman's situation, Mr. Sharma continued. Whenever Amman provides consulting services to clients based in India, any income he receives from these services is considered income accruing in India. Even if Amman is based outside India, this income will still be taxable in India. Ravi was intrigued. So, if Amman earns 10 lakh rupees from his consulting work in India, he would be liable to pay taxes on that income in India? Precisely, Mr. Sharma affirmed. This situation is not unique to Amman. Many foreign professionals working in India face similar tax obligations. I once advised a software developer from the United States who was working on a project in India for several months. He was surprised to learn that his income for that period was taxable in India, even though he remained a resident of the U.S. Now, let's discuss another aspect of Section 9, Mr. Sharma continued. If Aman rents out property he owns in India, the rental income he receives will also be considered income accruing in India and will be taxable, regardless of his residency status. Ravi nodded, grasping the implications. 
So if Amon owns an apartment in Bengaluru and rents it out for 50,000 rupees a month, that income would be subject to tax in India? Exactly, Mr. Sharma said. Additionally, Amon can claim deductions for expenses related to maintaining the property, such as property tax and maintenance costs, which can help reduce his taxable income from the rental property. Let's consider the case of royalties, Mr. Sharma suggested. If Amon has created a software program that he licenses to companies in India, any royalty payments he receives will also be deemed to accrue or arise in India. These payments are subject to tax in India, regardless of where Amon resides. Wow, I didn't realize how extensive this section was, Ravi remarked, impressed by the depth of information. Are there any exemptions or special provisions under Section 9? Good question, Ravi, Mr. Sharma replied. While Section 9 establishes broad guidelines, there are specific provisions for certain types of income. For instance, some countries have tax treaties with India that may reduce the tax rate on certain types of income, such as royalties or fees for technical services. It's essential for Amman to be aware of these treaties, as they can significantly impact his tax liabilities. To illustrate, let's say Amman is receiving royalties from an Indian company for a software product. If there is a tax treaty between India and Amman's home country that allows for a reduced tax rate of 10% on royalty income, Amman would benefit from this provision rather than being taxed at the standard rate, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi was beginning to connect the dots. So, understanding these treaties can lead to substantial savings for foreign professionals working in India? Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Being informed about the tax treaties can help minimize tax exposure. However, proper documentation and compliance are crucial. Amman should maintain all necessary records, including contracts, invoices, and receipts, to substantiate his claims. As their session drew to a close, Mr. Sharma emphasized the importance of compliance with the tax code. Ravi, it is vital for Amman to file his income tax return accurately, reflecting all income deemed to accrue or arise in India. Failure to do so could lead to penalties and interest on unpaid taxes. Feeling enlightened, Ravi expressed his gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Your real-life examples have made the provisions of Section 9 much clearer for me. With newfound knowledge and clarity, Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, inspired to apply the lessons learned in his studies and assist others in navigating the complexities of the direct tax code. The story of Aman and his various income sources would serve as a guiding framework for his future endeavors in finance and taxation. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. In the bustling city of Mumbai, Ravi was excited to continue his journey through the direct tax code. After gaining insights into sections 1 through 9, he was now ready to explore section 10, which deals with exemptions from the computation of taxable income. Recognizing the importance of understanding exemptions in effective tax planning, Ravi sought the expertise of his mentor, Mr. Sharma, a chartered accountant renowned for his engaging storytelling and real-world case studies. On a bright morning, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, eager to learn. Ravi, are you ready to explore the fascinating world of exemptions under Section 10? Mr. Sharma greeted him with a warm smile. Ravi nodded enthusiastically ready for another informative session. Let's meet a character named Neha, Mr. Sharma began. Neha is a hardworking professional who has recently received a promotion at her company. Along with her new role, she has started exploring various avenues for investment and savings. She wants to understand how Section 10 can help her minimize her taxable income through exemptions. Section 10 outlines various exemptions that individuals can claim thereby reducing their taxable income, Mr. Sharma explained. These exemptions cover a wide range of income sources, such as agricultural income, certain allowances, and specified types of investments. To illustrate this, let's start with agricultural income, Mr. Sharma continued. If Neha inherits a piece of land in Maharashtra and starts farming on it, the income she earns from selling crops is considered agricultural income, which is completely exempt from tax under Section 10. Ravi was intrigued. So, if Neha earns 2 lakh rupees from her farming activities, she won't have to pay any tax on that income? Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. However, 
It's important for Neha to maintain proper records of her agricultural activities to substantiate her claim. I once assisted a farmer who had been paying taxes on his agricultural income simply because he didn't know about this exemption. Once we provided the necessary documentation, he was relieved to find that his income was exempt. Now, let's discuss another exemption, Mr. Sharma continued. Neha might also receive allowances from her employer, such as a house rent allowance, HRA, if she lives in a rented apartment. Under certain conditions, she can claim an exemption on a portion of her HRA, reducing her taxable income. Can you explain how that works? Ravi asked, eager to learn more. Certainly. Let's say Neha's monthly salary includes a house rent allowance of 20,000 rupees. If she pays a rent of 30,000 rupees, she can claim an exemption based on the least of the following. The actual HRA received, the rent paid in excess of 10% of her salary, or 50% of her salary if she lives in a metro city. Proper documentation of the rent agreement and payment receipts is essential to substantiate her claim, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Ravi nodded, beginning to grasp the concept. So, if Neha's basic salary is 50,000 rupees, she could potentially claim an exemption of 10,000 rupees, since it's the least of the three amounts? Exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed. This strategy can lead to significant tax savings, especially for professionals living in urban areas with high rental costs. Let's consider Neha's investments as well, Mr. Sharma continued. If she invests in specified financial instruments, such as Public Provident Fund, PPF, or Equity Link Savings Schemes, ELSS, she can claim exemptions under Section 80C, reducing her taxable income. Is there a limit to how much she can claim for these exemptions? Ravi inquired. Yes, there is, Mr. Sharma replied. The maximum deduction allowed under Section 80C is 1.5 lakh rupees in a financial year. This means that if Neha invests that amount in eligible instruments, she can effectively reduce her taxable income by that amount. I once worked with a client who, by maximizing their investments in tax-saving instruments, significantly lowered their tax liability and improved their overall financial situation. As their discussion continued, Mr. Sharma introduced the concept of the standard deduction for salaried individuals. In recent years, the government has allowed a standard deduction of 50,000 rupees for salary taxpayers. This deduction is automatically available and helps reduce the taxable income without the need for specific documentation. Ravi was impressed. That's a straightforward way for employees to lower their tax burden without much hassle. Exactly, Mr. Sharma agreed. It simplifies the process for taxpayers and encourages compliance. As their session neared its conclusion, Mr. Sharma emphasized the importance of keeping abreast of current provisions. Ravi, it is vital for Neha to stay informed about the various exemptions under Section 10 and any changes in the tax code. By being proactive, she can effectively minimize her tax liability and optimize her financial planning. Feeling enlightened, Ravi expressed his gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Your real-life examples have made the provisions of Section 10 much clearer for me. With newfound knowledge and clarity, Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, inspired to apply the lessons learned in his studies and assist others in navigating the intricacies of the direct tax code. The story of Neha and her journey through the available exemptions would serve as a guiding framework for his future endeavors in finance and taxation. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi was continuing his journey through the direct tax code and had now reached Section 11, which deals with taxation of income from property held for charitable or religious purposes. Intrigued by how charities and religious institutions manage their taxes, he sought the guidance of his mentor, Mr. Sharma, the seasoned chartered accountant known for his ability to bring complex topics to life through stories. One sunny morning, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, eager to learn about the next section. Good morning, Mr. Sharma. I'm ready to understand Section 11 and its provisions. Mr. Sharma smiled warmly. Ah, Section 11. This section is vital for understanding how income from property held for charitable or religious purposes is treated under the tax code. Let's meet another character today. His name is Arun. Mr. Sharma began his narrative. Arun is the head of a charitable trust based in Pune. His trust focuses on providing free education to underprivileged children. 
Now, Arun wants to understand how the trust's income is taxed, or rather, how it can be exempt under the provisions of Section 11. Section 11 provides exemptions on income derived from property held under a trust or institution, but only if the income is used for charitable or religious purposes in India, Mr. Sharma explained. The section ensures that trusts and institutions, which are set up with a charitable or religious motive, are not taxed like regular income-generating entities, as long as they follow certain rules. Let me give you a simple example, Mr. Sharma continued. Arun's trust owns a piece of land in Pune, which it rents out to generate income. The rent is used entirely to fund the school that the trust runs for poor children. Under Section 11, the rental income that Arun's trust earns from this property is exempt from tax, provided it is used solely for charitable purposes, such as running the school. Robbie was intrigued. So, as long as the trust uses the income for charitable activities, like providing education, it won't have to pay taxes on that income? Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. However, there are certain conditions that must be met for the income to remain exempt. One key condition is that the trust must spend at least 85% of its income on its charitable or religious activities in the same financial year. If Arun's trust earns 10 lakh rupees from the property, it must spend at least 8 lakh 50,000 rupees on its charitable work during the same year. Ravi nodded, starting to see the broader picture. And what happens if the trust is unable to spend 85% of its income within the same financial year? That's a great question, Mr. Sharma replied. If the trust is unable to spend the required 85%, it can apply to the tax authorities to accumulate or set aside the unspent amount for a specified purpose. However, the accumulated funds must be used within a certain time frame, typically within five years, for the approved charitable or religious purpose. To clarify, let's say Arun's trust earns 10 lakh rupees in a financial year, but only spends 6 lakh rupees on running the school. The trust can apply to accumulate the remaining 4 lakh rupees for future projects, such as building a new classroom. As long as the money is used for the same charitable purpose within 5 years, it will not be taxed. Ravi was impressed with the flexibility of the provision. So, as long as the trust sticks to its charitable purpose, it can accumulate funds without losing its tax-exempt status? Exactly, Mr. Sharma responded. But there's another key aspect that Arun must keep in mind. If the trust's income is used for any purpose other than the charitable or religious activities it is meant for, then the income will no longer be exempt. The trust could lose its exemption status and become liable to pay taxes on its entire income. To illustrate this, Mr. Sharma continued, suppose Arun's trust decides to use some of the income to invest in shares of a company for profit. If the income is not used for charitable purposes but instead for profit-making investments, it could lead to the loss of the tax exemption under Section 11. It's crucial for Arun to ensure that all income is used strictly for the trust's approved charitable activities. Ravi leaned forward, eager to absorb more. Are there any other important provisions under Section 11? Yes, there are, Mr. Sharma replied. The section also allows for exemptions if a trust receives voluntary contributions, such as donations, which are specifically meant for its charitable or religious activities. For instance, if Arun's trust receives a donation of 5 lakh rupees from a well-wisher, that amount would also be exempt from tax, provided it is used for the trust's charitable work. Mr. Sharma paused, then added, however, the trust must keep detailed records of how the income and donations are used. Transparency is key here. The trust must file its income tax returns and disclose all its activities to the tax authorities. I once worked with a charitable institution that failed to maintain proper records of its expenses. It resulted in unnecessary scrutiny, and the trust had to pay taxes on income that would have otherwise been exempt. Ravi was starting to understand the critical importance of compliance. So, as long as Arun's trust maintains proper documentation and ensures that the income is used solely for charitable purposes, it can benefit from the tax exemptions under Section 11? Exactly, Mr. Sharma concluded with a satisfied smile. The key takeaway is that charitable trusts like Arun's can enjoy significant tax benefits, but only if they strictly adhere to the provisions of Section 11. By following the rules, 
trusts can focus on their charitable goals without the burden of paying taxes on their income. Feeling enlightened, Ravi thanked Mr. Sharma. Your real-life example of Arun's trust has made the provisions of Section 11 so much clearer for me. I can see how important it is for charitable institutions to stay compliant. With a deeper understanding of the tax provisions for charitable institutions, Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, inspired to explore the world of taxation for nonprofit organizations. The case of Arun's trust would serve as a guiding example in his future endeavors as he navigated the complexities of tax law and charitable work. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi was deep into his studies of the direct tax code, having just learned about Section 11. Now, he was curious about Section 12, which addresses the conditions under which income is exempt in the hands of charitable or religious trusts or institutions. He turned to his trusted mentor, Mr. Sharma, a renowned chartered accountant who always explained even the most complicated provisions through relatable, real-life stories. It was a quiet afternoon when Ravi met Mr. Sharma for their next session. Sir, today I'm eager to understand Section 12. I know it is connected to trusts, but how does it differ from Section 11? Ravi asked with a curious look. Mr. Sharma smiled and nodded. Great question, Ravi. Section 12 deals with voluntary contributions received by charitable or religious institutions, and it defines how these contributions are treated under the direct tax code. The section is closely linked with Section 11, but it specifically focuses on donations and contributions that trusts receive. Let me tell you the story of a trust that I worked with, the Shakti Welfare Foundation. He began his story. The Shakti Welfare Foundation is a charitable trust that focuses on women's education and empowerment in rural areas. Like many trusts, they rely heavily on voluntary donations to fund their initiatives, such as scholarships and training programs. Now, the foundation recently received a large sum of money as a donation from a corporate donor, and they wanted to know how this would impact their tax liabilities under the direct tax code. Section 12, Mr. Sharma explained, states that voluntary contributions made to a charitable or religious trust are considered income. However, the key here is that if these contributions are applied towards charitable purposes, then the trust can claim an exemption under Section 11. In other words, even though the donations are treated as income, they can still be exempt from tax, provided the trust uses them for its charitable goals. Ravi was intrigued. So, if Shakti Welfare Foundation receives 10 lakh rupees as a donation, that amount is considered income, but they don't have to pay tax on it as long as it's used for charitable work? Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. However, there's an important distinction to be made here. Contributions that come with a specific direction from the donor that they should form part of the trust corpus are treated differently. In such cases, these donations are directly added to the trust capital or corpus and are not counted as income for the purposes of tax. Essentially, these corpus donations enjoy a separate status. Let me give you an example, Mr. Sharma continued. Suppose the Shakti Welfare Foundation receives a contribution of 5 lakh rupees and the donor specifies that this money is to be added to the trust corpus. In this case, that amount won't be considered income, and the trust doesn't need to apply it within that financial year for charitable purposes. It's treated as part of the trust's permanent fund, and there is no obligation to spend it immediately. Robbie's face lit up in understanding. That's interesting. So, donations directed towards the corpus provide more flexibility for the trust while regular donations must be spent on charitable purposes to qualify for the exemption. Exactly, Mr. Sharma replied. Corpus donations are often more stable for long-term planning, while regular donations come with the condition that at least 85% must be spent on charitable activities within the financial year or accumulated for future projects as allowed under Section 11. Seeing Ravi's growing interest, Mr. Sharma shared another important point. There's one more aspect to keep in mind, Robbie. If a trust receives anonymous donations, those are taxed at the maximum marginal rate. This rule was introduced to prevent misuse by organizations that could potentially hide unaccounted money through anonymous contributions. So, transparency in accepting donations is crucial for trusts. Robbie leaned forward, curious about the real-world implications. 
What happens if Shakti Welfare Foundation receives donations without knowing who the donors are? Mr. Sharma explained further. If the trust receives anonymous donations, such as through a public event or a charity drive, and the donor's identity cannot be traced, then that portion of the income will be taxed at the maximum rate. For example, if they receive 1 lakh rupees anonymously during a fundraising event, that amount will be taxed unless they can prove who the donors are. That makes sense, Ravi nodded thoughtfully. It encourages transparency and discourages any potential misuse. Mr. Sharma agreed. Absolutely. Charitable trusts and institutions need to maintain transparency in all their transactions. I once worked with a charitable trust that didn't properly account for some of its donations, and it ended up losing its tax-exempt status for that year. It was a costly mistake that could have been avoided with better record-keeping. Ravi, now fully immersed in the session, asked, So, to sum up, as long as the trust maintains proper records, uses regular donations for charitable purposes, and keeps corpus donations separate, they can continue enjoying tax exemptions under sections 11 and 12. Precisely, Mr. Sharma smiled. Trusts and institutions, like the Shakti Welfare Foundation, must be careful in maintaining clear documentation and ensuring that the funds are used as intended. By doing so, they can benefit from the provisions of section 12 while fulfilling their charitable goals. Feeling enlightened, Ravi thanked Mr. Sharma. Your story of Shakti Welfare Foundation really helped me understand the provisions of Section 12. I now see how important it is for charitable institutions to manage their contributions properly. As Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, he felt confident in his growing knowledge of the direct tax code. The case study of Shakti Welfare Foundation would serve as a guiding framework as he navigated the intricacies of tax law for charitable and religious institutions in the future. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi, by now deeply engrossed in his studies of the direct tax code, was ready to understand a more complex section. He had worked his way through various sections with the help of his mentor, Mr. Sharma, the experienced chartered accountant known for his knack of breaking down even the toughest legal provisions through engaging real-life case studies. Today, Ravi was about to learn the nuances of Section 13. One afternoon, as Ravi walked into Mr. Sharma's office, he sat down with his notebook ready. Sir, I've been reading about Section 13, and it seems like it's about denying exemptions to charitable or religious trusts under certain circumstances. Could you explain it to me in a simpler way? Mr. Sharma smiled warmly, sensing Ravi's curiosity. Absolutely, Ravi. Section 13 is critical because it lays down situations in which charitable or religious trusts could lose the exemptions they enjoy under Section 11 and Section 12. Let me tell you the story of Sundaram Educational Trust, a real-life example I dealt with. Ravi leaned in closer, ready for the story. Mr. Sharma began. Sundaram Educational Trust was established to provide affordable education to underprivileged children. It had been operating smoothly for several years, receiving donations, and enjoying tax exemptions. However, a few years ago, things took a wrong turn, and they risked losing their exemptions. Ravi was intrigued. What happened, sir? Here's where Section 13 comes into play, Mr. Sharma explained. This section specifies certain conditions under which a trust or institution will not be eligible for exemptions under Sections 11 and 12. In the case of Sundaram Educational Trust, the trouble started when one of the trustees, Mr. Ramesh, used a part of the trust funds for his personal benefit. This directly violated the conditions under Section 13. Ravi frowned in confusion. So, because one trustee used the funds improperly, the trust lost its tax exemptions? Mr. Sharma nodded. That's right. Let's break down the key provisions of Section 13 to understand this better. One major provision is that if any part of the income or property of a trust is used or applied directly or indirectly for the benefit of certain specified persons, such as trustees, their relatives, or any other key individuals connected to the trust, the trust loses its exemption status for that year. He continued, in Sundaram Educational Trust case, Mr. Ramesh used some of the trust funds to renovate his personal property. Even though the trust's objective was charitable, this misuse of funds was a violation of Section 13, 
and the entire income of the trust became taxable. Robbie took notes furiously, his eyes wide. So, the income of the entire trust becomes taxable if they break these rules? Exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed. But that's not all. Section 13 also states that if the trust invests its funds in prohibited forms of investment, such as shares or other risky assets, it could lose its tax exemption as well. Trusts are supposed to invest in safe, government-approved securities to ensure that the funds are used properly for charitable purposes. Mr. Sharma paused for a moment to let Ravi absorb the information before adding, Another situation where a trust could lose its exemptions is if its income is used for purposes outside India. For example, Sundaram Educational Trust was supposed to use its funds strictly for providing education in India, but if they had diverted the funds to a project abroad, they would have lost their exemptions under Section 13. Ravi nodded thoughtfully. So, trusts need to be very careful about how they use their funds and ensure that the trustees don't misuse them. That's right, Ravi, Mr. Sharma said with a smile. And there's more. Section 13 also lists out specific people, referred to as specified persons, who should not receive undue benefits from the trust's income or assets. These include the founder of the trust, trustees, any relatives of the trustees, and even individuals who have a substantial interest in the trust. Let me illustrate this with an example, Mr. Sharma continued. Imagine that the Sundaram Educational Trust founder, Mr. Sundaram, owned a piece of land. If the trust decided to rent that land from Mr. Sundaram at an inflated price, that would be considered as benefiting a specified person, which would violate Section 13. Robbie's eyes widened in surprise. Even renting property from a trustee at an inflated rate could cause them to lose their exemption? Yes, Mr. Sharma said firmly. The trust cannot directly or indirectly benefit these specified persons. Whether it's giving loans, paying inflated salaries, or overpaying for services provided by the trustees, any financial benefit that goes to these people can lead to the trust losing its exemption for the entire financial year. Robbie sat back thinking about how carefully a trust financials must be managed. So, it's not just about doing charity, but also about keeping everything above board and transparent? Mr. Sharma nodded. Absolutely. The tax authorities are very strict when it comes to ensuring that charitable and religious trusts do not misuse their funds for personal or private gains. Trusts must focus on their charitable purposes and ensure that none of their funds are diverted. He added, I had seen the case of Sundaram Educational Trust get quite complicated. They had to go through a full audit, repay the taxes on their income, and it took them a lot of time and effort to restore their compliance. But they learned their lesson and now maintain strict controls on how their funds are used. Robbie was impressed with the level of responsibility required. So, if trusts follow all the rules under Section 13, they can continue to enjoy tax exemptions under Sections 11 and 12, right? Exactly, Mr. Sharma replied with a satisfied smile. The provisions of Section 13 are there to ensure that trusts remain focused on their charitable or religious purposes. If they break the rules by benefiting trustees, making prohibited investments, or using funds outside India, they lose their exemptions. But if they stay compliant, the trust can keep operating without paying taxes on its income, which means they can put more resources into doing good. Robbie left the office that day with a clear understanding of how crucial compliance is for charitable and religious trusts. The story of Sundaram Educational Trust had taught him that while tax exemptions could help such institutions grow and serve their purpose, they came with strict conditions to ensure that the funds were used appropriately. It was a valuable lesson on transparency, accountability, and the importance of adhering to the law. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Robbie had been studying diligently under the guidance of his mentor, Mr. Sharma, the chartered accountant known for his storytelling approach to teaching tax law. Having understood various sections of the direct tax code through vivid real-life examples, Robbie was now ready to explore Section 14, which addressed income under different heads, particularly under salaries. He sat down with Mr. Sharma one evening, eager to dive into the topic. Sir, Ravi started, I've been reading about how income is categorized for taxation, and I came across Section 14. Can you explain it to me in a way that I can relate to, maybe through one of your case studies? 
Mr. Sharma leaned back in his chair, smiling as always when he saw his students' thirst for knowledge. Ah, section 14. This section is crucial because it divides income into different heads for tax purposes. Let me tell you about a case involving one of my clients, Rajesh, who had a salary job but also earned income through other sources. His story will help you understand this section better. Ravi settled into his seat, ready to listen as Mr. Sharma began. Rajesh is a marketing manager in a large firm. He earns a salary, which is his primary source of income. Now, according to Section 14 of the Direct Tax Code, income is classified under five heads. Salaries, income from house property, profits and gains of business or profession, capital gains, and income from other sources. For Rajesh, most of his income was under the head salaries, but there were other complications that we had to address. Mr. Sharma explained that Section 14 laid out how income under different heads is to be taxed. Rajesh's salary was straightforward. It included his basic salary, allowances, bonuses, and perquisites. All of these were taxed under the head of salaries. But where it got tricky was when Rajesh started earning rental income from a property he owned and some interest income from investments. That's where understanding the different heads of income became important. Ravi was intrigued. So, Rajesh had income under multiple heads? Exactly, Mr. Sharma replied. While his salary was taxed under the head of salaries, the rent he received from his house was taxed under income from house property, and the interest he earned was taxed under income from other sources. Each of these has its own set of rules, deductions, and calculations. Robbie scribbled down notes as Mr. Sharma continued. Section 14 helps define and categorize income so that it can be taxed accordingly. For example, in Rajesh's case, his salary was taxed based on specific exemptions and deductions allowed under the income tax law. He could claim standard deductions on his salary income, which reduced his taxable salary. Similarly, when it came to his rental income, he was allowed deductions for the interest on the loan he had taken to buy the property and a standard deduction for repairs, even though he wasn't spending money on repairs every year. Ravi interrupted with a question, but what about the income from other sources, like interest? Are there deductions allowed there too? Mr. Sharma nodded. Good question, Ravi. Yes, under income from other sources, certain deductions are allowed. For example, if Rajesh had incurred any expenses directly related to earning the interest, such as a commission paid to an agent, he could claim that as a deduction. However, the deductions under this head are more limited compared to salaries or income from house property. Mr. Sharma then told Ravi about a situation Rajesh faced regarding some investments. One year, Rajesh sold some shares he had held for over three years. The profit he made from the sale of these shares was categorized as capital gains. In this case, since he held the shares for more than three years, it was classified as long-term capital gains. This type of income falls under a completely different head and has a separate tax rate. Section 14 ensures that all types of income are divided into their proper categories. Ravi was starting to see the bigger picture. So, each type of income is taxed differently based on which head it falls under. Salaries, house property, capital gains, and so on. Exactly, said Mr. Sharma. And the importance of Section 14 is that it ensures clarity in how income is taxed. It prevents confusion by categorizing income under different heads and applying the relevant provisions for each. Rajesh was able to manage his taxes efficiently because we categorized his income properly and claimed the appropriate deductions under each head. He paused, letting Ravi process the information before continuing. Here's where the direct tax code becomes a powerful tool. By breaking down income into different heads, the tax authorities can apply specific rules and deductions for each. Rajesh, for example, was able to reduce his overall tax liability by claiming the home loan interest deduction on his rental income, standard deduction on his salary, and benefiting from a lower tax rate on long-term capital gains. Ravi, now fully immersed in the case study, asked, but what if someone forgets to declare income from one of the heads, like if Rajesh didn't mention his rental income? Mr. Sharma nodded seriously. That would be a problem. If someone does not declare all their income from different heads, they risk penalties and interest on the unpaid taxes. It's important for taxpayers to disclose all sources of income, 
even if the income is small, like interest from a savings account or rent from a small property. He concluded with a final thought. The provisions of Section 14 are designed to make tax compliance straightforward. It's up to individuals like Rajesh to ensure they follow the rules and declare income from all the heads. By understanding this, you too, Ravi, will be able to advise your future clients in managing their taxes efficiently. Ravi smiled, satisfied with the clarity he had gained from Mr. Sharma's story about Rajesh. The concept of dividing income into heads had now become clear, and he was confident that he would be able to apply this knowledge to future cases. Mr. Sharma had once again turned a complex provision of the direct tax code into a practical, real-world lesson. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi had spent many sessions learning about the various sections of the direct tax code with Mr. Sharma. Every time they met, Mr. Sharma would share a new story that helped Ravi understand the nuances of tax law. Today, they were about to discuss Section 15, which dealt with tax liability under income from house property. As always, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office eager to learn. He sat down with his notebook ready and said, Sir, I've been going through Section 15, and I understand it's related to income from house property. But it's a bit confusing. Could you explain it with a real-life example, like you always do? Mr. Sharma smiled. Of course, Ravi. I'm glad you've come prepared. Let me tell you about a client of mine, Mrs. Lakshmi, and how Section 15 applied to her situation. Ravi sat back in his chair, ready to hear the story. Mrs. Lakshmi, Mr. Sharma began, was a retired school teacher who owned a house in Chennai. She had bought the house years ago, and after her retirement, she decided to move to another city to live with her daughter. Since she no longer needed the house in Chennai, she decided to rent it out. Ravi nodded, recognizing that this was a common situation. Mr. Sharma continued. Now, according to Section 15 of the Direct Tax Code, income from house property is taxed based on certain rules. The key point to understand here is that the tax is not based on how much rent you actually receive, but on the annual value of the property. This annual value is either the rent you receive or the potential rent the property could earn if rented out, whichever is higher. Ravi leaned forward, slightly confused. Wait, so Mrs. Lakshmi would have to pay tax on the rent she could have earned, even if she didn't actually rent the house out? Mr. Sharma nodded. Yes, Ravi. That's what the law says. Even if the property is vacant for part of the year, the income from house property is calculated based on its annual value. But there are some deductions allowed under this section that can reduce the tax liability. He explained further, in Mrs. Lakshmi's case, she rented the house out for 10,000 rupees per month. This meant that her annual rental income was 1 lakh 20,000 rupees. However, the municipal value of the house, the value the local authorities used to assess property taxes, was 1 lakh 50,000 rupees per year. So, according to Section 15, the higher of the two values, which was the municipal value, would be considered the annual value for tax purposes. Ravi frowned. So, even though she was only getting 1 lakh 20,000 rupees in rent, she had to pay tax on 1 lakh 50,000 rupees? That's right, Mr. Sharma confirmed. But here's where the deductions come in. Section 15 allows for two main deductions under Section 24. First, she could deduct 30% of the annual value for repairs and maintenance, even though she wasn't actually spending that much on the house. This is a standard deduction allowed for all properties. Ravi quickly calculated. So 30% of 1 lakh 50,000 rupees would be 45,000 rupees. That reduces the taxable amount to 1 lakh 5,000 rupees, right? Mr. Sharma smiled. Exactly, Ravi. And that's not all. Mrs. Lakshmi had also taken a home loan to buy the house many years ago, and she was still paying interest on that loan. Under Section 24, she could deduct the entire interest paid on the loan from the taxable income, provided the house was rented out. Robbie's eyes widened. So, if she was paying 50,000 rupees in interest every year, she could deduct that too? Mr. Sharma nodded. Yes, she could. In her case, the 50,000 rupees she paid in interest was deducted from the 1 lakh 5,000 rupees leaving her with a taxable income of just 55,000 rupees. Ravi took notes quickly, 
understanding the importance of deductions in reducing the tax liability. But what if the property had been vacant for some time? Robbie asked. Would Mrs. Lakshmi still have to pay tax on the full annual value? That's a great question, Mr. Sharma replied. If the property had been vacant for part of the year due to a lack of tenants, Mrs. Lakshmi could reduce the annual value by the amount of rent she lost. However, this only applies if she made a genuine effort to rent the property out. Robbie was starting to see how the provisions worked in practice. So, Section 15 ensures that income from house property is taxed fairly, but the deductions under Section 24 help reduce the overall tax burden, right? Exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed. That's why it's so important for property owners to know about these deductions. Mrs. Lakshmi was able to reduce her tax liability significantly by claiming the deductions for repairs and loan interest. Robbie thought for a moment, but what if Mrs. Lakshmi had been living in the house herself? Would she still have to pay tax on it? Mr. Sharma shook his head. No, Robbie. If Mrs. Lakshmi had been living in the house herself, the property would be considered self-occupied and there would be no tax on it. The rules for self-occupied properties are different. In fact, if a person owns two houses and lives in one, the second house is deemed let out and tax is calculated based on its annual value. Robbie was now able to see the entire picture. So, whether the house is rented out or not, Section 15 makes sure that the owner pays tax based on the annual value. But with the help of deductions like for repairs and loan interest, the tax burden can be reduced. Exactly, Mr. Sharma said, pleased with how well Ravi was grasping the concept. Understanding these provisions is crucial for property owners. Section 15 ensures that everyone pays their fair share of taxes on house property, but it also provides deductions to make sure the tax is reasonable. As Ravi left the office that day, he had a clear understanding of how Section 15 worked in the context of house property income. Mr. Sharma's story of Mrs. Lakshmi's rental property had made the complex tax provisions easy to understand, and Ravi felt confident that he could apply this knowledge in his future practice. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi was becoming more and more confident in his understanding of the direct tax code, thanks to Mr. Sharma's unique style of teaching. Today, they were going to discuss Section 16, and as usual, Ravi was excited to hear the practical example his mentor would share. He arrived at Mr. Sharma's office with his notebook in hand. Sir, Ravi began, today we're going to talk about Section 16, right? I read a little bit about it, but I'm still not sure how it works in real life. Could you help me with a case study? Mr. Sharma nodded. Yes, Section 16 is an important one, as it deals with deductions from salaries. It's essential for anyone earning a salary to understand how to reduce their taxable income by claiming deductions. I'll tell you a story about my client, Priya, a young software engineer who came to me a few years ago for tax advice. Robbie's eyes lit up. He knew that Mr. Sharma's stories always made things clearer, and he was curious to see how the story of Priya would unfold. Priya was working at a major IT company, Mr. Sharma began. She had just completed her first full year of work and was excited to receive her annual salary statement. However, when she saw the amount of tax deducted, she became worried. Priya wasn't sure if her tax liability was correct or if she could reduce it. So, she came to me for advice. Ravi nodded, relating to Priya's situation. I remember the first time I looked at my salary slip, he said, I didn't understand half of what was on it. Mr. Sharma smiled. Exactly. That's how most people feel when they first start earning. But once Priya came to me, I showed her how Section 16 of the Direct Tax Code works. This section is all about deductions that can be claimed by salaried individuals to reduce their taxable income. There are two main deductions under this section. One is the standard deduction, and the other is for professional tax. Ravi leaned in closer, intrigued. So, Priya was able to claim deductions to reduce her taxable salary? That's right, Mr. Sharma replied. Let me explain. First, we looked at her basic salary, which was 7 lakh rupees per year. Under Section 16, she was entitled to a standard deduction of 50,000 rupees. This deduction is available to all salaried individuals, and it is meant to cover expenses like travel and office maintenance without the need to submit specific bills or receipts. Robbie took notes quickly. So, 
50,000 rupees comes off the top of her salary, just like that? Exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed. No questions asked. It's a straightforward deduction that reduces the taxable portion of her salary. After claiming this standard deduction, Priya's taxable salary was reduced from 7 lakh rupees to 6 lakh 50,000 rupees. Ravi smiled. That sounds like a helpful deduction. What about the professional tax you mentioned earlier? Good question, Mr. Sharma said. Professional tax is a small amount that some states in India charge based on an individual's income. It's usually deducted by the employer from the salary and paid to the state government. In Priya's case, her company deducted 2,400 rupees as professional tax. Under Section 16, this amount is also deductible from her salary. Ravi thought for a moment. So, the professional tax is deducted from the salary, and she can also deduct it from her taxable income? Exactly, Mr. Sharma replied. It's a small amount, but every deduction helps reduce the tax burden. So after deducting the 2,400 rupees, Priya's taxable salary was now 647,600 rupees. Ravi could see the benefits of these deductions clearly. So by using Section 16, Priya was able to reduce her taxable income and, therefore, her overall tax liability. Mr. Sharma nodded. Yes, and that's the beauty of this section. It's simple but effective. The standard deduction and professional tax deduction helps salaried individuals reduce their taxable income without any complicated paperwork or calculations. Ravi asked, are there any other deductions available under this section, or is it just these two? For salaried individuals, Mr. Sharma explained, these are the main deductions under Section 16. However, other deductions and exemptions can be claimed under different sections of the direct tax code such as deductions for investments made under Section 80C, medical insurance premiums under Section 80D, and so on. But Section 16 focuses specifically on salaries. Ravi smiled. I see. So, this section is straightforward. Just a few key deductions that make life easier for salaried people like Priya. That's right, Mr. Sharma said. And once Priya understood how these deductions worked, she felt much more confident about her taxes. She realized that the tax she was paying was lower than she initially thought, thanks to the deductions under Section 16. As Ravi got up to leave, he thanked Mr. Sharma for another insightful session. I never knew Section 16 could make such a difference for salaried individuals. It's so simple but effective. Mr. Sharma smiled. Yes, Ravi. Tax law can be complex, but once you break it down, you see that the provisions are there to help people manage their finances efficiently. Always remember, understanding the tax code isn't just about paying taxes. It's about knowing your rights and using the available deductions to reduce your liability. Ravi left with a clearer understanding of Section 16 and how it applied in real life. Thanks to Mr. Sharma's storytelling, what had seemed like a complicated law now felt like a helpful tool he could use in his future career. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi entered Mr. Sharma's office eager for their next discussion on the direct tax code. He had been studying diligently, and today, they were going to discuss Section 17, which deals with perquisites and profits in lieu of salary. Good morning, sir, Ravi said, taking his seat. I've been reading about Section 17, and while I understand that it deals with things beyond just basic salary, I'm not entirely sure how it all works. Could you explain it with one of your case studies? Mr. Sharma smiled. Of course, Ravi. Section 17 is important because it covers not just the salary itself, but all the additional benefits an employee might receive from their employer. Let me tell you about my client, Arjun, who worked as a senior manager at a large corporation. Arjun's salary package was impressive, but it was filled with various perquisites, something we commonly call perks and profits in lieu of salary. Robbie nodded. He had heard about perks, but wasn't sure how they were taxed. Now, Arjun earned a basic salary of 10 lakh rupees per year, Mr. Sharma began. But that was only part of his total earnings. His company also provided him with several benefits, such as a company car for personal use, a rent-free accommodation, and stock options. All of these are considered perquisites under Section 17. And while they might not seem like part of the salary, they are taxable. Ravi furrowed his brow. But if the company is giving these benefits, why are they considered taxable income? 
That's a great question, Mr. Sharma said. The logic behind this is that perquisites are benefits you receive from your employer. And even though they aren't paid in cash, they have value. The tax law treats them as part of your income, so you have to pay tax on their value. Ravi thought about it. So, even though Arjun didn't receive actual money, he still had to pay tax on the value of those benefits? Exactly, Mr. Sharma replied. Let me break down how it worked for Arjun. First, let's talk about the company car. Arjun was allowed to use the company car for both official and personal purposes. The tax law says that when you use a company car for personal reasons, it's considered a perquisite. The value of this benefit is added to your income for tax purposes. In Arjun's case, the value of the car's personal use was assessed at 50,000 rupees per year. This was added to his salary, increasing his taxable income. Ravi nodded, scribbling down notes. So even though he didn't pay for the car, the benefit was worth 50,000 rupees. And he had to pay tax on that? Exactly, Mr. Sharma continued. Now, let's move on to the rent-free accommodation. Arjun's company provided him with a fully furnished house in the city. Under Section 17, this too is considered a perquisite. The value of rent-free accommodation depends on factors such as the city's population and the salary of the employee. For Arjun, the annual value of this accommodation was calculated at 2 lakh rupees, which was also added to his taxable income. Robbie's eyes widened. That's a significant amount. So the company's generous housing benefit turned into taxable income. That's right, Mr. Sharma said. It's important to remember that these benefits, even though they seem like perks, are a part of the overall compensation package, and the tax law treats them as such. Now, there's another important aspect to Section 17, profits in lieu of salary. This refers to any payments that you receive instead of your regular salary. Let me give you an example from Arjun's case. Robbie leaned in, curious about this new term. One year, Arjun's company went through some financial difficulties and decided to reduce its workforce. Many employees, including Arjun, were offered a voluntary retirement scheme, VRS. The company paid Arjun a lump sum as part of the VRS settlement. This lump sum payment was a profit in lieu of salary under Section 17, meaning it was taxable just like salary. Ravi asked, so even though it wasn't his regular salary, he still had to pay tax on it? Yes, Mr. Sharma replied. Profits in lieu of salary cover any compensation you receive instead of your regular salary. This includes things like leave and cashment, compensation for termination of service, or, as in Arjun's case, a VRS settlement. All of these are taxable unless they qualify for specific exemptions under the tax law. Ravi was beginning to see the bigger picture. So, Section 17 ensures that both the regular salary and any extra benefits or compensations are taxed? Exactly, Mr. Sharma said. Arjun had to account for all the benefits he received, including the car, the accommodation, and the VRS payment. By the time all the perquisites and profits in lieu of salary were added to his basic salary, his taxable income was much higher than the 10 lakh rupees he initially thought. Ravi asked, were there any deductions or exemptions that Arjun could use to reduce this taxable income? Yes, Mr. Sharma replied. For example, in the case of VRS, there are specific exemptions available under the tax law. Up to 5 lakh rupees received as part of a VRS package can be exempt from tax, provided certain conditions are met. So, while Arjun's VRS payment was taxable, he was able to reduce the tax on it by claiming this exemption. Ravi smiled, feeling more confident. I see how important it is to understand Section 17. It's not just about the salary, but all the extra benefits and compensations as well. Mr. Sharma nodded. That's right, Ravi. Many employees receive benefits beyond their basic salary, and it's crucial to understand how these are taxed. Perquisites like cars, housing, and stock options, as well as profits in lieu of salary, all affect your tax liability. Section 17 ensures that these benefits are taxed fairly, but it also provides certain exemptions to help reduce the burden where applicable. Ravi got up to leave, grateful for another insightful lesson. Thank you, sir. I now understand that Section 17 is about much more than just salary. It's about everything that comes with it. As Ravi walked out of the office, 
He realized that his understanding of the tax code was deepening with every session. Thanks to Mr. Sharma's unique way of making complex laws come to life through real-world examples. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Robbie had been consistently following Mr. Sharma's lessons on the direct tax code. Each section they discussed revealed new insights about how taxes impacted not only salary, but various aspects of income. Today, Mr. Sharma had promised to explain Section 18, and Ravi was eager to learn about it. Good morning, sir, Ravi said, settling into his seat. I've been going through Section 18, but I need some help understanding it. I know it deals with income from house property, but I'm not sure how that works. Mr. Sharma smiled warmly. Yes, Ravi. Section 18 is indeed about income from house property, and this is something every homeowner should be aware of. Let me explain it with a real-life example, just like always. I have a client named Suresh, who bought a house a few years ago, and his experience with this section will help you understand it better. Ravi took out his notebook, prepared to hear another valuable story. Suresh was a middle-aged businessman, Mr. Sharma began. He had saved up for years and finally purchased a house in the suburbs. He decided to let it out for rent because his primary residence was in the city. Now, the income he earned from renting out this property was taxable, and that's where Section 18 came into play. Robbie's eyes brightened with interest. So, just like salary income, the rent he received was taxable? Exactly, Mr. Sharma replied. But here's the thing. The tax is not levied on the actual rent received, but on the annual value of the property. Section 18 talks about this. The annual value is essentially the higher of the actual rent received or the reasonable rent that could be expected from the property. Robbie jotted down notes quickly. So even if Suresh rented out the house for less than the market rate, the tax would be calculated based on what he could have reasonably earned. Mr. Sharma nodded. Yes, that's correct. But let's break it down step by step. Suresh rented out his house for 2 lakh rupees per year. The house, located in a fairly popular area, had a reasonable rental value of 2 lakh 50,000 rupees per year. Since the reasonable rental value was higher, we used that as the annual value of the property for tax purposes. Robbie paused to process that. I see. So the tax law ensures that homeowners don't rent their property for a lower amount just to avoid paying higher taxes. Exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed. Now, once we had the annual value, we could calculate the income from house property. But here's the good news. Suresh was able to claim certain deductions under Section 18 that reduced his taxable income. Ravi leaned in curious. What kind of deductions? There are two main deductions allowed under this section, Mr. Sharma explained. First, you can claim a standard deduction of 30% of the annual value. This deduction is for repairs, maintenance, and other expenses related to the property, regardless of whether or not the expenses were actually incurred. So, for Suresh, 30% of 2 lakh 50,000 rupees came to 75,000 rupees. We deducted this amount from the annual value. Ravi scribbled down the figures. So he didn't have to provide any bills or proof of repairs? No, Mr. Sharma replied. The standard deduction is fixed at 30%, no questions asked. It's a simple way to cover the costs associated with maintaining a rental property. That sounds convenient. Ravi said. What was the second deduction? The second deduction, Mr. Sharma continued, is for the interest paid on any home loan taken to purchase or construct the property. In Suresh's case, he had taken a home loan to buy the house. He was paying an annual interest of 1 lakh rupees on the loan. Under Section 18, this interest was fully deductible from his income from house property. Ravi's eyes widened. So the entire interest payment was deducted from the taxable income? Yes, Mr. Sharma said. That's one of the big advantages of owning property through a loan. The interest you pay on the loan can be deducted from your taxable rental income. So, after deducting the 75,000 rupees as the standard deduction and the 1 lakh rupees as interest, the total taxable income from Suresh's property came down to just 75,000 rupees. Ravi quickly did the math. So, even though the annual value of the house was 2 lakh 50,000 rupees, he only had to pay tax on 75,000 rupees after these deductions? Exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed with a smile. 
That's the power of the deductions available under Section 18. Suresh's taxable income was reduced significantly, and he ended up paying much less tax on his rental income than he had initially feared. Ravi was impressed. I can see how these provisions can really help property owners manage their tax liability. But what if someone has more than one house? Are they taxed on all their properties? Good question, Mr. Sharma said. If a person owns more than one house, they can choose one house as their self-occupied property, which will not be taxed. The other house or houses will be taxed based on their annual value, just like we discussed with Suresh's rented property. Ravi nodded, feeling much more confident about how income from house property worked under Section 18. Thank you, sir. I always thought property income would be complicated to understand, but you made it so simple with this case study. Mr. Sharma smiled. That's the goal, Ravi. The direct tax code may seem complex at first, but once you break it down, you realize that it's designed to ensure fairness while also providing taxpayers with several deductions and benefits. Section 18 is a great example of that. It ensures that homeowners pay their fair share of taxes on rental income, but it also offers deductions to help reduce the burden. As Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, he felt grateful for the clarity the case study had provided. Through the story of Suresh, he now understood the provisions of Section 18 and how they applied in real life. He was looking forward to the next lesson, knowing that Mr. Sharma's unique storytelling would continue to make even the most complex sections of the tax code seem simple and relatable. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Robbie walked into Mr. Sharma's office with a mixture of curiosity and determination. Today's topic was Section 19 of the Direct Tax Code and Ravi had skimmed through the provisions but needed deeper understanding. Mr. Sharma, as always, was ready with a story to help bring the section to life. Good morning, Ravi, Mr. Sharma greeted him. Ready to dive into Section 19? Absolutely, sir, Ravi replied. I know it deals with income from other sources, but I'm having trouble figuring out how it works in practical situations. Mr. Sharma nodded, smiling. Section 19 is important because it covers all those types of income that don't fall under the usual categories, like salary, house property, or business income. Let me tell you about a client of mine, Mira, who found herself relying on this section when she unexpectedly received various sources of income. Ravi leaned forward, already intrigued by the mention of an unexpected income scenario. Mira is a retired school teacher, Mr. Sharma began. She lives a simple life, relying mostly on her pension. One year, she received a significant sum of money in different forms. Interest from fixed deposits, dividends from shares she owned, and some money as a gift from a distant relative. She wasn't sure how all of this would be taxed, and that's where Section 19 came into play. Ravi scribbled down interest, dividends, and gifts in his notebook. So, all of this falls under Section 19? Yes, Mr. Sharma confirmed. This section deals with income that doesn't fit neatly into other categories. It's a catch-all provision. Now, let's go through Mira's situation step by step. First, the interest from her fixed deposits. Mira had some savings in a bank's fixed deposit scheme, and she earned 50,000 rupees in interest over the year. This interest income is fully taxable under Section 19. Ravi raised his hand slightly, as if in a classroom. But aren't there any exemptions for interest income? There are exemptions, but they're specific, Mr. Sharma replied. For example, senior citizens like Mira can claim up to 50,000 rupees as a deduction on interest from deposits under another section. But whatever interest is left after that deduction is taxable under Section 19. In Mira's case, since she earned 50,000 rupees in interest, she could claim the deduction and wouldn't need to pay tax on this income. Ravi jotted down this point, feeling relieved that some relief was available for people like Mira. What about dividends? He asked. Good question, Mr. Sharma continued. Mira had invested in shares of some companies, and she received dividends amounting to 20,000 rupees during the financial year. Now, Section 19 also covers dividend income, but there's a special rule here. Dividends up to 10 lakh rupees are exempt from tax. Since Mira's dividends were well below that limit, she didn't have to pay tax on them. Ravi smiled. That sounds like good news for people investing in shares. Yes, it is, Mr. Sharma agreed. However, 
It's important to remember that if someone receives dividends above 10 lakh rupees, the excess amount would be taxable at a higher rate. But Mira's income from dividends was comfortably within the exemption limit. Ravi scribbled down some more notes, understanding how dividends worked under Section 19. Now, Mr. Sharma said, let's move on to the third part of Mira's income. She received a gift from a distant relative, 2 lakh rupees, to be precise. Gifts are also covered under Section 19. Ravi looked up curious. How are gifts taxed? Gifts are taxable under Section 19 if they exceed a certain limit and are received from non-relatives, Mr. Sharma explained. In Mira's case, this relative was not part of her immediate family. The law says that any gift received from non-relatives exceeding 50,000 rupees in a year is taxable. Since Mira received 2 lakh rupees, this amount was considered as taxable income under Section 19. So, there's no exemption for gifts above 50,000 rupees? Ravi asked, concerned. There's no exemption if the gift comes from a non-relative, Mr. Sharma confirmed. However, if Mira had received the gift from a close family member, such as her son or daughter, the gift would have been exempt, regardless of the amount. Ravi noted this down carefully. That seems fair, sir. So, all of these incomes, interest, dividends, and gifts, were treated separately under Section 19. Exactly, Mr. Sharma said. Each type of income is taxed based on specific rules, but they all fall under the broad category of income from other sources. Now, it's important to remember that Section 19 also covers other types of income, like winnings from lotteries, betting, and even royalty income. In Mira's case, it was just the interest, dividends, and gifts that were relevant. Ravi nodded, absorbing the details. It seems like Section 19 is quite broad, covering all sorts of income that doesn't fit elsewhere. That's right, Mr. Sharma said. It's designed to ensure that all forms of income, whether regular or irregular, are brought into the tax net. In Mira's case, she had to account for all her income, even if it came from different sources. But the tax law also provides reliefs and deductions where appropriate, as we saw with the interest and dividend income. Ravi smiled, feeling a sense of clarity. Thank you, sir. I now understand how Section 19 works. It's not just a miscellaneous section. It ensures that any form of income is fairly taxed, but with provisions for relief where needed. Mr. Sharma smiled back. You've got it, Ravi. Section 19 may seem like a catch-all, but it plays a vital role in the tax system, especially for people who have income from multiple sources, like Mira. As Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office that day, he felt confident that he could now explain the intricacies of Section 19 to anyone who asked. Mr. Sharma's storytelling had, once again, made a complex topic seem simple and practical. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi had been studying the direct tax code diligently, and today he was set to learn about Section 20. He arrived at Mr. Sharma's office with his notebook and pen, ready to grasp yet another key concept. Mr. Sharma, with his usual friendly demeanor, was prepared to explain Section 20 using a real-life case study, which Ravi knew would make the subject much easier to understand. Good morning, sir, Ravi said, settling down. Good morning, Ravi, Mr. Sharma replied. Today, we'll dive into Section 20, which deals with income that arises from capital gains. This section is crucial because it explains how profits from selling capital assets are taxed. Ravi nodded, already curious. So, capital gains are profits made from selling things like property or shares? Exactly, Mr. Sharma said. Capital gains arise when a person sells an asset for more than its cost. Let me tell you about a case involving one of my clients, Rajesh, who sold a piece of land and how he dealt with Section 20. Ravi leaned forward ready to take notes. Rajesh is a businessman who had inherited a piece of land from his father. The land was located in a developing area, and its value increased significantly over the years. Rajesh decided to sell it last year, and he made a profit of 10 lakh rupees. This profit is what we call a capital gain, and Section 20 comes into play to determine how this gain is taxed. Ravi quickly noted down the key points. Capital gain, inherited land, 10 lakh rupees. Mr. Sharma smiled and began explaining. First, 
you need to understand that there are two types of capital gains, short-term and long-term. The treatment depends on how long Rajesh held the asset before selling it. If an asset is held for more than 36 months, the gain is classified as a long-term capital gain. If it's held for less than 36 months, it's considered a short-term capital gain. In Rajesh's case, he had inherited the land many years ago, so his gain was classified as long-term. Ravi jotted this down. So, since Rajesh held the land for more than 36 months, it falls under long-term capital gains. What difference does that make in terms of tax? The tax treatment is quite different, Mr. Sharma explained. For long-term capital gains, the government provides certain benefits. First, Rajesh could apply indexation, which means adjusting the purchase price of the asset to account for inflation over the years. This reduces the taxable gain. Ravi looked up, interested. So how does indexation work, sir? Let's break it down, Mr. Sharma said, pulling out a piece of paper. Rajesh's father had originally purchased the land for 2 lakh rupees about 25 years ago. By applying the cost inflation index, the cost of the land is adjusted to today's value, making it, say, 8 lakh rupees. This means that instead of paying tax on the entire 10 lakh rupees that Rajesh earned from selling the land, he would only be taxed on the difference between the sale price and the index cost. In this case, the taxable gain would be 2 lakh rupees instead of 8 lakh rupees. Robbie's eyes widened. That makes a huge difference. So the index cost helps reduce the taxable portion of the capital gain. Exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed. This is one of the major benefits provided under Section 20 for long-term capital gains. After calculating the index cost, Rajesh's taxable capital gain came down to 2 lakh rupees. Ravi scribbled furiously in his notebook. What rate of tax did he have to pay on this amount? For long-term capital gains, the tax rate is 20%, Mr. Sharma explained. So Rajesh had to pay 20% tax on the 2 lakh rupees, which came to 40,000 rupees. This is a much smaller amount than what he would have paid without the indexation benefit. Ravi paused for a moment. What if it had been a short-term capital gain? Would the tax treatment have been different? Yes, Mr. Sharma replied. For short-term capital gains, the tax is calculated at the individual's normal income tax rate, and there is no indexation benefit. In Rajesh's case, if he had sold the land within 36 months of acquiring it, the entire profit of 10 lakh rupees would have been added to his total income and taxed according to his income tax slab. Ravi frowned. That would have been much more expensive for him, right? Exactly, Mr. Sharma agreed. The tax rate could have been much higher depending on his total income. That's why it's important for taxpayers to understand whether their capital gain is short-term or long-term, as it affects how much tax they'll end up paying. Ravi leaned back, reflecting on the complexity of capital gains taxation. So, long-term gains get more favorable treatment under Section 20, with the benefit of indexation and a lower tax rate. But short-term gains are taxed at a higher rate. You've got it. Mr. Sharma said, smiling. There's one more thing you should know. Section 20 also allows for certain exemptions if the person reinvests the capital gain in specific ways. For example, Rajesh could have saved on paying tax by reinvesting his gain in another property or in specified bonds. Ravi looked surprised. So he could have reinvested the 2 lakh rupees in a new property and not paid any tax at all? Yes, Mr. Sharma confirmed. That's another provision under Section 20. If Rajesh had chosen to reinvest his capital gain into a new residential property within two years of selling the land, the capital gain would have been exempt from tax. The same applies if he had invested in certain government-approved bonds within six months of the sale. Ravi's mind raced. That's a great way to encourage people to reinvest in the economy. Mr. Sharma smiled again. It is... The law not only ensures that capital gains are taxed, but it also gives taxpayers ways to reduce their liability through reinvestment, which in turn helps boost economic activity. As Ravi closed his notebook, he felt that he had gained a solid understanding of how Section 20 worked. Thank you, sir. This case study made everything so much clearer. Mr. Sharma nodded. I'm glad to hear that, Ravi. Remember, understanding capital gains is essential especially in a world where people often invest in property, shares, and other assets.
Section 20 ensures that the taxation of these gains is fair, but also provides ways to reduce the tax burden through indexation and reinvestment. As Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, he felt more confident about navigating the complexities of capital gains and the provisions under Section 20. Once again, Mr. Sharma's real-life case study had brought the law to life in a way that made it both practical and easy to understand. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi stepped into Mr. Sharma's office, eager to learn about Section 21 of the Direct Tax Code. He had been reading about various tax provisions, and today he was ready to delve deeper into another important aspect of taxation. Mr. Sharma, renowned for his engaging storytelling, was ready to make the topic accessible through a relatable case study. Good morning, Ravi, Mr. Sharma said, his eyes twinkling with enthusiasm. Are you ready to explore Section 21? Absolutely, sir, Ravi replied, his curiosity piqued. I understand it relates to deductions under certain sections but I want to grasp it more thoroughly. Perfect, Mr. Sharma said, leaning back in his chair. Let's discuss a client of mine, Anita, who found herself navigating Section 21 while preparing her tax returns. This will help illustrate its provisions effectively. Robbie pulled out his notebook, ready to jot down key points. Tell me about Anita's situation, sir. Anita is a software engineer and a single mother, Mr. Sharma began. Last financial year, she earned a good salary, but she also had significant expenses, especially concerning her education and health care. She was keen on maximizing her deductions to reduce her taxable income. That's where Section 21 came into play. Ravi nodded, understanding that deductions could help lower taxable income. What specific deductions does Section 21 cover? Section 21 outlines deductions that taxpayers can claim especially concerning expenses related to education, health care, and home loans, Mr. Sharma explained. For Anita, she had taken a home loan to purchase a flat. Under this section, she could claim deductions on the interest she paid on the loan, which is an essential provision. Okay, Ravi said, writing down the connection between home loans and deductions. How did that work for Anita? Anita's home loan interest amounted to 1 lakh rupees over the year, Mr. Sharma continued. Under Section 21, she could claim a deduction of up to 2 lakh rupees on the interest paid. This meant that her taxable income was reduced by the amount she paid in interest, which helped her save on taxes. Robbie smiled, appreciating how practical this provision was. What about other deductions? Did Anita have any educational expenses? Yes, she did, Mr. Sharma confirmed. Anita enrolled her son in a private school, and the fees amounted to 50,000 rupees. Under Section 21, taxpayers can also claim deductions for children's education expenses. Anita could claim this amount as a deduction, further reducing her taxable income. Robbie jotted this down, intrigued by the dual benefits of deductions for both home loans and education expenses. That's quite beneficial for her. Were there any limits on these deductions? Mr. Sharma nodded. Yes, while Section 21 provides these deductions, there are specific limits for each category. For instance, while Anita could claim up to 2 lakh rupees on home loan interest, the deduction for children's education is capped at a certain amount. In her case, the fee deduction was allowable for a maximum of two children, which she was within limits. That's good to know, Robbie remarked. Were there any health-related expenses she could claim? Certainly, Mr. Sharma said, warming to his narrative. Anita's mother had undergone a medical procedure last year, and her health expenses amounted to 30,000 rupees. Under Section 21, there are provisions for claiming deductions for medical expenses, especially if they relate to critical illnesses or if the taxpayer is paying for health insurance. Ravi raised his hand slightly, eager to clarify. Is there a specific limit on medical expenses as well? Yes, there is a limit, Mr. Sharma replied. For medical expenses, Taxpayers can claim deductions based on the amount paid for health insurance premiums, which can go up to 25,000 rupees. However, if the insured person is a senior citizen, the limit goes up to 50,000 rupees. Since Anita's mother was a senior citizen, Anita could claim the higher limit. Robbie was impressed by how Section 21 provided a holistic approach to deductions. So, 
Anita was able to maximize her deductions through her home loan interest, her son's education fees, and her mother's health expenses? Exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed. By efficiently using these provisions, she could significantly reduce her taxable income. When all deductions were considered, Anita's taxable income was reduced by around 4 lakh rupees, which made a substantial difference in her overall tax liability. Robbie was amazed. That's a significant reduction. It's like having a safety net for taxpayers. Mr. Sharma nodded. Indeed, it is. The essence of Section 21 is to encourage responsible financial behavior, support education, and promote health care. By offering these deductions, the government incentivizes taxpayers to invest in their futures while ensuring they can afford essential services. Robbie smiled, feeling empowered with this knowledge. Thank you, sir. I can see how Section 21 plays a vital role in helping taxpayers like Anita manage their finances while complying with tax laws. Mr. Sharma returned the smile. You've grasped the concept well, Robbie. Understanding deductions is crucial for anyone looking to navigate their tax obligations effectively. Always remember that tax planning is not just about reducing taxes, but also about making informed financial decisions. As Robbie left Mr. Sharma's office that day, he felt more confident about Section 21. The case study of Anita had illustrated how various deductions could be utilized strategically to minimize tax liability. Once again, Mr. Sharma's storytelling had transformed a complex subject into an engaging and practical lesson, empowering Ravi to apply this knowledge in real life. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, eager to learn about Section 22 of the Direct Tax Code. He had been diligently studying the various provisions, and he was particularly excited about today's lesson, as Mr. Sharma was known for making complex subjects relatable through real-life examples. Good morning, Ravi. Mr. Sharma greeted him with a warm smile. Are you ready to dive into Section 22 today? Good morning, sir. Yes, I am, Ravi replied enthusiastically. I understand that this section deals with income from house property, but I would love to hear more about it through a case study. Excellent, Mr. Sharma said. Let's discuss my client, Mira who has been navigating the intricacies of Section 22 while managing her rental properties. Robbie settled into his chair, ready to take notes. Tell me more about Mira's situation, sir. Mira is a successful entrepreneur who has invested in several properties across the city, Mr. Sharma began. She owns two residential flats that she rents out and a commercial property that houses a small restaurant. Section 22 deals with the taxation of income generated from these properties. Robbie's interest peaked. So, how does this section apply to Mira's rental income? Under Section 22, income from house property is assessed on the basis of the annual value of the property, Mr. Sharma explained. This annual value is essentially the expected rental income Mira can earn from her properties. The income is taxable, but there are also provisions for deductions, which I will explain in detail. Robbie noted this down. What constitutes the annual value? Mr. Sharma continued, the annual value is determined based on three factors, the actual rent received, the fair rental value of the property, and the municipal value assessed by local authorities. Let's break this down further with Mira's properties. Sure, sir, Ravi replied. Mira's first flat is located in a well-developed area, and she receives a rent of 25,000 rupees per month. This means her annual rent from this flat amounts to 3 lakh rupees. The municipal value of the property is 2 lakh rupees, and the fair rental value determined by the local authorities is also 2 lakh rupees. In this case, since the actual rent is higher than both the municipal value and fair rental value, the annual value of this flat is considered to be 3 lakh rupees. Ravi quickly noted down the figures. And what about the second flat? Mira's second flat, however, is in a less popular area where she can only charge a rent of 15,000 rupees per month, totaling 1 lakh 80,000 rupees annually. In this case, the fair rental value is 2 lakh rupees, and the municipal value is also 2 lakh rupees. Here, since the actual rent is lower than the fair rental and municipal values, the annual value for this flat would be considered as 2 lakh rupees. Ravi smiled, appreciating the clarity of the concept. So, 
In this scenario, the annual value can differ based on actual rent versus fair rental value. Exactly, Mr. Sharma said. Now, Mira also has to account for deductions. Under Section 22, she can claim a standard deduction of 30% on the annual value of her properties. This deduction covers expenses like repairs, maintenance, and other related costs. Robbie raised his hand slightly. So, for Mira's first flat, what would her deduction be? For the first flat, with an annual value of 3 lakh rupees, the deduction would be 90,000 rupees, which is 30% of the annual value. For the second flat, with an annual value of 2 lakh rupees, the deduction would be 60,000 rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Interesting, Ravi noted. What about her commercial property? Good question, Mr. Sharma said, nodding. Mira's commercial property, which houses a restaurant, is assessed differently. The annual rent she receives from the restaurant is 5 lakh rupees, and the fair rental value is also approximately 5 lakh rupees. The municipal value is similar as well. Here, since the actual rent aligns with the fair rental and municipal values, the annual value for taxation would be 5 lakh rupees. Ravi was jotting down notes fervently. Does she get a deduction for the commercial property too? Yes, she does, Mr. Sharma replied. However, for commercial properties, the standard deduction of 30% still applies. So, the deduction for the commercial property would be 1 lakh 50,000 rupees, which is 30% of 5 lakh rupees. Robbie's eyes widened. So, Mira has different deductions for her various properties. That's useful. Indeed, Mr. Sharma said. After applying these deductions, Mira calculates her taxable income. For the residential properties, her taxable income would be as follows. First flat. Annual value of 3 lakh rupees. Standard deduction of 90,000 rupees equals taxable income of 2 lakh 10,000 rupees. Second flat. Annual value of 2 lakh rupees. Standard deduction of 60,000 rupees equals taxable income of 1 lakh 40,000 rupees. Commercial property. Annual value of 5 lakh rupees. Standard deduction of 1 lakh 50,000 rupees equals taxable income of 3 lakh 50,000 rupees. Adding all these figures together, Mira's total taxable income from her house property would be 7 lakh rupees. Ravi leaned back, digesting the information. So, understanding the annual value and the deductions allowed under Section 22 is vital for anyone with rental properties. Absolutely, Mr. Sharma confirmed. Moreover, there is an additional provision in Section 22 that allows for losses. If Mira's expenses exceed her rental income, she could claim that loss against her other income sources, like her business income. This is crucial for managing tax liabilities effectively. Robbie's expression shifted to one of understanding. That's a significant advantage. So, it promotes fair taxation and allows taxpayers to manage their financial burdens. Exactly. Mr. Sharma replied, pleased with Ravi's insights. Section 22 not only outlines how income from house property is calculated, but also provides mechanisms for taxpayers to reduce their tax burden through deductions and manage any losses efficiently. As the lesson came to an end, Ravi felt more knowledgeable about the provisions of Section 22. The case study of Mira had vividly illustrated how the annual value, deductions, and the treatment of losses worked in practice. Once again, Mr. Sharma's storytelling had transformed a potentially dry subject into an engaging narrative that made learning about taxation enjoyable and relatable. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi walked into Mr. Sharma's office, ready to tackle the next chapter in his understanding of the direct tax code. Today's focus was on Section 23, and he was excited to hear Mr. Sharma's unique storytelling approach to elucidate the subject. Good morning, Ravi. Mr. Sharma greeted him with enthusiasm. Today, we will explore Section 23, which deals with the annual value of properties and how it affects the taxation of income from house property. Good morning, sir. I'm eager to learn how this section applies in real-life situations, Ravi replied, settling into his chair. Let me tell you about my client, Mr. Gupta, who owns several properties, including residential and commercial ones, Mr. Sharma began. 
His experiences provide an excellent case study for understanding the nuances of Section 23. Sounds interesting. Please continue, Ravi encouraged, taking out his notebook. Mr. Gupta owns two residential flats and a small office space. The first flat is in a prime location and is rented out for 30,000 rupees a month, while the second flat is in a less desirable area, fetching only 15,000 rupees a month. The office space is rented out for 50,000 rupees a month, Mr. Sharma explained. Section 23 is crucial here as it helps determine the annual value of these properties for tax purposes. Ravi nodded, keenly following along. How is the annual value calculated, sir? Under Section 23, the annual value of a property is determined by the higher of the actual rent received or the fair rental value. The fair rental value is based on what similar properties in the area are rented for, while the municipal value is set by local authorities, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Let's break down Mr. Gupta's properties. Please do, Ravi said, eager to understand. Starting with the first flat, Mr. Gupta receives an actual rent of 3,60,000 rupees annually, as it is rented for 30,000 rupees per month. The fair rental value for similar flats in the locality is 4 lakh rupees, and the municipal value is 3,50,000 rupees. In this case, since the fair rental value is higher, the annual value for this flat is considered for lakh rupees. Ravi jotted this down. What about the second flat? For the second flat, Mr. Gupta receives an actual rent of 1 lakh 80,000 rupees annually. The fair rental value, however, is 2 lakh 50,000 rupees, with a municipal value of 2 lakh rupees. Here again, since the fair rental value is higher than the actual rent, the annual value is taken as 2,50,000 rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. That makes sense, Ravi said, feeling more confident. And how does this apply to the commercial property? Good question, Mr. Sharma replied. Mr. Gupta's office space has an actual rent of 6 lakh rupees annually. The fair rental value is also assessed at 6 lakh rupees, while the municipal value is 5,50,000 rupees. In this case, since the actual rent received matches the fair rental value, the annual value remains 6 lakh rupees. Ravi noted this down, impressed by how the calculations worked. So, for taxation, Mr. Gupta's total annual values would be 4 lakh for the first flat, 2 lakh 50,000 for the second flat, and 6 lakh for the office space? Exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed. Now, under Section 23, after determining the annual value, Mr. Gupta can claim a standard deduction of 30% on the annual value of his properties. This deduction accounts for maintenance and repair costs. Ravi raised an eyebrow intrigued. How would that affect his taxable income? For the first flat, with an annual value of 4 lakh rupees, the standard deduction would be 1 lakh 20,000 rupees. For the second flat, with an annual value of 2 lakh 50,000 rupees, the deduction would be 75,000 rupees. Finally, for the office space with an annual value of 6 lakh rupees, the deduction would be 1 lakh 80,000 rupees, Mr. Sharma explained, writing down the deductions on a whiteboard. Ravi nodded. So, Mr. Gupta's taxable income from each property would be calculated after applying these deductions? Precisely, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Here's how it breaks down. First flat, Annual value of 4 lakh rupees. Standard deduction of 1 lakh 20,000 rupees equals taxable income of 2 lakh 80,000 rupees. Second flat. Annual value of 2 lakh 50,000 rupees. Standard deduction of 75,000 rupees equals taxable income of 1 lakh 75,000 rupees. Commercial property. Annual value of 6 lakh rupees. Standard deduction of 1 lakh 80,000 rupees equals taxable income of 4 lakh 20,000 rupees. Adding these figures gives Mr. Gupta a total taxable income from house property of 9 lakh 75,000 rupees. Ravi was impressed. That's a significant amount. So, understanding the annual value and the deductions allowed under Section 23 is critical for property owners. Absolutely, Mr. Sharma replied. Moreover, there's another important aspect of Section 23 related to vacant properties. 
If Mr. Gupta had a property that was vacant for a certain period, he could still be taxed on its notional rental value, provided it was not occupied for more than a specific time frame. Interesting, Ravi exclaimed. So, even if a property is vacant, it can affect tax liability? Yes, exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed. This provision prevents property owners from evading taxes by keeping their properties vacant. It encourages the utilization of properties for rental income. Ravi took a moment to digest all this information. So, Section 23 provides a comprehensive framework for determining how properties are taxed, ensuring fairness, and encouraging property owners to utilize their assets efficiently. Exactly, Mr. Sharma said, pleased with Ravi's understanding. This section not only delineates how income from house property is calculated, but also establishes deductions that help property owners manage their tax liabilities effectively. As Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office that day, he felt enriched with the knowledge of Section 23. The case study of Mr. Gupta had vividly illustrated how annual value, deductions, and the treatment of vacant properties worked in practice. Mr. Sharma's engaging storytelling had once again transformed a complex subject into an insightful lesson, empowering Ravi with practical knowledge that he could apply in real life. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi was eager to learn more about the direct tax code, especially after his enlightening session with Mr. Sharma on Section 23. Today, he entered Mr. Sharma's office, ready to delve into the provisions of Section 24. He knew that Mr. Sharma's storytelling would make the complex regulations easier to understand. Good morning, Ravi, Mr. Sharma greeted him warmly. Today, we will explore Section 24, which focuses on deductions in respect of income from house property. Good morning, sir. I am excited to learn how this section applies in real-life situations, Ravi replied enthusiastically. Let me tell you about my client, Mrs. Rao, who is a seasoned property investor. She owns multiple residential properties and has a keen interest in maximizing her tax efficiency, Mr. Sharma began. Her experiences will serve as an excellent case study for understanding the nuances of Section 24. Please go on, Ravi said, taking out his notebook. Mrs. Rao owns three residential properties. The first is a two-bedroom apartment in a prime area, rented out for 40,000 rupees per month. The second is a one-bedroom flat in a suburban locality, generating 20,000 rupees monthly. Lastly, she has a vacation home by the beach, which she rents out seasonally for 25,000 rupees per month during peak tourist season, Mr. Sharma explained. Section 24 is crucial as it delineates the deductions available against her income from these properties. Interesting. What kind of deductions are we talking about? Ravi asked, intrigued. Under Section 24, there are primarily two types of deductions that Mrs. Rao can claim against her rental income, the standard deduction and the interest on borrowed capital, Mr. Sharma clarified. Let's break it down. Sure. Ravi nodded, ready to absorb the details. Starting with the first property, Mrs. Rao receives an annual rental income of 4,80,000 rupees from the apartment. Under Section 24, she can claim a standard deduction of 30% of her rental income. This standard deduction accounts for expenses related to the maintenance and upkeep of the property. For her first apartment, the standard deduction would be 1,44,000 rupees, Mr. Sharma calculated on a whiteboard. Got it. And what about the other properties? Ravi inquired, eager to see how it all fits together. For the one-bedroom flat, with an annual rental income of 2,40,000 rupees, the standard deduction would be 72,000 rupees. For the vacation home, which has a total annual income of 3 lakh rupees, the standard deduction would amount to 90,000 rupees, Mr. Sharma continued. Ravi wrote down the calculations diligently. So, the total standard deductions would be added together? Exactly, Mr. Sharma replied. Now, let's summarize the deductions. First property, rental income of 4 lakh 80,000 rupees. Standard deduction of 1 lakh 44,000 rupees equals taxable income of 3 lakh 36,000 rupees. Second property, rental income of 2 lakh 40,000 rupees. Standard deduction of 72,000 rupees equals taxable income of 1 lakh 68,000 rupees. Third property, rental income of 3 lakh rupees. 
Standard deduction of 90,000 rupees equals taxable income of 210,000 rupees. Adding these figures gives Mrs. Rao a total taxable income from house property of 7,14,000 rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi looked impressed. That's a significant deduction. But you mentioned interest on borrowed capital. How does that work? Great question, Ravi, Mr. Sharma exclaimed. Under Section 24, if Mrs. Rao has taken a loan to purchase any of these properties, she can also claim a deduction for the interest paid on that loan. This deduction is especially beneficial for property owners. Can you give me an example? Ravi asked, intrigued. Certainly. Suppose Mrs. Rao took a loan of 20 lakh rupees to purchase the first apartment, and the interest on the loan amounts to 2 lakh rupees annually, Mr. Sharma explained. In this case, she can claim this entire amount as a deduction from her income under Section 24. Ravi scribbled down notes, eager to grasp the concept. So, if we consider the interest deduction as well, how would that change your taxable income? For the first property, after the standard deduction of 1,44,000 rupees and the interest deduction of 2 lakh rupees, her taxable income would be reduced to 96,000 rupees, Mr. Sharma detailed. For the second property, the calculations would remain the same since we haven't considered any loan for that. The taxable income for the second property would still be 1,68,000 rupees. For the vacation home, if she had no loan, the taxable income would still be 2,10,000 rupees. Wow! So, with the deductions from interest on borrowed capital, Mrs. Rao can significantly lower her taxable income from the properties, Ravi remarked, clearly understanding the benefits. Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. However, it's essential to note that if a property is self-occupied, meaning it's not rented out, the deductions for that property can only be claimed up to a limit of 2 lakh rupees on the interest paid. This limit applies even if the property generates no income. That's an important distinction, Ravi noted. So, if Mrs. Rao were to occupy one of her properties herself, the deduction on that would be limited to 2 lakh rupees, right? Correct, Mr. Sharma confirmed. This means that understanding how to apply these provisions wisely can significantly impact one's tax liabilities. As Ravi wrapped up his session with Mr. Sharma, he felt empowered with knowledge about Section 24. The story of Mrs. Rao had illuminated the various deductions available for income from house property, revealing how strategic financial decisions could lead to optimal tax efficiency. Mr. Sharma's storytelling had once again transformed the complexities of tax law into a relatable and practical lesson, providing Ravi with valuable insights for his future endeavors. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi walked into Mr. Sharma's office with a renewed sense of curiosity. Having learned about various provisions of the direct tax code in previous sessions, he was eager to explore Section 25. He knew that Mr. Sharma would weave a captivating story that would illuminate the complexities of this section. Good morning, Ravi, Mr. Sharma greeted, noticing the sparkle of curiosity in Ravi's eyes. Today, we will discuss Section 25, which pertains to the taxation of capital gains. Good morning, sir. I am ready to learn, Ravi replied enthusiastically. Let me tell you about Mr. Gupta, a longtime client of mine who invested in real estate, Mr. Sharma began. His experiences will help us understand the nuances of Section 25. Sounds interesting. What happened with Mr. Gupta? Ravi asked, settling down with his notebook. Mr. Gupta bought a piece of land in a developing area for 10 lakh rupees five years ago. Last year, he decided to sell it for 20 lakh rupees, thinking it was a great time to cash in on his investment, Mr. Sharma explained. This situation is where Section 25 comes into play. Ravi leaned in closer. So, how does this section apply to Mr. Gupta's case? Under Section 25, capital gains are categorized into two types, short-term capital gains and long-term capital gains, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Since Mr. Gupta held the land for more than two years, the profit from the sale is classified as a long-term capital gain. What's the significance of this classification? Ravi inquired. Good question. Mr. Sharma replied. Long-term capital gains are taxed at a lower rate compared to short-term capital gains, which are taxed as ordinary income. For Mr. Gupta, 
This means he benefits from favorable tax treatment on the profit from his sale. Okay, but how is the tax amount calculated? Robbie asked, eager to understand the numbers. Let's break it down, Mr. Sharma said, taking out a piece of paper. The sale price of the land was 20 lakh rupees, and the purchase price was 10 lakh rupees. Therefore, the capital gain is calculated as follows. Capital gain equals sale price, purchase price. Capital gain equals 20 lakh, 10 lakh equals 10 lakh. This is Mr. Gupta's capital gain, Mr. Sharma explained. Now, under Section 25, Mr. Gupta is entitled to certain deductions, which can help reduce his taxable capital gains. Deductions? What kind of deductions? Robbie asked, intrigued. Excellent question, Robbie. The deductions include expenses incurred during the transfer of the property, such as brokerage fees, legal expenses, and any cost associated with improving the property, Mr. Sharma clarified. For instance, if Mr. Gupta spent 1 lakh rupees on legal fees and brokerage during the sale, he can deduct this from his capital gain. So, what would the new calculation look like? Robbie asked, noting down the details. Let's recalculate with the deduction, Mr. Sharma continued. The capital gain after accounting for the legal and brokerage fees would be net capital gain equals capital gain deductions. Net capital gain equals 10 lakh. 1 lakh equals 9 lakh. Thus, Mr. Gupta's taxable capital gain now stands at 9 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Got it. But what is the tax rate for this capital gain? Robbie asked, looking for clarity. For long-term capital gains exceeding 1 lakh rupees, the tax rate is 20%, Mr. Sharma detailed. In Mr. Gupta's case, since his net capital gain is 9 lakh rupees, the tax calculation would be Tax equals net capital gain x tax rate. Tax equals 9 lakh x 20% equals 1 lakh 80,000 rupees. Wow, that is a significant tax amount, Ravi said, reflecting on the figures. Indeed, but it's essential to also consider exemptions available under Section 25. For instance, if Mr. Gupta reinvests the capital gain in another residential property, he may be eligible for exemption under Section 54. Mr. Sharma explained. This can help him avoid or reduce the tax liability on the capital gains he has realized. Robbie's eyes lit up with understanding. So, if Mr. Gupta buys another property with a profit, he can save on taxes? Exactly. If he invests the entire 9 lakh rupees in a new residential property, he can claim exemption for the amount invested. This is a strategic move to maximize his investment while minimizing his tax liability. Mr. Sharma affirmed. As their session came to a close, Ravi felt empowered by the insights shared by Mr. Sharma. The story of Mr. Gupta had not only clarified the provisions of Section 25, but also illustrated the importance of strategic financial planning in real estate investments. Through Mr. Sharma's storytelling, Ravi had grasped the intricacies of capital gains taxation and the potential for tax savings through reinvestment reinforcing his understanding of the direct tax code in a practical context. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi entered Mr. Sharma's office with a sense of anticipation. He had been looking forward to this session, as he was eager to learn about Section 26 of the direct tax code. He knew Mr. Sharma's knack for storytelling would make the complexities of tax law more relatable and understandable. Good morning, Ravi. Mr. Sharma greeted him warmly. Today, we will delve into Section 26, which deals with the taxation of income from other sources. Good morning, sir. I'm excited to learn how this section works in real life, Ravi replied, settling in with his notebook. Let me tell you about my client, Mr. Mehta, who recently encountered a fascinating situation that illustrates the provisions of Section 26, Mr. Sharma began. Mr. Mehta is a retired banker and has a diverse portfolio of investments including stocks, mutual funds, and fixed deposits. Ravi listened intently as Mr. Sharma continued. Last year, Mr. Mehta sold some shares he had held for several years and earned a profit. Additionally, he also received interest income from his fixed deposits. These various income streams fall under the purview of Section 26. Interesting, how does this section apply to Mr. Mehta's situation? Ravi asked, eager to understand. Under Section 26, income from other sources is broadly categorized. 
This includes various types of income, such as interest from savings accounts, fixed deposits, dividends from shares, and any income arising from the transfer of capital assets, Mr. Sharma explained. In Mr. Mehta's case, both his capital gains from selling shares and interest income from fixed deposits qualify as income from other sources. Robbie nodded, understanding the scope of the section. So, how does Mr. Mehta calculate his taxable income from these sources? Let's break it down, Mr. Sharma said, taking out a calculator. Last year, Mr. Mehta sold shares for a total of 6 lakh rupees, which he had initially purchased for 4 lakh rupees. Therefore, his capital gain is calculated as follows. Capital gain equals sale price, purchase price. Capital gain equals 6 lakh, for lakh equals 2 lakh. This 2 lakh rupees is considered a capital gain and is subject to tax, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Got it. And what about the interest income? Ravi inquired. Mr. Mehta received 50,000 rupees as interest from his fixed deposits. This interest income is also taxable under Section 26, Mr. Sharma explained. Now, we need to combine these two income streams to determine Mr. Mehta's total taxable income from other sources. So, the total taxable income would be the sum of the capital gain and the interest income? Ravi clarified. Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. So, the total taxable income from other sources is total taxable income equals capital gain plus interest income. Total taxable income equals 2 lakh plus 50,000 equals 2 lakh 50,000. Robbie wrote down the calculations. What tax rate applies to this income? Under the current tax structure, the capital gains may be taxed at a lower rate if they are classified as long-term capital gains. However, since Mr. Mehta's shares were sold after a year, they would fall under long-term capital gains tax, which is usually taxed at 20%, provided it exceeds 1 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma detailed. Ravi thought for a moment. So, how would that impact Mr. Mehta's overall tax liability? For the capital gain of 2 lakh rupees, Mr. Mehta would pay 20% tax on the amount exceeding 1 lakh, Mr. Sharma explained. So, the taxable amount would be 1 lakh, and the tax would be tax equals 2 lakh, 1 lakh, x 20%. Tax equals 1 lakh, x 20% equals 20,000 rupees. Ravi made a note of this, appreciating the clarity of the calculations. And what about the interest income? How is that taxed? The interest income of 50,000 rupees is added to his total income and taxed as per his applicable income tax slab. If Mr. Mehta is in the 20% tax bracket, he would pay. Tax on interest equals 50,000 X, 20% equals 10,000 rupees. So his total tax liability would be the sum of the tax on capital gains and the tax on interest income? Ravi asked, trying to summarize. Exactly, Mr. Sharma confirmed. So the total tax liability would be total tax liability equals tax on capital gain plus tax on interest. Total tax liability equals 20,000 plus 10,000 equals 30,000 rupees. Ravi felt a sense of accomplishment as he absorbed the details. That makes sense. But are there any exemptions or deductions available under Section 26 that Mr. Mehta can consider? Great question, Ravi. While Section 26 primarily deals with the income calculation, exemptions on certain types of income, like agricultural income or dividends from domestic companies, may apply. Mr. Sharma explained. Moreover, Mr. Mehta could also consider deductions under Section 80 TTA for interest earned on savings accounts up to 10,000 rupees. Wow! That adds another layer of complexity, Ravi said, his mind racing with possibilities. So, if Mr. Mehta has any savings account interest, he could claim the deduction too? Precisely. Mr. Sharma agreed. Understanding these provisions not only aids in compliance, but also enables individuals to optimize their tax liabilities. As their session concluded, Ravi felt empowered with knowledge about Section 26 and its implications for income from other sources. The story of Mr. Mehta had provided a practical understanding of how various types of income are taxed and how strategic financial planning could lead to tax savings. With Mr. Sharma's engaging storytelling, Ravi had successfully grasped the intricacies of the direct tax code ready to apply this knowledge in his future endeavors.
Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi walked into Mr. Sharma's office, his mind buzzing with curiosity. After learning about various sections of the direct tax code in previous sessions, he was eager to explore Section 27. He knew that Mr. Sharma's storytelling would bring the provisions of this section to life. Good morning, Ravi. Mr. Sharma greeted him with a smile. Today, we will discuss Section 27, which deals with the taxation of income derived from various sources, particularly those related to property. Good morning, sir. I'm looking forward to learning how this section works in practical scenarios, Ravi replied enthusiastically. Let me introduce you to Mrs. Iyer, a fictional character, but one that reflects many real-life situations. Mrs. Iyer inherited a residential property from her late father, who had passed away two years ago, Mr. Sharma began. Her father had purchased the property for 10 lakh rupees about 15 years ago. Interesting. What happened next? Ravi asked, eager to hear more. After inheriting the property, Mrs. Iyer decided to rent it out to a family for 30,000 rupees a month, Mr. Sharma explained. This rental income qualifies as income from property and is subject to the provisions of Section 27. Okay, but how does Mrs. Iyer calculate her taxable income from this property? Ravi asked, his brow furrowing in concentration. Good question. Under Section 27, the taxable income from property is calculated as follows. Net annual value equals gross annual value, municipal taxes. In Mrs. Iyer's case, the gross annual value is simply the total rent she collects in a year, which amounts to gross annual value equals 30,000 x 12 equals 360,000 rupees. If she pays municipal taxes of 36,000 rupees annually, her net annual value would be Net annual value equals 360,000. 36,000 equals 324,000 rupees. Robbie nodded, writing down the calculations. So, this is the amount she is taxed on? Exactly, Mr. Sharma affirmed. However, under Section 27, she can claim a standard deduction of 30% on the net annual value to account for expenses like repairs and maintenance. This deduction helps reduce her taxable income. That's a smart move. So how does that calculation work? Robbie asked, intrigued. Let's calculate her taxable income after the standard deduction, Mr. Sharma said, scribbling on the whiteboard. The standard deduction for Mrs. Iyer would be Standard deduction equals net annual value x 30%. Standard deduction equals 324,000 x 30% equals 97,200 rupees. So, what is her taxable income after this deduction? Ravi asked Keen to find out. Her taxable income from the property would be Taxable income equals net annual value, standard deduction. Taxable income equals 324,000. 97,200 equals 226,800 rupees. Got it. But what if she also had some other income, like interest from a fixed deposit? Ravi inquired eager to connect the dots. Great point. If Mrs. Iyer had additional income, like 50,000 rupees from a fixed deposit, she would simply add that to her total income, Mr. Sharma explained. Her total taxable income would then be total taxable income equals taxable income from property plus interest income. Total taxable income equals 226,800 plus 50,000 equals 276,800 rupees. That's quite clear. But what about taxes? How does she calculate her tax liability? Ravi asked, seeking more details. Good question. The tax liability would depend on her income tax slab, Mr. Sharma explained. If Mrs. Iyer is in the 20% tax bracket, her tax on the income would be calculated based on the applicable slab rates. For simplicity, let's assume she pays 20% on the total taxable income of 276,800 rupees. Robbie took a moment to absorb this information. So how much tax would that be? The tax calculation would be as follows. Tax equals total taxable income X tax rate. Tax equals 276,800 X 20% equals 55,360 rupees. That is a significant amount. Are there any exemptions available under Section 27? Ravi asked, intrigued. Excellent question, Ravi. 
While Section 27 provides specific guidelines for calculating income from property, Mrs. Iyer might also want to explore exemptions available under other sections, such as Section 54, if she decides to sell the property and reinvest the proceeds into another residential property, Mr. Sharma elaborated. This could help her save on capital gains tax. So, if she sells the property and buys another, she might not have to pay capital gains tax? Robbie summarized, now connecting various provisions of the direct tax code. Exactly. It's all about strategic planning. Knowing the sections and how to apply them can significantly impact one's tax liability, Mr. Sharma affirmed. As their session came to a close, Robbie felt a sense of accomplishment. Through the story of Mrs. Iyer and her property rental, he had grasped the provisions of Section 27 and learned how to calculate taxable income effectively. Mr. Sharma's engaging storytelling had illuminated the intricacies of the direct tax code, providing Robbie with practical knowledge he could apply in real-life scenarios. With newfound confidence, Robbie was ready to explore more sections of the tax code in the future. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Robbie was excited to delve into another session with Mr. Sharma, eager to unravel the complexities of the direct tax code. Today, he was particularly curious about Section 28 which deals with income that falls under the head profits and gains of business or profession. Good morning, Robbie. Mr. Sharma greeted him warmly as he entered the office. Are you ready to explore Section 28 today? Good morning, sir. Absolutely. I can't wait to learn how this section impacts businesses, Robbie replied, his enthusiasm palpable. Let's get started then. I want to introduce you to Mr. Gupta, a small business owner who runs a successful bakery. His story will help us understand the provisions of Section 28, Mr. Sharma began. Ravi nodded, eager to hear more about Mr. Gupta's bakery. What kind of business does he run? Mr. Gupta opened his bakery five years ago, selling a variety of pastries, breads, and cakes. Let's say his total sales for the last financial year amounted to 25 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. According to Section 28, this income qualifies as profits and gains of business or profession. Got it. But how does Mr. Gupta calculate his taxable income? Ravi asked, leaning forward in his seat. Excellent question. To calculate taxable income under this section, Mr. Gupta needs to determine his gross profit first, Mr. Sharma continued. To do this, he will deduct the cost of goods sold from his total sales. Let's assume that his cost of goods sold, which includes ingredients, packaging, and labor amounts to 15 lakh rupees. So, his gross profit would be? Ravi asked, eager to perform the calculations. Let's calculate that. Gross profit equals total sales, cost of goods sold. Gross profit equals 25 lakh. 15 lakh equals 10 lakh rupees. Now, this is his gross profit. But what about expenses? Does he get to deduct those as well? Ravi inquired. Absolutely. Section 28 allows Mr. Gupta to deduct business expenses from his gross profit to arrive at his taxable income, Mr. Sharma explained. These expenses can include rent, utilities, salaries, and other operational costs. Let's say Mr. Gupta incurs total business expenses of 3 lakh rupees for the financial year. Ravi's eyes widened. So, what is his taxable income now? Let's calculate that. Taxable income equals gross profit, business expenses. Taxable income equals 10 lakh. 3 lakh equals 7 lakh rupees. Got it? So Mr. Gupta will be taxed on this 7 lakh rupees, Ravi summarized. Exactly. But there's more to Section 28. It also allows for certain deductions under specific subsections, particularly for depreciation of assets used in the business, Mr. Sharma elaborated. For example, if Mr. Gupta purchased an oven and some bakery equipment for a total of 2 lakh rupees, he can claim depreciation on these assets. Could you explain how depreciation works? Ravi asked, keen to learn more. Certainly. Depreciation allows a business to account for the decrease in value of an asset over time. Under Section 28, businesses can claim depreciation based on the prescribed rates. For example, if the depreciation rate for bakery equipment is 10%, Mr. Gupta could claim. Depreciation equals cost of asset x depreciation rate. Depreciation equals 2 lakh x 10% equals 20,000 rupees. 
So does he deduct this depreciation from his taxable income? Ravi asked, following the calculations closely. Exactly. Let's update Mr. Gupta's taxable income by including this depreciation deduction, Mr. Sharma said, writing on the whiteboard. His new taxable income would be revised taxable income equals original taxable income depreciation. Revised taxable income equals 7 lakh. 20,000 equals 6 lakh 80,000 rupees. Now that makes sense. So, he will be taxed on 6 lakh 80,000 rupees, Ravi noted, feeling more confident about the calculations. Correct. However, it is also crucial for Mr. Gupta to maintain proper records of all his sales and expenses. This is not just a good practice, but a requirement under the direct tax code, as it helps substantiate his claims during tax assessments, Mr. Sharma pointed out. Does Mr. Gupta have any other obligations under this section? Ravi asked, eager to understand the broader implications. Yes, he does. Mr. Gupta must also file his tax returns and declare his income accurately to avoid penalties. If he fails to do so, he might face scrutiny from the tax authorities, Mr. Sharma emphasized. So, by following these guidelines, Mr. Gupta can efficiently manage his tax liabilities while ensuring compliance with the direct tax code, Ravi concluded, feeling satisfied with his understanding. Exactly. The story of Mr. Gupta illustrates how Section 28 works in real life. By being aware of the provisions, he can optimize his tax planning effectively, Mr. Sharma said with a smile. As their session concluded, Ravi felt a sense of accomplishment. The story of Mr. Gupta's bakery had helped him understand the intricacies of Section 28 in a practical context. With each story Mr. Sharma shared, Ravi grew more confident in navigating the direct tax code preparing him for a successful future in accounting. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Robbie was once again sitting in Mr. Sharma's office, eager to expand his knowledge of the direct tax code. Today, they were set to explore Section 29, which deals with the assessment of income for the purpose of taxation. Robbie had heard a lot about the nuances of this section, and he was ready to learn. Good morning, Robbie. Are you prepared to dive into the intricacies of Section 29 today? Mr. Sharma greeted him with a warm smile. Good morning, sir. Yes, I am really looking forward to understanding how this section works, Ravi replied enthusiastically. Fantastic. To help illustrate the provisions of Section 29, let's talk about a fictional character named Ms. Nisha. She runs a successful event planning business. Her story will shed light on how income assessment is conducted under this section, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi was intrigued. What kind of events does Ms. Nisha plan? Ms. Nisha specializes in organizing weddings and corporate events. For the previous financial year, she reported her gross income as 15 lakh rupees. This figure reflects all her earnings before any deductions, Mr. Sharma continued. Okay, so that's her gross income. But how does she determine her taxable income? Ravi asked, leaning in closer. Great question. According to Section 29, Ms. Nisha needs to calculate her taxable income by deducting allowable business expenses from her gross income. Let's say her total business expenses for the year amount to 8 lakh rupees. These expenses can include venue rentals, catering services, decorations, and staff payments, Mr. Sharma explained. All right. So if we deduct her expenses, what does her taxable income look like? Ravi asked eagerly. Let's calculate that. Taxable income equals gross income, allowable business expenses. Taxable income equals 15 lakh. 8 lakh equals 7 lakh rupees. Ravi nodded, taking notes. So, Ms. Nisha will be taxed on 7 lakh rupees. But are there any additional deductions she can claim under this section? Yes, indeed. Section 29 also allows for certain deductions, especially for depreciation of business assets. Let's say Ms. Nisha invested in new equipment for her business, such as a professional sound system and lighting, costing her 2 lakh rupees. The depreciation rate for such equipment is 15%. Mr. Sharma elaborated. Got it. So how would she calculate the depreciation on this equipment? Ravi asked, eager to understand. Depreciation can be calculated as follows. Depreciation equals cost of asset x depreciation rate. 
Depreciation equals 2 lakh x 15% equals 30,000 rupees. Now, does she deduct this depreciation from her taxable income? Ravi inquired. Exactly. By deducting the depreciation expense, we can arrive at her revised taxable income. Let's calculate that. Revised taxable income equals original taxable income depreciation. Revised taxable income equals 7 lakh. 30,000 equals 6 lakh 70,000 rupees. Now I see. So, Ms. Nisha will be taxed on 6 lakh 70,000 rupees, Ravi summarized. Right? It is essential for her to maintain thorough documentation of her income and expenses. Proper record keeping not only helps in filing accurate tax returns, but also protects her in case of any tax audits, Mr. Sharma emphasized. Does Ms. Nisha have any further responsibilities under Section 29? Ravi asked. Yes, she does. It is crucial for Ms. Nisha to file her income tax return on time. If she fails to do so, she may incur penalties and interest on any unpaid tax. Moreover, she must ensure that her financial statements comply with accounting standards, which provide an accurate picture of her financial position, Mr. Sharma pointed out. By following these guidelines, Ms. Nisha can efficiently manage her tax liabilities and stay compliant with the direct tax code, Ravi concluded, feeling more confident about the material. Exactly. The story of Ms. Nisha illustrates how Section 29 operates in the real world. By understanding the provisions and keeping accurate records, she can navigate the complexities of income assessment successfully, Mr. Sharma said, pleased with Ravi's understanding. As their session wrapped up, Ravi felt a sense of achievement. The story of Ms. Nisha's event planning business had not only clarified the provisions of Section 29, but also demonstrated the importance of financial prudence in the realm of taxation. With each session, Ravi was steadily becoming more adept at handling the intricacies of the direct tax code, preparing him for a promising career in accounting. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi was excited for his next session with Mr. Sharma. Today, they were set to delve into Section 30 of the Direct Tax Code, which pertains to the provisions regarding income from other sources. This section intrigued Ravi, and he was eager to understand its implications in real-life scenarios. Good morning, Ravi. Are you ready to explore Section 30 today? Mr. Sharma greeted him as Ravi settled into his chair. Good morning, sir. Yes, I can't wait to learn about how income from other sources works, Ravi replied with enthusiasm. Excellent. To make this more relatable, let's consider the story of Mr. Anand, a retired government employee. He has diversified his income sources after retirement, and his experience will illustrate the key provisions of Section 30, Mr. Sharma began. Interesting. What kinds of income does Mr. Anand have? Ravi asked, leaning in with curiosity. Mr. Anand receives a pension of 4 lakh rupees per year, and he also has investments in fixed deposits that yield interest income of 1 lakh rupees annually. Additionally, he occasionally earns money by giving tuition lessons, which brings in about 50,000 rupees each year, Mr. Sharma explained. So, all of these incomes fall under the category of income from other sources? Ravi inquired. Yes, exactly. According to Section 30, any income that is not specifically categorized under salaries, business profits, or capital gains is classified as income from other sources. Let's break down Mr. Anand's income. Pension, for lakh rupees. Interest from fixed deposits, 1 lakh rupees. Tuition income, 50,000 rupees. So, Mr. Anand's total income from other sources would be 5 lakh 50,000 rupees, Mr. Sharma said. Ravi nodded, taking notes. But how does Mr. Anand report this income for tax purposes? Under Section 30, Mr. Anand is required to report all these sources of income in his income tax return. To determine his taxable income, he should first add up all the amounts. Let's calculate that. Total income from other sources equals pension plus interest plus tuition. Total income equals 4 lakh plus 1 lakh plus 50,000 equals 5 lakh 50,000 rupees. So, this is the total income he needs to consider for taxation. But does he have any deductions available under this section? Ravi asked. Great question. While Section 30 does not allow many deductions, 
It does permit certain expenses to be deducted if they are directly related to earning the income, Mr. Sharma explained. For example, if Mr. Anand spends 5,000 rupees on teaching materials for his tuition classes, he can claim this as a deduction. Got it? So, what would his taxable income look like after considering this deduction? Ravi asked, eager to see the calculations. Let's do that. Taxable income equals total income from other sources, allowable deductions. Taxable income equals 5 lakh 50,000. 5,000 equals 5 lakh 45,000 rupees. So Mr. Anna will be taxed on 5 lakh 45,000 rupees, Ravi summarized. Correct. It is also important for Mr. Anand to maintain proper documentation for all his income sources and deductions. This helps in substantiating his claims if there are any queries from tax authorities, Mr. Sharma emphasized. Does Mr. Anand need to worry about any other provisions under this section? Ravi inquired. Yes, he should be aware of certain provisions related to non-taxable income as well. For instance, any gifts received from family members or certain specified relatives up to a particular limit are not taxable under this section, Mr. Sharma elaborated. However, if he receives any gifts from non-relatives that exceed 50,000 rupees, those amounts will be considered taxable income. That's interesting. So, he needs to keep track of the nature of gifts he receives as well. Robbie asked, Absolutely. Understanding these nuances is crucial for effective tax planning. By being aware of what is taxable and what isn't, Mr. Anand can optimize his tax liability, Mr. Sharma said with a smile. As their session concluded, Ravi felt a sense of accomplishment. The story of Mr. Anand's retirement income had helped him understand the provisions of Section 30 in a practical context. With each story Mr. Sharma shared, Ravi grew more confident in navigating the complexities of the direct tax code, preparing him for a successful career in accounting. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. Ravi entered Mr. Sharma's office eager for another enlightening session. Today, they were going to cover Section 31 of the Direct Tax Code, which deals with the taxation of income from house property. With a gleam of excitement in his eyes, Ravi was ready to learn. Good morning, Ravi. Today, we will explore Section 31. Are you prepared for a deep dive into the world of house property taxation? Mr. Sharma greeted him warmly. Good morning, sir. Yes, I'm looking forward to understanding how this section works, Ravi replied, eager to begin. Fantastic. Let's illustrate the provisions of Section 31 through the story of Mr. Karen, a middle-aged individual who owns two residential properties. One property is rented out while he resides in the other. His story will help clarify how income from house property is assessed for tax purposes, Mr. Sharma began. Interesting. What can you tell me about Mr. Karen's properties? Ravi asked, intrigued. Mr. Karen's first property is a two-bedroom apartment in a prime location that he has rented out for 25,000 rupees per month. His second property is a cozy two-bedroom home where he lives with his family. For this session, we will focus on the rented property, Mr. Sharma explained. Okay, so how does Mr. Karen determine his taxable income from this rented property? Ravi asked, wanted to understand the calculation process. Under Section 31, the rental income from the property is considered the gross annual value. To calculate the taxable income, we must consider certain deductions. Let's break this down. Gross annual value equals monthly rent times 12 months. Gross annual value equals 25,000 times 12 equals 3 lakh rupees. Got it? So... Mr. Karen has a gross annual value of 3 lakh rupees from his rented property, Ravi said, jotting down the figures. Exactly. Now, he can claim deductions under this section. The two main deductions allowed are Standard deduction. This is a flat deduction of 30% of the gross annual value to cover expenses related to the maintenance of the property. Interest on home loan. If Mr. Karen has taken a home loan to purchase the property, he can deduct the interest paid on the loan. Interesting. So, what would the deductions look like for Mr. Karen? Ravi asked. Let's assume that Mr. Karen has paid an interest of 50,000 rupees on his home loan. Here's how we can calculate the deductions. Standard deduction equals gross annual value times 
Standard deduction equals 3 lakh times 30% equals 90,000 rupees. So, his total deductions would be the sum of the standard deduction and the interest paid on the home loan. Total deductions equals standard deduction plus interest on home loan. Total deductions equals 90,000 plus 50,000 equals 1 lakh 40,000 rupees. Now, how does this affect Mr. Karen's taxable income? Ravi inquired. Let's calculate the taxable income. Taxable income equals gross annual value. Total deductions. Taxable income equals 3 lakh. 1 lakh 40,000 equals 1 lakh 60,000 rupees. So, Mr. Karen will be taxed on 1 lakh 60,000 rupees from his rented property, Ravi concluded. Correct. But it is also important to note that if Mr. Karen were to sell his second property or rent it out in the future, he must account for the capital gains tax and additional rental income accordingly. He would then need to follow the provisions of the direct tax code related to those transactions, Mr. Sharma explained. Does Mr. Karen need to keep any specific documents for these calculations? Robbie asked. Yes, he should maintain proper documentation such as rent agreements, receipts for loan interest payments, and records of any maintenance expenses incurred. This documentation is essential in case of an audit or for verifying claims made in his tax return, Mr. Sharma advised. That's a lot to consider. Is there anything else Mr. Karen should keep in mind under Section 31? Ravi asked. Absolutely. If Mr. Karen had any losses from his house property, he could carry forward those losses to set them off against income from house property in subsequent years, subject to certain conditions, Mr. Sharma noted. As their session concluded, Ravi felt enlightened. The story of Mr. Karen and his house properties had brought the provisions of Section 31 to life, helping him understand the taxation of income from house property in a practical context. With each story, Ravi was gaining confidence and knowledge, paving the way for his future career in accounting. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. As Ravi walked into Mr. Sharma's office, he felt a mix of anticipation and curiosity. Today, they were going to cover Section 32 of the Direct Tax Code, which deals with the provisions related to depreciation. Mr. Sharma had a knack for storytelling, and Robbie knew that today's lesson would be both informative and engaging. Good morning, Robbie. Ready to dive into the world of depreciation under Section 32. Mr. Sharma greeted him with a smile. Good morning, sir. Yes. I'm eager to learn how depreciation works and why it is important, Ravi replied, settling into his chair. Wonderful. To make this section more relatable, let's explore the story of Ms. Neha, a small business owner who runs a boutique. Her experiences will help us understand the key provisions of Section 32, Mr. Sharma began. Sounds great. What kind of assets does Ms. Neha have? Ravi asked, intrigued. Ms. Neha has several assets in her boutique including furniture, computers, and a delivery vehicle. Each of these assets depreciates over time, and understanding this helps her calculate her taxable income effectively, Mr. Sharma explained. So, how does Ms. Neha determine the depreciation on her assets? Ravi inquired, eager for details. Under Section 32, depreciation is calculated on tangible assets like furniture and vehicles, as well as intangible assets like patents and trademarks. Let's focus on the tangible assets in Ms. Neha's boutique, Mr. Sharma continued. All right, what assets does she need to depreciate? Ravi asked. Let's consider the following assets. Furniture, purchased for 50,000 rupees with a useful life of 10 years. Computer, bought for 30,000 rupees with a useful life of 5 years. Delivery vehicle, acquired for 5 lakh rupees with a useful life of eight years. Ms. Neha can claim depreciation on these assets as per the prescribed rates in the direct tax code, Mr. Sharma explained. Are there specific rates for depreciation? Ravi asked, taking notes. Yes, there are. The rates for these assets are as follows. Furniture, 10% per annum. Computers, 40% per annum. Delivery vehicle, 15% per annum. Now, let's calculate the depreciation for each asset, Mr. Sharma suggested. Sure. So, what would the calculations look like? Ravi asked. Let's do it step by step. Depreciation on furniture. Cost, 50,000 rupees. 
rate, 10%. Depreciation, 50,000 times 10% equals 5,000 rupees. Depreciation on computer, cost, 30,000 rupees. Rate, 40%. Depreciation, 30,000 times 40% equals 12,000 rupees. Depreciation on delivery vehicle, cost, 5 lakh rupees. Rate, 15%. Depreciation, 5 lakh times 15% equals 75,000 rupees. Now, let's add up the total depreciation Ms. Neha can claim for the financial year, Mr. Sharma said, smiling. All right, so the total depreciation would be Total depreciation equals depreciation on furniture plus depreciation on computer plus depreciation on delivery vehicle. Total depreciation equals 5,000 plus 12,000 plus 75,000 equals 92,000 rupees. Exactly. This total depreciation amount reduces Ms. Neha's taxable income, thus reducing her tax liability, Mr. Sharma explained. By accounting for depreciation, she can reflect the true economic cost of her assets over their useful life. Does Ms. Neha need to maintain any records for these calculations? Ravi asked. Yes, she must maintain proper documentation for all her assets, including purchase invoices, records of depreciation calculations, and any related expenses. This documentation is vital for her tax returns and in case of audits by the tax authorities, Mr. Sharma advised. What if Ms. Neha sells any of her assets? How does that affect her taxes? Ravi inquired. Great question. If Ms. Neha sells any of her depreciable assets, she may incur capital gains or losses, which must be reported in her tax returns. If the sale proceeds exceed the written down value of the asset, it would result in a capital gain, and she may need to pay tax on that gain, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Understood. Is there anything else Ms. Neha should keep in mind regarding depreciation under Section 32? Robbie asked. She should also be aware of the provision for additional depreciation if she acquires new machinery or equipment. This provision allows for an extra depreciation deduction in the year of acquisition, which can further reduce her taxable income, Mr. Sharma noted. As their session wrapped up, Robbie felt empowered by the knowledge he had gained. The story of Ms. Neha and her boutique had vividly illustrated the provisions of Section 32, helping him understand the significance of depreciation in real-life scenarios. With each session, Ravi was becoming more adept at navigating the complexities of the direct tax code, preparing him for a successful career in accounting. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. As Ravi entered Mr. Sharma's office for another engaging session, he felt the familiar mix of excitement and curiosity. Today, they would be delving into Section 33 of the Direct Tax Code, which revolves around the provisions related to capital gains. Mr. Sharma had a unique ability to make complex topics relatable, and Ravi was eager to learn. Good morning, Ravi. Are you ready to explore Section 33 today? Mr. Sharma greeted him with a warm smile. Good morning, sir. Yes. I'm looking forward to understanding capital gains better, Ravi replied enthusiastically. Excellent. To make the provisions clear, let's consider the case of Mr. Raj, who recently sold a piece of land. His experience will help illustrate the key aspects of this section, Mr. Sharma began. Great. What happened with Mr. Raj? Ravi asked, settling into his chair. Mr. Raj inherited a piece of land from his father, purchased decades ago, for 20 lakh rupees. Recently, he sold this land for 50 lakh rupees. This transaction falls under the provisions of capital gains as specified in Section 33, Mr. Sharma explained. Okay, so how does Mr. Raj calculate his capital gains? Ravi inquired. First, we need to determine the capital gain, which is calculated as the difference between the selling price and the cost of acquisition. In Mr. Raj's case, selling price, 50 lakh rupees. Cost of acquisition, 20 lakh rupees. Now let's do the calculation. Capital gain equals selling price, cost of acquisition. Capital gain equals 50 lakh. 20 lakh equals 30 lakh rupees. Got it? So, Mr. Raj has a capital gain of 30 lakh rupees. What happens next? Ravi asked. 
Now, Mr. Raj must consider whether this gain is long-term or short-term. Since he inherited the land, the holding period is considered from the date of acquisition by his father, making it a long-term capital asset. Long-term capital gains are taxed differently than short-term gains, Mr. Sharma explained. What is the tax rate for long-term capital gains? Ravi inquired. For long-term capital gains on the sale of property, the tax rate is 20% after applying indexation. Indexation adjusts the cost of acquisition for inflation, which can significantly reduce the taxable amount, Mr. Sharma clarified. Can you show me how indexation works? Ravi asked. Of course. Let's assume the cost inflation index for the year Mr. Raj sold the property is 320. The base year for indexation is typically the year the asset was acquired, which in this case is the year Mr. Raj's father bought the land, let's say in the year 2000. The cost inflation index for that year was 150. Now we can calculate the index cost of acquisition, Mr. Sharma said. Index cost of acquisition equals cost of acquisition times current year index slash base year index. Index cost of acquisition equals 20 lakh times 320 slash 150. Index cost of acquisition equals 44 lakh rupees. Wow, that's a significant adjustment. So, what does that mean for Mr. Raj's tax liability? Ravi asked, following along. Now, we calculate the long-term capital gains after indexation. Long-term capital gain equals selling price. Index cost of acquisition. Long-term capital gain equals 50 lakh. 44 lakh equals 6 lakh rupees. Mr. Raj will now pay a tax of 20% on this 6 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Let's calculate the tax amount, Ravi suggested. Tax amount equals long-term capital gain times tax rate. Tax amount equals 6 lakh times 20% equals 1 lakh 20,000 rupees. Exactly. Mr. Raj's tax liability from this capital gain transaction will be 1 lakh 20,000 rupees, Mr. Sharma confirmed. What if Mr. Raj wants to reinvest this amount? Can he save on taxes? Ravi asked. Good thinking, Ravi. Under Section 33, there are provisions for exemptions if he invests in specified assets. For instance, if he invests the capital gains in residential property within a certain time frame, he may be eligible for exemptions under Section 54, Mr. Sharma explained. That's interesting. So, Mr. Raj can potentially save on taxes if he reinvests? Ravi asked, intrigued. Exactly. It's a great way for taxpayers to reduce their tax liability while also investing in assets that can appreciate over time, Mr. Sharma affirmed. As their session came to a close, Ravi felt empowered with newfound knowledge about capital gains and their implications. The story of Mr. Raj had effectively illustrated the provisions of Section 33, making the concepts clear and relevant. With each discussion, Ravi was not only learning the intricacies of the direct tax code, but also gaining confidence in applying this knowledge practically in his future career. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a crisp afternoon, Ravi walked into Mr. Sharma's office, ready for another engaging lesson on the direct tax code. Today, he was particularly curious about Section 34, which deals with the provisions related to income from business or profession. Good afternoon, Ravi. I hope you're ready to explore the nuances of Section 34 today. Mr. Sharma greeted him warmly. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, I am excited to learn about how income from business is treated under the direct tax code, Ravi replied enthusiastically. Fantastic. Let's illustrate this with a real-life case study involving Ms. Mira, who runs a successful catering business. Her story will help us understand the key provisions of Section 34, Mr. Sharma began. Tell me more about Ms. Mira, Ravi urged, leaning forward in his chair. Ms. Mira started her catering business three years ago, and it has grown significantly. She provides services for weddings, parties, and corporate events. As a business owner, Ms. Mira needs to be aware of how her income is taxed according to the provisions of Section 34, Mr. Sharma explained. Okay, but what does Section 34 specifically cover? Ravi asked. Section 34 primarily addresses the computation of income under the heads, profits, and gains of business or profession. 
It lays down the guidelines for how businesses can calculate their taxable income. Let's say Ms. Mira earned a total revenue of 50 lakh rupees from her catering services last year, Mr. Sharma explained. Wow, that's impressive. But what about her expenses? Can she deduct those? Ravi inquired. Absolutely. Ms. Mira can deduct all the expenses that are incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of her business. For example, she spends on raw materials, staff salaries, rent for her kitchen, and utility bills. Let's say her total expenses amount to 30 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma continued. So, how does Ms. Mira calculate her taxable income? Ravi asked, trying to connect the dots. To calculate taxable income, we subtract her total expenses from her total revenue. Here's how it looks. Taxable income equals total revenue, total expenses. Taxable income equals 50 lakh. 30 lakh equals 20 lakh rupees. Got it? So, Ms. Mira's taxable income would be 20 lakh rupees. What if she wants to claim depreciation on her assets? Robbie asked, intrigued. Great question. Under Section 34, Ms. Mira can also claim depreciation on the assets used for her business, such as kitchen equipment and furniture. Depreciation is allowed to account for the wear and tear of these assets over time. Let's say her total depreciation expense amounts to 2 lakh rupees. Mr. Sharma explained. Does that mean she can reduce her taxable income further? Ravi asked, eyes wide with understanding. Exactly. The revised calculation will then be, revised taxable income equals taxable income depreciation. Revised taxable income equals 20 lakh. 2 lakh equals 18 lakh rupees. That's helpful. So, now Ms. Mira has an income of 18 lakh rupees to report, Ravi noted. Right? However, Ms. Mira must also keep in mind that if she has any losses from previous years, she can carry them forward to set them off against her current year's income. For instance, if Ms. Mira incurred a loss of 5 lakh rupees in the previous year, she can adjust that against her income this year, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Can you show me how that works? Ravi asked eagerly. Of course. Here's how we'll look after adjusting for the previous year's loss. Final taxable income equals revised taxable income, carry forward loss. Final taxable income equals 18 lakh. 5 lakh equals 13 lakh rupees. Wow, so Ms. Mira can significantly reduce her taxable income by considering her previous losses. That's really useful, Ravi exclaimed. Yes, it is. Also, Remember that Ms. Mira must maintain proper documentation for her expenses and losses to ensure compliance with tax regulations. This includes invoices, receipts, and any other relevant records, Mr. Sharma reminded him. What about tax rates, sir? How will she be taxed on her final taxable income? Ravi asked, leaning back in thought. Ms. Mira's tax liability will depend on the applicable tax rates for her income slab. Since she is running a business, her income will be taxed according to the prevailing rates for individuals or companies, depending on how she has structured her business, Mr. Sharma replied. As their session came to a close, Robbie felt enlightened about the provisions of Section 34 of the Direct Tax Code. Ms. Mira's story not only illustrated the essential aspects of calculating income from business, but also highlighted the importance of strategic financial planning. With each discussion, Ravi's understanding deepened, and he was eager to apply this knowledge in his future career as a chartered accountant. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a bright Tuesday morning, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, his mind buzzing with anticipation. Today, he was eager to learn about Section 35 of the Direct Tax Code, which pertains to deductions for certain expenditures on scientific research and development. Good morning, Ravi. Are you ready for another insightful session? Mr. Sharma greeted him with a smile. Good morning, sir. Yes, I'm looking forward to understanding Section 35, Ravi replied, his curiosity piqued. Excellent. Let's explore this section through the story of Mr. Anand, who owns a tech startup focused on developing innovative software solutions. His journey will help us grasp the key provisions of Section 35, Mr. Sharma began. Tell me about Mr. Anand. Ravi encouraged, settling into his seat. Mr. Anand's company has been working on a groundbreaking artificial intelligence product. 
To stay competitive, he has invested significantly in research and development, or R&D, which is crucial for innovation in the tech industry. Under Section 35, Mr. Anand can claim deductions for certain expenses related to his R&D activities, Mr. Sharma explained. That's interesting. What kind of expenses can he claim? Ravi asked, eager to learn. Under Section 35, there are specific provisions that allow for deductions on expenditures incurred for scientific research. For instance, Mr. Anand can claim deductions for salaries of his research team, costs of materials used in the development process, and even the cost of renting a laboratory, Mr. Sharma clarified. Can you give me an example of these costs? Ravi asked. Certainly. Let's say Mr. Anand spends 10 lakh rupees on salaries for his researchers and another 2 lakh rupees on materials. Additionally, he pays 3 lakh rupees in rent for the lab. Altogether, his total expenditure on R&D would be 15 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma detailed. So, he can deduct this amount from his taxable income? Ravi questioned, beginning to connect the dots. Exactly. Mr. Anand can deduct the entire amount of 15 lakh rupees from his taxable income, as these expenses are incurred for scientific research and development. However, it is important to note that to qualify for the deduction, the research must be conducted in India and should be related to the business's operations, Mr. Sharma emphasized. What if Mr. Anand collaborates with a university or a research institution? Does that affect his deductions? Ravi inquired, intrigued by the possibilities. Great question. If Mr. Anand collaborates with a recognized research institution, he may be eligible for enhanced deductions. For instance, Section 35 allows for a higher deduction of one and a half times the actual expenditure incurred on approved scientific research if it is carried out in collaboration with an institution recognized by the government. This incentivizes businesses to engage in research that has broader societal benefits, Mr. Sharma explained. Wow! That means Mr. Anand could potentially claim more than he actually spends if he collaborates with a recognized institution. Ravi exclaimed, Precisely. This provision aims to encourage businesses to invest in R&D and innovation. However, Mr. Anand must ensure that he keeps all the necessary documentation, such as contracts with the research institution, invoices for expenses, and any other relevant records to support his claims, Mr. Sharma cautioned. What happens if Mr. Anand's research does not yield positive results? Can he still claim the deductions? Ravi asked, pondering the challenges of research. Indeed, Ravi. The deductions under Section 35 are not contingent on the success of the research. As long as the expenses are incurred for the purpose of scientific research, Mr. Anand can claim them, regardless of the outcome. This reflects the understanding that R&D is inherently risky and can sometimes lead to failure, Mr. Sharma noted. As their session progressed, Ravi became more fascinated by the provisions of Section 35. He realized how crucial these deductions could be for fostering innovation and growth within businesses like Mr. Anand's tech startup. By supporting research and development, the government aimed to propel industries forward, benefiting not just the businesses but also the economy at large. By the end of the lesson, Ravi felt inspired and equipped with valuable knowledge about the financial incentives available for scientific research. He understood that as a future chartered accountant, he would play a vital role in guiding businesses like Mr. Anand's toward making the most of these provisions. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a sunny afternoon, Ravi walked into Mr. Sharma's office, eager for another engaging session. Today, he was keen to delve into Section 36 of the Direct Tax Code, which pertains to deductions for certain expenditures related to the business. Good afternoon, Ravi. Ready to explore some more tax provisions? Mr. Sharma greeted, adjusting his glasses. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, I am excited to learn about Section 36. Ravi replied, settling into his seat. Fantastic. Let's discuss this section through the story of Ms. Priya, who runs a successful bakery called Sweet Delights. Her business provides a great backdrop for understanding the key provisions of Section 36, Mr. Sharma began. Tell me about Ms. Priya, Ravi prompted, eager to learn. Ms. Priya has always had a passion for baking. Over the years, her bakery has grown, and she now has several employees a variety of equipment and supplies. Under Section 36, 
She can claim deductions for specific expenses incurred in the course of running her business, Mr. Sharma explained. What types of expenses can she deduct? Ravi asked, his curiosity piqued. Section 36 outlines several expenditures that are eligible for deduction. For instance, Ms. Priya can deduct expenses related to the maintenance of her bakery equipment, the cost of raw materials, and even salaries paid to her staff, Mr. Sharma clarified. That makes sense. But are there any specific limits or conditions for these deductions? Ravi inquired. Good question. One notable provision under Section 36 is that Ms. Priya can claim deductions for bad debts that are written off in her books. For example, if a customer ordered cakes for a wedding but failed to pay, Ms. Priya could write off that amount as a bad debt. Mr. Sharma elaborated. How does she do that? Ravi asked, intrigued. When a business recognizes a debt as irrecoverable, it must ensure that the debt was included in the taxable income in the previous years. By writing off this amount, Ms. Priya effectively reduces her taxable income for the current year, Mr. Sharma explained. That sounds practical. Are there any other types of expenses she can deduct? Ravi continued to probe. Yes. Section 36 also covers expenses related to the insurance of the business assets, like property and machinery. If Ms. Priya pays for insurance to protect her bakery against fire or theft, she can deduct those premiums, Mr. Sharma noted. Interesting. What about interest on loans? Can she deduct that as well? Ravi asked. Absolutely. If Ms. Priya has taken a loan to expand her bakery, the interest on that loan is also deductible under Section 36. This encourages entrepreneurs to invest in their businesses without worrying about the tax burden, Mr. Sharma affirmed. What if she spends money on advertising or promoting her bakery? Is that deductible too? Ravi queried. Great point. Yes, expenses incurred for advertising and promoting her business, such as printing flyers or running social media campaigns, are also deductible under Section 36. This provision is designed to support businesses in increasing their visibility in sales, Mr. Sharma explained. As they continued discussing the provisions, Ravi learned that Ms. Priya must maintain proper records and documentation for all these expenditures. This included invoices, receipts, and any relevant contracts to substantiate her claims during tax assessments. Is there a particular process Ms. Priya needs to follow to claim these deductions? Ravi asked, wanted to understand the practical aspects. Indeed, Ms. Priya should ensure that all her records are organized and accurate. When filing her income tax return, she will need to fill out the relevant forms and provide details of her deductions. It's essential for her to keep track of all eligible expenses throughout the year. Mr. Sharma advised. Wow, this really opens my eyes to how important it is for businesses to understand tax provisions. I can see how these deductions can significantly impact their bottom line, Ravi remarked, feeling inspired. Exactly, Ravi. Understanding these provisions empowers entrepreneurs like Ms. Priya to make informed financial decisions and optimize their tax liabilities. As a future chartered accountant, you will play a vital role in guiding clients through these complexities, Mr. Sharma concluded. By the end of the session, Ravi felt a newfound appreciation for Section 36 of the Direct Tax Code. The story of Ms. Priya and her bakery illustrated how crucial these deductions were for fostering growth and sustainability in small businesses. With this knowledge, Ravi was excited to help entrepreneurs navigate the tax landscape in his future career. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a breezy afternoon, Ravi stepped into Mr. Sharma's office, a place that had become his sanctuary for learning the intricacies of the direct tax code. Today, he was excited to explore Section 37, which covers the deductions for expenses incurred by a business. Good afternoon, Ravi. Ready to dive into another fascinating aspect of taxation. Mr. Sharma welcomed him warmly. Good afternoon, sir. I can't wait to learn about Section 37, Ravi replied enthusiastically. Today, let's focus on the story of Mr. Anil, who runs a flourishing IT consulting firm called Tech Solutions. This case will help us understand the key provisions of Section 37, Mr. Sharma began. Tell me about Mr. Anil's firm, Ravi prompted, eager to grasp the details. Mr. Anil's firm provides a range of IT services to businesses. As his company grows, 
he incurs various expenses that he can claim as deductions under Section 37. This section allows businesses to deduct any expenditure that is wholly and exclusively incurred for the purpose of their business, Mr. Sharma explained. What kinds of expenses are included in this section? Ravi asked as curiosity peaked. One key provision is that Mr. Anil can claim deductions for expenses related to running his office, such as rent, utilities, and salaries of employees. For instance, if he rents an office space in a commercial complex, that rent is fully deductible, Mr. Sharma clarified. That's clear. But are there any specific conditions for these deductions? Ravi inquired. Indeed. The primary condition is that the expenditure must be for the purpose of the business. Let's say Mr. Anil spends money on a team-building retreat for his employees. If this expense is aimed at improving productivity and morale, it is considered a valid deduction under Section 37, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Interesting. What about promotional expenses? Can those be deducted too? Ravi continued to probe. Absolutely. If Mr. Anil spends on marketing his services, such as creating a website or running online advertisements, these costs are also deductible. The idea is to ensure that businesses can invest in growth without the additional tax burden, Mr. Sharma affirmed. What about donations? Are there any tax implications if Mr. Anil donates to a charity? Ravi asked. Great question. If Mr. Anil makes a donation to a registered charity, while it may not fall directly under Section 37, it may still provide him with a tax deduction under other relevant sections, depending on the nature of the donation. However, the donation must be made without expecting anything in return, Mr. Sharma clarified. Understood. Can you give me an example of a peculiar expense that may or may not qualify? Ravi inquired, wanting to delve deeper. Sure. Let's consider an example of Mr. Anil purchasing a luxury car for business purposes. If he uses this car solely for business meetings and travel, he can claim a proportion of the expenses related to the car, such as fuel and maintenance. However, if it's a lavish vehicle that could be perceived as a personal expense, then the deductions may be scrutinized and only a reasonable portion may be allowable, Mr. Sharma explained. Ah, I see. It's about distinguishing between personal and business expenses, Ravi noted, grasping the concept. Exactly. Another important aspect of Section 37 is that the expenses must be incurred during the previous year. For instance, if Mr. Anil pays his employees' salaries for the month of March in the following financial year, he cannot claim these deductions in the current assessment year, Mr. Sharma elaborated. That makes sense. Are there any records he must maintain? Ravi asked, keen to understand the practicalities. Definitely. Proper documentation is crucial. Mr. Anil should maintain records such as invoices, receipts, and payment records for all expenditures he plans to claim as deductions. This documentation will be vital during tax assessments to substantiate his claims, Mr. Sharma advised. As the session continued, Ravi learned about the importance of Section 37 in helping businesses reduce their taxable income through legitimate expenses. He understood that the key to maximizing deductions lay in maintaining clear records and ensuring that expenses were justifiable under the provisions of the code. I feel much more informed now. Understanding these provisions will not only help businesses like Mr. Anil's, but also equip me to advise my future clients effectively, Ravi remarked feeling empowered by the knowledge he had gained. Absolutely, Ravi. As a future chartered accountant, your understanding of these intricacies will enable you to guide entrepreneurs towards better financial management. Today, you've taken another step toward becoming an effective advisor, Mr. Sharma concluded, pleased with Ravi's progress. By the end of the session, Ravi felt a newfound confidence in tackling the provisions of Section 37 of the Direct Tax Code. The story of Mr. Anil and his IT consulting firm illustrated the practical application of these deductions, reinforcing the importance of understanding tax regulations and fostering business growth. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a rainy afternoon, Ravi walked into Mr. Sharma's office, eager to delve into the nuances of taxation once again. Today, the focus would be on Section 38 of the Direct Tax Code, which deals with the provisions for the taxation of capital assets. Good afternoon, Ravi. Ready for another exciting session? 
Mr. Sharma greeted him with a smile. Good afternoon, sir. I am really looking forward to learning about Section 38, Ravi responded enthusiastically. Let's start with a story about Mrs. Mehta, who runs a boutique named Elegant Attire. Her case will help us understand the key provisions of Section 38, Mr. Sharma began. Tell me more about Mrs. Mehta's boutique, Ravi encouraged. Mrs. Mehta's boutique is known for its unique clothing line. Over the years, she has made several investments in capital assets, including sewing machines, furniture, and even a delivery van for her business. Under Section 38, the focus is on how these capital assets are treated for tax purposes, especially when they are sold, Mr. Sharma explained. What happens when she sells these assets? Robbie asked, intrigued. When Mrs. Mehta decides to sell her old sewing machines, for instance, Section 38 comes into play. The section outlines how the income from the sale of capital assets is calculated, taking into account the cost of acquisition and any improvements made to the asset, Mr. Sharma clarified. That sounds interesting. How does she calculate her gains from selling a capital asset? Ravi probed further. Good question. Let's say Mrs. Mehta bought a sewing machine for 50,000 rupees five years ago. If she sells it now for 20,000 rupees, she will incur a loss. The formula for calculating this is straightforward. Selling price minus cost of acquisition equals capital gain or loss, Mr. Sharma explained. Got it. But what if the asset has appreciated in value? Robbie continued to explore. If the sewing machine had appreciated and she sold it for 70,000 rupees instead, the capital gain would be 20,000 rupees. This gain would be taxable under the provisions of Section 38, which states that capital gains must be included in the income of the year in which the sale occurs. Mr. Sharma elaborated. Interesting. Are there different types of capital gains? Ravi inquired. Yes, there are two types, long-term and short-term capital gains. If Mrs. Mehta held the asset for more than 36 months, any gain would be classified as a long-term capital gain. This type is subject to a different tax rate compared to short-term capital gains, which apply to assets held for less than 36 months, Mr. Sharma explained. Could you give me an example of how the tax implications differ? Ravi asked, can you understand the nuances? Certainly. Let's say Mrs. Mehta sells her delivery van after two years for two lakh rupees having originally purchased it for 1 lakh 70,000 rupees. Here, she makes a short-term capital gain of 30,000 rupees. This gain would be taxed at her applicable income tax slab rate, Mr. Sharma clarified. And if she sold it after four years? Robbie followed up. In that case, since she held the asset for more than 36 months, it would be considered a long-term capital gain. This means she would be taxed at a lower rate. For instance, if the long-term capital gains tax is 20%, she would only pay 6,000 rupees in tax on the 30,000 rupees gain, Mr. Sharma explained. That's really helpful. Are there any exemptions available for capital gains? Ravi asked, hoping to learn more. Indeed. One notable exemption is under Section 54, which allows individuals to claim exemption on long-term capital gains if they invest in a residential property. If Mrs. Mehta sells her sewing machine, and uses the proceeds to buy a new house. She may not have to pay tax on the gains, Mr. Sharma elaborated. What if she uses the money for something else? Ravi inquired, eager for clarity. If she does not reinvest the gains in a qualifying asset, the capital gain would be taxable. This underscores the importance of planning when it comes to capital assets and understanding how investments can influence tax liabilities, Mr. Sharma advised. As their discussion progressed, Ravi realized the significance of Section 38 not just for Mrs. Mehta, but for all businesses dealing with capital assets. The nuances of capital gains, their classification, and the implications of selling assets became crystal clear to him. I feel much more confident now in understanding how capital assets are treated under the direct tax code. It's all about being strategic with investments and understanding tax implications, Ravi remarked, feeling empowered by the knowledge he had gained. Absolutely, Ravi. Your understanding of these provisions will enable you to provide valuable advice to clients in the future. Every business owner needs to be aware of the tax implications of their asset management strategies. Mr. Sharma concluded, pleased with Ravi's progress. By the end of the session, 
Robbie felt equipped to navigate the complexities of Section 38 of the Direct Tax Code. The story of Mrs. Meta and her boutique illuminated the practical application of these provisions, reinforcing the importance of informed financial decision-making in business. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a bright Tuesday morning, Robbie entered Mr. Sharma's office, ready for another enriching session on taxation. Today, the focus would be on Section 39 of the Direct Tax Code, which addresses the taxation of income from business and profession. Good morning, Robbie. I hope you're excited to dive into Section 39 today, Mr. Sharma greeted him warmly. Good morning, sir. Yes, I can't wait to learn more about it, Robbie replied enthusiastically. Let's explore this section through a case study involving Mr. Varma, who runs a successful bakery named Sweet Delights. His business journey will help us understand the provisions of Section 39, Mr. Sharma began. Tell me about Mr. Varma's bakery, Ravi prompted, eager to learn. Mr. Varma opened Sweet Delights 10 years ago, and it has become quite popular in his locality for its delicious pastries and cakes. As a businessman, Mr. Varma needs to be aware of how his income from the bakery is taxed under Section 39, Mr. Sharma explained. Is this section only about how income is taxed? Ravi inquired. Not just that, Ravi. Section 39 outlines how various components of income from business and profession are assessed for tax purposes. Let's consider Mr. Varma's income. The first aspect we need to look at is the gross receipts from his bakery. This includes all the sales revenue generated from selling cakes, pastries, and other baked goods, Mr. Sharma clarified. Okay, I understand that. But what about expenses? Are those considered too? Ravi asked. Absolutely. Mr. Varma can deduct his business expenses from his gross receipts to determine his taxable income. These expenses may include rent for his bakery space, salaries of his staff, cost of raw materials, and utility bills. Section 39 allows for the deduction of expenses that are wholly and exclusively incurred for the purpose of his business, Mr. Sharma explained. Can you give me an example of how this works? Ravi asked, can you see a real-life application? Certainly. Let's say Mr. Varma's gross receipts for the financial year amount to 10 lakh rupees. His total expenses, including rent, salaries, and raw materials, amount to 6 lakh rupees. The taxable income will be calculated as follows. Gross receipts minus business expenses. In this case, it would be 10 lakh minus 6 lakh, resulting in a taxable income of 4 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma detailed. Got it. But what if he has some losses? Ravi questioned. Good point. If Mr. Varma incurs losses in his bakery, Section 39 also allows him to carry forward these losses to future assessment years. This means he can offset his future income with past losses, reducing his tax liability. For example, if he incurs a loss of 50,000 rupees in one year, he can deduct this amount from his future profits, Mr. Sharma explained. That's really useful. Are there any specific provisions for different types of businesses under this section? Ravi asked, curious about variations. Section 39 generally applies to all businesses, but it also acknowledges the different forms of business entities, such as sole proprietorships, partnerships, and companies. Each entity may have specific rules regarding the taxation of their income. Mr. Sharma noted. Can you elaborate on the tax treatment for different entities? Ravi requested. Of course. For instance, Mr. Varma operates as a sole proprietor. This means his business income is treated as personal income, and he is taxed according to the applicable income tax slab rates for individuals. On the other hand, if he had registered his bakery as a partnership or a private limited company, different tax rates and compliance requirements would apply, Mr. Sharma explained. Interesting. What about tax deductions? Are there any special provisions for business owners? Ravi probed further. Yes, indeed. Mr. Varma can also claim deductions for certain investments made in the business, like capital expenditures. If he purchases new baking equipment, he can claim depreciation on it over its useful life, reducing his taxable income further, Mr. Sharma added. Depreciation sounds important. How does that work? Ravi asked eager for more details. Depreciation allows Mr. Varma to spread the cost of an asset over its useful life, 
reducing his taxable income in the years the asset is used. For example, if he buys an oven for 2 lakh rupees with a useful life of 10 years, he could claim depreciation of 20,000 rupees each year, Mr. Sharma explained. That makes a lot of sense. Are there any compliance requirements Mr. Varma should be aware of? Ravi asked, wanting to cover all bases. Definitely. Mr. Varma must maintain proper books of accounts as prescribed under the Income Tax Act. Additionally, he is required to file an income tax return each year, reporting his business income and claiming the eligible deductions. Failing to comply with these requirements could lead to penalties, Mr. Sharma cautioned. As their discussion continued, Ravi gained a comprehensive understanding of Section 39 and its provisions. The story of Mr. Varma and his bakery illustrated the real-world implications of business income taxation, helping Ravi appreciate the importance of strategic financial management for business owners. Thank you, sir. I feel much more confident in my understanding of how business income is taxed. This knowledge will be invaluable when I start advising clients, Ravi concluded, his mind buzzing with new insights. Absolutely, Ravi. Understanding these provisions will empower you to guide your clients effectively, ensuring their compliance while maximizing their financial benefits, Mr. Sharma encouraged, pleased with Ravi's progress. By the end of the session, Ravi was well-equipped to navigate the complexities of Section 39 of the Direct Tax Code. The real-life case study of Mr. Varma not only made the provisions clearer, but also reinforced the importance of diligent record-keeping and strategic planning in the realm of taxation. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. One sunny afternoon, Ravi walked into Mr. Sharma's office, eager to explore another essential aspect of the direct tax code. Today's lesson would focus on Section 40, which outlines specific disallowances for certain expenses that businesses often claim as deductions. Good afternoon, Ravi. Are you ready to dive into Section 40? Mr. Sharma greeted him. Good afternoon, sir. Absolutely. I'm excited to learn more, Ravi replied with enthusiasm. Let's illustrate this section through a case study involving Ms. Mehta, who runs a popular catering service called Culinary Delights. She often faces challenges regarding the expenses she can deduct from her taxable income, Mr. Sharma began. Tell me more about Ms. Mehta's catering business, Ravi encouraged. Ms. Mehta started Culinary Delights five years ago. Her business thrives on providing exquisite catering services for weddings, corporate events, and private parties. As her business grows, she often claims various expenses to reduce her taxable income, but she must also be aware of the provisions in Section 40, Mr. Sharma explained. Are there specific types of expenses that are disallowed under this section? Ravi asked. Indeed. Section 40 lists several expenses that are either fully or partially disallowed for tax purposes. For example, any expenditure incurred on the purchase of capital assets, like ovens or catering equipment, cannot be deducted as a business expense in the year of purchase. Instead, Ms. Mehta can claim depreciation on these assets over their useful life, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Okay, I see. What else is covered under Section 40? Ravi inquired. Another crucial point in Section 40 relates to payments made to related parties. If Ms. Meta pays excessive amounts to a relative who helps her with her business, only a reasonable amount may be deducted. Any excess payment could be disallowed, Mr. Sharma clarified. That sounds important. Are there any examples of other disallowed expenses? Robbie asked. Yes. One common example is the disallowance of personal expenses. Let's say Ms. Mehta occasionally uses her catering vehicle for personal trips. In this case, the expenses incurred for personal use would not be deductible from her business income, Mr. Sharma noted. Are there any other specific disallowances that she should be aware of? Ravi continued. Absolutely. Section 40 also highlights the disallowance of interest on loans taken for personal purposes. If Ms. Mehta takes out a loan to fund her personal vacation, the interest on that loan cannot be claimed as a business expense. It is crucial for business owners to differentiate between personal and business expenses, Mr. Sharma emphasized. Got it. What about any expenses related to penalties or fines? How do those fit in? Ravi asked. Good question. Under Section 40, 
Any penalties or fines incurred for violating laws, like traffic violations related to catering vehicles, are also disallowed. Ms. Meta cannot deduct such amounts as business expenses. This provision ensures that businesses cannot claim deductions for unlawful activities, Mr. Sharma explained. Are there limits on certain types of expenses? Ravi asked, wanting to delve deeper into the specifics. Indeed. For instance, entertainment expenses can be tricky. Ms. Meta can only deduct 50% of the expenses incurred on entertaining clients. This provision ensures that businesses do not inflate their entertainment costs to reduce their taxable income, Mr. Sharma clarified. That makes sense. So, she has to keep track of what expenses are legitimate and which ones are not. Ravi asked. Exactly. Proper record keeping is essential for Ms. Meta to substantiate her claims and avoid disputes with tax authorities. If her records are accurate and well-maintained, it will make it easier for her to defend her claims if questioned, Mr. Sharma advised. Are there any additional provisions under Section 40 that Ms. Meta should be mindful of? Ravi queried. Another important aspect is regarding gifts. If Ms. Meta gives gifts to her clients, only gifts that are lower than 5,000 rupees in value are deductible. Anything above that amount would be disallowed, Mr. Sharma explained. As they continued their discussion, Ravi began to grasp the nuances of Section 40 and its provisions. The case study of Ms. Meta and her catering business provided a relatable context for understanding the various disallowances associated with business expenses. Thank you, sir. This has been incredibly insightful. I now have a clearer understanding of how certain expenses can impact taxable income, Ravi concluded, feeling more equipped to advise potential clients. Absolutely, Ravi. Knowing these disallowances will help you guide your clients more effectively, ensuring they understand the importance of compliant expense reporting, Mr. Sharma encouraged. By the end of the session, Ravi had gained valuable insights into Section 40 of the Direct Tax Code. The story of Ms. Meta and her catering business illustrated the critical need for business owners to be aware of expense disallowances, ensuring their financial practices remain in compliance with tax regulations. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a crisp autumn afternoon, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, his mind buzzing with curiosity about the next section of the direct tax code. Today, they would explore Section 41, which primarily addresses the provisions related to the taxation of income under specific circumstances. Good afternoon, Ravi. Are you ready to unravel the complexities of Section 41? Mr. Sharma greeted him with a warm smile. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, I am eager to learn, Ravi replied, settling into a chair. Let's use a case study to illustrate the key aspects of this section. Meet Mr. Raghav, a small business owner who operates a manufacturing unit for eco-friendly packaging materials. Recently, he faced a situation that brought Section 41 into play, Mr. Sharma began. What kind of situation did Mr. Raghav encounter? Ravi asked, intrigued. Last year, Mr. Raghav had claimed certain expenses related to the purchase of machinery. However, due to a sudden downturn in business, he decided to sell some of his machinery at a loss, Mr. Sharma explained. Interesting. How does this connect to Section 41? Ravi queried. Under Section 41, if a taxpayer has claimed a deduction for an expense in a previous year and later recovers any part of that expense in a subsequent year, that recovery must be included as income in the year it is recovered. This means that Mr. Raghav must consider the recovery of his machinery's cost when calculating his income, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Ravi nodded, trying to absorb the information. So, if he sold the machinery at a loss but had previously claimed a deduction, he might still face tax implications? Exactly. In this case, Mr. Raghav needs to account for the difference between the original deduction he claimed and the sale price he received. Let's say he originally deducted 100,000 rupees for the machinery, but sold it for 60,000 rupees. The 40,000 rupee difference would be considered income under Section 41, Mr. Sharma clarified. That makes sense. Are there other scenarios where this section applies? Ravi asked. Yes, indeed. Section 41 also covers cases of business asset transfers. For instance, if Mr. Raghav decided to transfer some of his assets to a partnership or another business entity, 
The provisions would apply to any depreciation claimed on those assets in previous years, Mr. Sharma explained further. Could you give me an example? Ravi requested. Certainly. Suppose Mr. Raghav had claimed depreciation on a piece of machinery over five years. When he transferred this asset to a partnership, the accumulated depreciation claimed would need to be considered for tax purposes. If the partnership later sells the machinery, the gain from the sale would be subject to tax based on the original depreciation claimed, Mr. Sharma noted. I see. It's crucial for business owners to keep track of their deductions, Ravi said thoughtfully. Absolutely. Proper documentation and record keeping are essential. If Mr. Raghav does not maintain accurate records of the deductions he claimed and the circumstances surrounding them, he could face complications during tax assessments, Mr. Sharma warned. Are there any limitations or specific conditions Mr. Raghav should be aware of under Section 41? Ravi asked. Yes, there are. For instance, if Mr. Raghav claims any deductions for a bad debt that was previously included as income, he needs to report that income when he recovers that bad debt. The intention here is to ensure that taxpayers do not benefit from deductions and recoveries simultaneously, Mr. Sharma explained. That's an important aspect to remember. So, it prevents double benefits? Ravi clarified. Exactly. The goal is to ensure fairness and accuracy in tax reporting. By preventing taxpayers from reaping benefits from both deductions and recoveries, the tax system aims to maintain equity, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Thanks for breaking that down for me, sir. It's becoming clearer now, Ravi said, feeling more confident in his understanding. Let's recap. Section 41 deals primarily with situations where previously claimed deductions need to be accounted for when recovering those expenses. This includes cases involving asset sales, transfers, and recoveries of bad debts, Mr. Sharma summarized. Understood. I feel much better equipped to handle such scenarios, Ravi replied satisfied with the discussion. As the session came to a close, Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office feeling enlightened. The case study of Mr. Raghav and his eco-friendly packaging business helped illuminate the intricate provisions of Section 41. Ravi now understood the importance of maintaining accurate records and being aware of the tax implications related to deductions and recoveries, knowledge that would serve him well in his future career as a chartered accountant. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a sunny morning, Robbie walked into Mr. Sharma's office, eager to delve into another section of the direct tax code. Today, they would explore Section 42, which primarily concerns the provisions relating to the taxation of income arising from the transfer of capital assets. Good morning, Robbie. Ready for another enlightening session? Mr. Sharma greeted him. Good morning, sir. Absolutely. I am keen to learn about Section 42 today, Ravi replied, his enthusiasm palpable. Let's frame our discussion around a real-life case to make the concepts clearer. Meet Ms. Anjali, a successful entrepreneur who owns a chain of organic farms. Recently, she decided to sell a piece of land that had significantly appreciated in value, Mr. Sharma began. Selling land sounds intriguing. How does this relate to Section 42? Ravi asked, intrigued. Great question. Section 42 deals with the taxation of income arising from the transfer of capital assets. In Ms. Anjali's case, the land she sold qualifies as a capital asset. When she sells the land, the profit she makes will be classified as capital gains, Mr. Sharma explained. Capital gains? What does that entail? Ravi inquired. There are two main types of capital gains, long-term and short-term. If Ms. Anjali held the land for more than 24 months, any profit from the sale would be considered a long-term capital gain, which is subject to different tax rates compared to short-term capital gains. If she held it for less than 24 months, it would be classified as a short-term capital gain, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Robbie's eyes widened with understanding. So, the duration of holding the asset plays a crucial role in determining the tax implications? Exactly. Let's say Ms. Anjali purchased the land for 2 million rupees. After 5 years, she sells it for 5 million rupees. The profit of 3 million rupees is her long-term capital gain, Mr. Sharma noted. Are there any exemptions or deductions available for her? Ravi asked, leaning in. Yes, there are. Under Section 42, 
If Ms. Anjali reinvests the capital gains in specified assets, such as residential property or other agricultural land, she may be eligible for certain exemptions from capital gains tax. This is aimed at promoting investment and growth, Mr. Sharma explained. Can you provide a specific example of such a reinvestment? Ravi requested. Certainly. Suppose Ms. Anjali decides to invest the 3 million rupees she gained from selling her land into a new organic farm. Under the relevant provisions, she could potentially claim an exemption from the capital gains tax on that amount, provided she meets the stipulated conditions, Mr. Sharma clarified. That's beneficial. But what if she doesn't reinvest the gains? Ravi pondered. If Ms. Anjali chooses not to reinvest the gains, she will be liable to pay tax on the entire capital gain amount. The rate of tax would depend on whether it is classified as short-term or long-term capital gain, Mr. Sharma stated. Ravi absorbed this information, then asked, What about other aspects of Section 42? Are there any significant provisions we should be aware of? Definitely. Section 42 also includes provisions for the treatment of capital gains arising from the transfer of shares or securities. For example, if Ms. Anjali had shares in a company that she held for more than a year and decided to sell them, the profit would again be subject to the same capital gains tax rules, Mr. Sharma explained. So, it applies not just to land, but also to financial assets? Ravi queried. Precisely. The aim is to ensure that all capital assets are treated consistently under the tax framework. Moreover, the section addresses how to compute the capital gains by deducting the index cost of acquisition, which accounts for inflation over the holding period, Mr. Sharma added. Index cost of acquisition? Can you elaborate on that? Ravi asked. Of course. The index cost of acquisition adjusts the original purchase price of the asset to account for inflation, thereby reducing the taxable capital gains. For instance, if Ms. Anjali purchased the land for 2 million rupees five years ago, the index cost might be higher due to inflation, thus lowering her taxable gains when she sells the land, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Ravi nodded in comprehension. This is quite insightful, sir. So, managing capital gains effectively can lead to significant tax savings. Indeed, it's all about strategic planning. By understanding these provisions, Individuals like Ms. Anjali can make informed decisions that optimize their tax liabilities, Mr. Sharma affirmed. As their discussion came to a close, Ravi left the office feeling enriched with knowledge about Section 42 of the Direct Tax Code. The case study of Ms. Anjali and her land sale illuminated the importance of understanding capital gains, the implications of holding periods, and the opportunities for tax exemptions through reinvestment. Ravi felt more confident in his ability to navigate these complex tax scenarios, preparing him for a successful career as a chartered accountant. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a warm afternoon, Ravi eagerly arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, ready for another engaging session about the direct tax code. Today's focus was Section 43, which deals with the definitions and provisions concerning the taxation of income from business and profession. Good to see you, Ravi. Are you prepared to tackle Section 43 today? Mr. Sharma greeted him with a smile. Absolutely, sir. I'm looking forward to understanding how this section applies in real-life scenarios, Ravi replied, his enthusiasm evident. Let's illustrate the provisions of Section 43 through the case of Mr. Raghav, a small business owner who runs a thriving bakery. Recently, he encountered some complexities regarding his accounting and taxation which prompted him to seek advice, Mr. Sharma began. Interesting. What challenges did Mr. Raghav face? Ravi inquired. Mr. Raghav was unsure about how to calculate his income from his bakery business, especially regarding the various types of expenses he could deduct. Section 43 provides specific guidelines on what constitutes income from a business or profession, including definitions of capital assets, stock and trade, and allowable expenses, Mr. Sharma explained. Could you give me a practical example of how Mr. Raghav would apply these definitions? Ravi asked. Certainly. Let's say Mr. Raghav purchased a commercial oven for 500,000 rupees. According to Section 43, this oven is considered a capital asset. However, the expenses he incurs on raw materials such as flour, sugar, and eggs for making his products are categorized as stock and trade. 
Mr. Sharma clarified. Got it. So, the capital assets and stock and trade are treated differently for taxation purposes? Ravi noted. Exactly. When calculating his taxable income, Mr. Raghav can deduct the cost of goods sold from his total sales revenue. This means he can subtract the expenses related to the ingredients used in baking from the revenue generated through sales, Mr. Sharma explained further. Ravi pondered for a moment. What about other expenses, such as electricity and rent for the bakery premises? Can those be deducted as well? Great question. Yes, Section 43 allows Mr. Raghav to deduct necessary business expenses, including rent, electricity, and even salaries paid to his staff from his gross income. This helps in accurately determining the net profit from his bakery business, Mr. Sharma responded. Ravi's curiosity grew. Are there specific records he needs to maintain to support these deductions? Indeed, Mr. Raghav must keep detailed records of all his transactions, including receipts for purchases and invoices for sales. This documentation is essential in the event of an audit by tax authorities, Mr. Sharma emphasized. Let's say Mr. Raghav decides to take a loan to expand his bakery. How would this affect his taxation? Ravi asked. Good point. If he takes a loan, the interest paid on that loan is also deductible under Section 43, provided it is used for business purposes. However, if he uses part of the loan for personal expenses, only the proportion related to business can be claimed as a deduction, Mr. Sharma clarified. Okay, that makes sense. But what if he decides to sell some of his old baking equipment? Ravi inquired. When he sells capital assets like his old baking equipment, he may incur capital gains or losses, depending on the sale price compared to the asset's original cost. The income from this sale must also be reported under the provisions of Section 43, Mr. Sharma explained. So, there's a clear process for reporting and calculating all these elements, Ravi concluded. Exactly. Section 43 lays down the framework for recognizing income and expenses, ensuring that business owners like Mr. Raghav can effectively manage their finances and comply with tax regulations, Mr. Sharma affirmed. As their discussion wrapped up, Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office feeling enlightened about Section 43 of the Direct Tax Code. Through the real-life case of Mr. Raghav and his bakery, Ravi gained valuable insights into the nuances of calculating business income, understanding allowable deductions, and maintaining proper records. He felt equipped with the knowledge necessary to guide his future clients in navigating the complexities of taxation in their businesses. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a bright Saturday morning, Ravi made his way to Mr. Sharma's office, eager to dive deeper into the direct tax code. Today's session promised to be particularly insightful, as they would explore Section 44, which pertains to the computation of income for certain professions and businesses. As he settled into the familiar chair, Ravi asked, Good morning, sir. What specific provisions does Section 44 cover? Mr. Sharma smiled. Good morning, Ravi. Section 44 primarily deals with the presumptive taxation scheme for small taxpayers, particularly those engaged in professions like accountancy, law, or businesses like retail and manufacturing. Let me illustrate this with a real-life example. Please do. Ravi responded enthusiastically. Let's consider the case of Ms. Aditi, a freelance graphic designer who has recently set up her own design studio. She earns her income from providing graphic design services to various clients, Mr. Sharma began. How does Section 44 apply to her? Ravi asked, intrigued. Great question. Under Section 44, if Ms. Aditi's gross receipts do not exceed a specified threshold, currently set at 25 lakh rupees, she can opt for the presumptive taxation scheme. This means she can declare a fixed percentage of her gross receipts as her taxable income without needing to maintain detailed accounts of her expenses, Mr. Sharma explained. Wow, so she doesn't need to keep track of every single expense? Ravi asked wide-eyed. Exactly. For professions like graphic design, the prescribed percentage is 50%. If Ms. Aditi's gross receipts for the year are 15 lakh rupees, she can simply declare 7.5 lakh rupees as her income, Mr. Sharma elaborated. That sounds convenient, but what if her expenses are actually higher than that? Ravi wondered. An interesting point. 
While this presumptive scheme simplifies accounting, it may not always reflect the actual profit. If Ms. Aditi believes her actual income is lower than the presumptive amount, she has the option to maintain regular books of accounts and get them audited, Mr. Sharma clarified. Ravi pondered this for a moment. What if Ms. Aditi has expenses related to her studio, like software subscriptions and utility bills? Those expenses can be substantial. If she maintains proper books, she can claim these deductions against her income. However, under the presumptive scheme, she does not need to track these expenses, Mr. Sharma reiterated. Is the presumptive scheme available for all professions? Ravi asked, can you know more? Not quite. While Section 44 is beneficial for many professions, it specifically applies to certain specified professions listed under the Income Tax Act. If Ms. Aditi were to exceed the gross receipt limit or be involved in a profession not covered, she would need to follow the regular accounting and taxation rules, Mr. Sharma explained. Understood. What about businesses, sir? Can they also benefit from this scheme? Ravi queried. Absolutely. Businesses can also opt for the presumptive taxation scheme under Section 44. For instance, consider a small retail shop owned by Mr. Kumar. If his gross receipts are less than 2 crore rupees, he can declare 8% of his gross receipts as income without maintaining detailed records, Mr. Sharma explained. That's really helpful for small business owners, Ravi remarked. Are there any compliance requirements for Ms. Aditi or Mr. Kumar under this scheme? Yes, indeed. Both Ms. Aditi and Mr. Kumar would need to file their income tax returns within the due date, ensuring they adhere to the guidelines stipulated under the presumptive taxation scheme. Additionally, if their gross receipts exceed the threshold, they would be required to switch to the regular taxation scheme, Mr. Sharma stated. What if Mr. Kumar's receipts were fluctuating year to year? Would he have to switch back and forth between schemes? Ravi asked. Good observation. The Income Tax Department allows a certain level of flexibility. If Mr. Kumar's gross receipts exceed the limit in one year, he can opt for the regular scheme the next year if his receipts drop back below the threshold. However, it is advisable to have consistency for better tax planning, Mr. Sharma clarified. As the discussion wrapped up, Ravi felt enlightened by the practical implications of Section 44. Through the case studies of Ms. Aditi and Mr. Kumar, he gained a deeper understanding of how the presumptive taxation scheme could significantly ease the tax compliance burden for small professionals and businesses alike. With a sense of accomplishment, Ravi thanked Mr. Sharma, ready to apply these insights in his future career as a chartered accountant, armed with the knowledge to help his clients navigate the complexities of the direct tax code effectively. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a sunny afternoon, Ravi was excited to meet Mr. Sharma for another session on the direct tax code. Today, he would delve into Section 45, which deals with the taxation of capital gains arising from the transfer of capital assets. As he entered the office, Ravi greeted Mr. Sharma enthusiastically. Good afternoon, sir. I am eager to learn about Section 45. What are its key provisions? Good afternoon, Ravi. You're in for an insightful session today. Mr. Sharma replied, motioning for Ravi to take a seat. Section 45 focuses primarily on the taxation of capital gains and the circumstances under which they arise. Ravi nodded, ready to absorb the information. Can you illustrate this with a real-life example, sir? Of course. Let's consider the case of Mr. Mehta, who owns a plot of land in the outskirts of Mumbai. In 2020, he purchased this plot for 50 lakh rupees. A few years later, he decided to sell the land for 70 lakh rupees. Here, Mr. Mehta would have made a capital gain on the sale, Mr. Sharma explained. How is this capital gain taxed under Section 45? Ravi asked. Great question. The capital gain is calculated as the difference between the selling price and the purchase price. In Mr. Mehta's case, the capital gain would be 20 lakh rupees, calculated as 70 lakh minus 50 lakh. This gain would then be subject to taxation. Mr. Sharma elaborated. Ravi pondered this for a moment. So, is this gain considered short-term or long-term capital gain? Excellent point. The classification of the capital gain depends on the holding period of the asset. If Mr. Mehta held the land for more than 24 months, it would qualify as a long-term capital gain, 
which is subject to different tax rates compared to short-term capital gains, Mr. Sharma clarified. What are the tax rates for long-term and short-term capital gains? Ravi asked. Long-term capital gains are currently taxed at a rate of 20%, while short-term gains are taxed as per the individual's income tax slab. This can significantly impact the amount of tax Mr. Mehta would owe, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi's curiosity grew. What if Mr. Mehta had used the proceeds from the sale to buy another property? Is there any benefit in that case? Absolutely. Under Section 45, if Mr. Mehta reinvests the capital gains in purchasing another residential property, he could be eligible for an exemption under Section 53. This means he would not have to pay tax on the gains, provided he follows certain conditions, Mr. Sharma explained. That's quite beneficial. Are there any conditions he needs to be aware of? Ravi asked, eager for more details. Yes, there are conditions. Mr. Mehta must invest the amount of capital gains in a new residential property within a specified time frame, usually one year before or two years after the sale. He must also ensure that the new property is not sold within three years of its acquisition, Mr. Sharma detailed. Ravi took a moment to digest this information. What if Mr. Mehta sold multiple properties? Would he still be able to claim exemptions? That's a good question. Mr. Mehta can claim exemptions on each sale provided he reinvests the capital gains from each property sold into new properties, adhering to the stipulated conditions. However, the overall exemption amount is capped at a specific limit, Mr. Sharma clarified. Interesting. What about the situation if Mr. Mehta had received shares of a company instead of cash for the land? How does that affect the capital gains? Ravi inquired. Another insightful question. In such cases, the transfer of the land for shares would still result in capital gains being calculated, with the fair market value of the shares at the time of transfer being considered as the sale price. The provisions of Section 45 would still apply, ensuring that Mr. Mehta is liable for capital gains tax. Mr. Sharma explained. As the discussion progressed, Ravi felt increasingly engaged. Can you tell me about any exemptions for the transfer of agricultural land? I have heard it can be treated differently. Indeed. Under Section 45, agricultural land is treated differently in terms of capital gains tax. If Mr. Mehta's land is classified as agricultural and falls under the definition of rural agricultural land, he may not be liable for capital gains tax upon its transfer, Mr. Sharma elucidated. That's great to know. It seems that capital gains taxation is quite nuanced, Ravi observed, feeling more informed. Exactly. Understanding these nuances is crucial for any chartered accountant, as it allows you to guide clients effectively in their financial decisions, Mr. Sharma said, concluding the session. As Ravi left the office, he reflected on the valuable lessons he had learned from Mr. Sharma about Section 45 of the Direct Tax Code. Armed with real-life examples and insights, he felt better prepared to assist his future clients in navigating the complexities of capital gains taxation. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a bright Saturday morning, Ravi was looking forward to another enlightening session with Mr. Sharma, his mentor, and an esteemed chartered accountant. Today's focus was on Section 46 of the Direct Tax Code, which revolves around the taxation of certain types of transfers of capital assets. As Ravi entered Mr. Sharma's office, he was greeted with a warm smile. Good morning, Ravi. I'm glad to see your enthusiasm for learning. Today, we'll dive into the interesting aspects of Section 46. Good morning, sir. I'm eager to learn about it. What can you tell me about this section? Ravi replied, settling into his chair. Section 46 primarily deals with the taxation implications of certain types of transfers, particularly those involving the transfer of shares, debentures, or securities through a stock exchange, Mr. Sharma explained. Let's explore this with a real-life example. Ravi's interest peaked. Please go ahead, sir. Consider the case of Ms. Kapoor, who is an avid investor in the stock market. In the year 2023, she purchased shares of a prominent technology company for 10 lakh rupees. Over the next two years, the value of those shares appreciated significantly, and she decided to sell them for 15 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma began. Now, what happens under Section 46 in terms of taxation? Ravi asked, intrigued. Great question. When Ms. Kapoor sells her shares, the gains she makes, 
5 lakh rupees, will be classified as a capital gain. According to Section 46, since the shares were listed on a recognized stock exchange, the capital gains from the sale are treated as short-term if held for less than 12 months or long-term if held for more than 12 months, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Robbie nodded. So, in Ms. Kapoor's case, how would her tax liability be calculated? Since Ms. Kapoor held the shares for two years, her gain is considered a long-term capital gain. This would be taxed at a flat rate of 20%, provided she does not avail of any exemptions, Mr. Sharma explained. What if she had sold the shares after only six months? Would her gain be taxed differently? Ravi asked. Yes. If Ms. Kapoor sold the shares after six months, the 5 lakh rupee gain would be classified as a short-term capital gain, which is taxed according to her income tax slab rate. This could result in a higher tax liability compared to the long-term rate, Mr. Sharma clarified. Ravi leaned back in his chair, absorbing the information. What if Ms. Kapoor had reinvested her gains in other securities? Would she receive any tax benefits? Excellent point. This allows her to defer or reduce her tax liability, Mr. Sharma noted. Are there any specific conditions she must meet to qualify for these exemptions? Ravi inquired. Absolutely. To avail of the exemptions, she must invest in eligible securities or residential properties within a specified time frame typically one year before or two years after the sale. Additionally, she must retain the new asset for at least three years, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi's curiosity deepened. What about the scenario where Ms. Kapoor receives shares of another company instead of cash? How would Section 46 apply in that case? Interesting scenario. If Ms. Kapoor receives shares as consideration for the transfer of her original shares, the fair market value of those new shares would be treated as the sale price. This means she would still be liable for capital gains tax based on the valuation at the time of the transfer, Mr. Sharma clarified. I see. This section seems quite comprehensive. Are there any other important provisions we should be aware of? Robbie asked. Yes, under Section 46, there are provisions regarding the treatment of bonuses, right shares, and stock splits. For instance, if Ms. Kapoor receives bonus shares, these would not be taxed at the time of acquisition. However, they would be considered while calculating capital gains when she decides to sell them, Mr. Sharma noted. That's fascinating. What about the case of a partnership firm? How does this section apply if a partner transfers their share in the firm? Ravi probed further. Great question. In the case of a partnership firm, the transfer of a partner's share is treated as a capital asset. The capital gains would be calculated based on the fair market value of the partner's share at the time of transfer. The provisions of Section 46 would apply here as well, Mr. Sharma responded. As the session drew to a close, Robbie felt invigorated by the discussion. Thank you, sir. Today's lesson on Section 46 has been enlightening. I appreciate the real-life examples that make these concepts clearer. Mr. Sharma smiled. I'm glad you found it helpful, Robbie. Remember, Understanding these provisions will not only enhance your knowledge, but also empower you to advise your future clients effectively. As Ravi left the office, he reflected on the valuable insights he had gained about Section 46 of the Direct Tax Code. Armed with practical examples and newfound understanding, he felt more prepared to navigate the complexities of capital gains taxation in his future career as a chartered accountant. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a warm afternoon, Ravi was excited to continue his learning journey with Mr. Sharma, his insightful mentor, and a distinguished chartered accountant. Today, they would explore Section 47 of the Direct Tax Code, which details the exemptions related to the transfer of capital assets. As Ravi entered Mr. Sharma's office, he noticed a whiteboard filled with charts and figures. Good afternoon, sir. I see you're ready for another engaging session. Good afternoon, Ravi. I'm thrilled you're eager to dive into today's topic. Section 47 covers important exemptions related to capital gains, Mr. Sharma replied, gesturing for Ravi to sit down. Great. I'm curious about how these exemptions work in practice, Ravi said, settling in with his notebook. Let's illustrate this with a case study. Consider Mr. Rao, who has been running a successful manufacturing business for over 20 years. In the year 2023, 
he decides to transfer a piece of land he owned for 15 lakh rupees. This land has been held for over five years, and he originally bought it for 5 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Okay, so if Mr. Rao sells the land, he'll have a capital gain of 10 lakh rupees. What does Section 47 say about that? Ravi asked, eager to learn. Exactly. However, Mr. Rao is aware of the provisions under Section 47, which provides certain exemptions for capital gains. Since he plans to reinvest the proceeds from the sale into another capital asset, he may be eligible for exemptions, Mr. Sharma continued. Robbie's eyes widened. How does that work? What kind of reinvestment qualifies for exemptions? Good question. Under Section 47, if Mr. Rao invests in residential property, he may be eligible for exemptions on long-term capital gains. For instance, if he uses the entire 10 lakh rupees to purchase a new residential property within a specified period, he can claim exemption from capital gains tax, Mr. Sharma elaborated. That sounds beneficial. Is there a specific time frame he must follow for this reinvestment? Robbie inquired. Yes, he must invest the proceeds within one year before or two years after the sale of the original asset. Moreover, he must hold the new property for at least three years to retain the exemption, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi thought for a moment. What if Mr. Rao doesn't want to invest in residential property? Are there other options for him? Absolutely. Section 47 also covers various other scenarios. For instance, if Mr. Rao were to transfer the land to his son, it wouldn't attract capital gains tax as it falls under the category of transfers made to family members. Mr. Sharma stated. Interesting. So, transfers among family members are exempt. What about gifts? Ravi asked. Great observation. Gifts are also included. If Mr. Rao decided to gift the land to a charitable organization, it would qualify for exemptions under Section 47, provided the organization is registered and meets the eligibility criteria, Mr. Sharma noted. Ravi was keen to understand the implications of this section further. What if Mr. Rao had sold the land to a company? Would the capital gains be treated differently? Yes, in that case, the capital gains tax would apply. However, if the company then uses that land to construct a factory, it can claim depreciation, effectively reducing its tax liability, Mr. Sharma explained. That makes sense. What about the treatment of capital gains in the case of mergers or demergers? Ravi asked, diving deeper into the topic. Good question. Under Section 47, if Mr. Rao's business merges with another company, the capital gains arising from the transfer of assets may be exempted under specific conditions. For example, if the assets are transferred as part of a scheme of amalgamation and the shareholders receive shares in the new entity, it might not attract capital gains tax, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Ravi smiled, appreciating the clarity. It's fascinating how Section 47 covers so many scenarios. Are there any other important exemptions we should be aware of? Yes, indeed. For instance, if Mr. Rao had received shares in exchange for the land, the capital gains would be calculated based on the fair market value of those shares. If he holds them for a longer period, he might qualify for long-term capital gain benefits upon selling them later, Mr. Sharma clarified. Thank you for breaking this down, sir. It's incredible how Section 47 can provide significant tax relief through exemptions, Ravi said, feeling enlightened. Mr. Sharma smiled warmly. Remember, understanding these nuances can greatly benefit your future clients. Knowledge of exemptions allows them to make informed decisions, ultimately leading to financial growth. As Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, he felt a sense of accomplishment. He had gained valuable insights into Section 47 of the Direct Tax Code, armed with practical examples that made the complex provisions much clearer. With each session, he was growing more prepared to navigate the world of taxation as a future chartered accountant. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. One sunny afternoon, Ravi arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, excited for yet another engaging session on the Direct Tax Code. Today, they would delve into Section 48, which deals with the computation of capital gains. Good afternoon, Ravi. I see you're ready to learn, Mr. Sharma greeted, his enthusiasm palpable. Good afternoon, sir. I'm looking forward to it. 
I heard Section 48 is crucial for understanding capital gains, Robbie replied, settling into his chair. Absolutely. Let's break it down with a practical case study. Meet Mr. Meta, a longtime investor in real estate. He purchased a commercial property in 2012 for 20 lakh rupees. In 2023, he decided to sell it for 70 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained, drawing a timeline on the whiteboard. Okay, so if Mr. Meta sells the property for 70 lakh rupees, what happens next? Ravi asked, eager to understand the calculations involved. Great question. According to Section 48, the first step is to determine the capital gains, which is the difference between the selling price and the cost of acquisition. In Mr. Meta's case, he would calculate it like this. Selling price minus cost of acquisition, Mr. Sharma said, writing it down. So, 70 lakh minus 20 lakh equals 50 lakh rupees. Ravi nodded, trying to digest the numbers. That sounds straightforward, but are there any other deductions he can consider? Yes, indeed. Mr. Meta can also consider the cost of improvements made to the property. For instance, if he spent 10 lakh rupees on renovations in 2020, he can deduct this amount from the capital gains, Mr. Sharma replied, enhancing the calculation. Got it. So, the revised calculation would be selling price minus cost of acquisition minus cost of improvements. That means 50 lakh minus 10 lakh equals 40 lakh rupees, Ravi summarized. Exactly. This is what we call the net capital gain. But wait, there's more to section 48. We also have to account for inflation, Mr. Sharma said with a grin. Inflation? How does that factor in? Ravi inquired, intrigued. Good question. The direct tax code allows for the indexation of the cost of acquisition and improvements. This means that Mr. Meta can adjust his original purchase price for inflation using the cost inflation index, which is notified by the government every financial year, Mr. Sharma explained. Interesting. So, how does Mr. Meta apply this? Ravi asked, noting Mr. Sharma's detailed explanation. Let's say the cost inflation index in 2012 was 100, and in 2023, it is 180. Mr. Meta can calculate the index cost of acquisition as follows. Original cost multiplied by the cost inflation index of the year of sale, divided by the cost inflation index of the year of acquisition. So, it would be 20 lakh multiplied by 180 divided by 100, resulting in 36 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma articulated, working the figures on the board. Wow, that really helps reduce the taxable amount. So what's next? Ravi asked, feeling enlightened. Now, we take the index cost of acquisition and the cost of improvements into account. If Mr. Meta spent 10 lakh on renovations, we would calculate selling price minus index cost of acquisition minus cost of improvements. So, 70 lakh minus 36 lakh minus 10 lakh equals 24 lakh rupees in capital gains, Mr. Sharma concluded. That's clear. But what if Mr. Meta had sold the property within three years? Would that affect the tax calculation? Ravi questioned. Yes, it would. If Mr. Meta had held the property for less than three years, it would be classified as a short-term capital gain, and the calculations would differ. In such cases, the entire gain would be taxable as per the applicable income tax slab rates, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi pondered this for a moment. So, it's crucial for investors to understand the duration for which they hold an asset. Are there any special provisions for calculating capital gains in certain situations? Indeed. For example, if Mr. Meta had inherited the property instead of purchasing it, the capital gains would be calculated based on the original cost incurred by the previous owner. This helps prevent the taxation of gains that may have been unrealized during the inheritance, Mr. Sharma highlighted. That's fascinating. It makes me realize how vital it is to keep track of these calculations, Robbie acknowledged. Absolutely. A thorough understanding of Section 48 and its provisions can help investors minimize their tax liabilities effectively, Mr. Sharma concluded. As the session came to an end, Robbie felt empowered by the knowledge he had gained about Section 48 of the Direct Tax Code. With real-life examples and detailed calculations, he was now better equipped to guide future clients in navigating the complexities of capital gains taxation. With every lesson, he grew more confident in his future as a chartered accountant. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, 
and press the bell icon. One sunny afternoon, Robbie found himself in Mr. Sharma's office, eager to dive into another session on the direct tax code. Today, they would explore Section 49, which concerns the provisions for the taxation of capital gains in the context of inherited and gifted assets. Good afternoon, Robbie. Are you ready to explore some fascinating concepts today? Mr. Sharma greeted with a smile. Good afternoon, sir. Absolutely. I've heard that Section 49 deals with the taxation of inherited and gifted assets. I can't wait to learn how it works, Ravi replied, taking a seat. Fantastic. Let's illustrate this with a real-life case study. Meet Mrs. Gupta, a retired teacher who inherited a beautiful bungalow from her late husband. He had purchased this property for 20 lakh rupees in 1985, but Mrs. Gupta decided to sell it in 2020 for 70 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained, writing the details on a whiteboard. Okay, so if she sells it for 70 lakh, what do we need to consider next? Ravi asked, already processing the information. According to Section 49, when calculating capital gains from the sale of an inherited asset, we look at the cost of acquisition as if it were acquired on the original purchase date of the previous owner, Mr. Sharma clarified. So, Mrs. Gupta would use her husband's purchase price of 20 lakh? Ravi asked. Exactly. In this case, the capital gains would be calculated as follows. Selling price minus cost of acquisition. So, 70 lakh minus 20 lakh equals 50 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi raised his eyebrows. That seems straightforward. But what if Mrs. Gupta had made any improvements to the property before selling it? Great point. Any costs incurred for improvements can also be added to the original cost of acquisition. For instance, if Mrs. Gupta spent 5 lakh rupees on renovating the bungalow, we would add that to the cost of acquisition, Mr. Sharma replied. So, that would be 20 lakh plus 5 lakh, making it 25 lakh. Therefore, the capital gains would be 70 lakh minus 25 lakh, resulting in 45 lakh rupees, Ravi summarized, feeling pleased with his calculations. Correct. But there's more to Section 49, Mr. Sharma said, leaning forward. It also deals with the concept of indexation. The direct tax code allows taxpayers to adjust the cost of acquisition for inflation using the cost inflation index. Ravi's interest peaked. How does that work? Let's say the cost inflation index in 1985 was 100 and in 2020, it is 200. Mrs. Gupta can calculate the index cost of acquisition like this. Original cost multiplied by the cost inflation index of the year of sale divided by the cost inflation index of the year of acquisition. So, 20 lakh multiplied by 200 divided by 100 gives us 40 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained, writing the calculation on the board. Wow! That significantly reduces the taxable amount. So now, if we calculate the capital gains using the index cost of acquisition, it would be 70 lakh minus 40 lakh, resulting in 30 lakh rupees in capital gains, Ravi observed, clearly impressed by the power of indexation. Exactly. It's a valuable provision that helps taxpayers save on their taxes, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Now let's consider a different scenario. What if Mrs. Gupta received the bungalow as a gift instead of an inheritance? That's an interesting twist. Would the calculation change? Ravi inquired. Yes, it would. If Mrs. Gupta received the property as a gift, the tax provisions still apply. However, in such cases, the capital gains would be calculated based on the fair market value of the property at the time of the gift if the donor paid any gift tax, Mr. Sharma clarified. So, if the fair market value at the time of the gift was 60 lakh rupees and the original purchase price was 20 lakh, how would that work? Ravi asked. In that case, the calculation would involve the fair market value of 60 lakh as the selling price, minus the original cost of 20 lakh, leading to capital gains of 40 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi nodded. That makes sense. So, whether it's an inheritance or a gift, the principles of taxation can vary, but the underlying concept of calculating capital gains remains similar. Precisely. It's essential to understand these provisions to guide clients effectively, Mr. Sharma added, his enthusiasm evident. As the session concluded, Robbie felt empowered by the intricate details he had learned about Section 49 of the Direct Tax Code. Through real-life examples and relatable scenarios, 
he now grasped how inherited and gifted assets were treated for tax purposes. With each lesson, he became more confident in his future as a chartered accountant, ready to assist clients in navigating the complexities of taxation. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a crisp afternoon, Ravi sat in Mr. Sharma's office, eager to dive into another enlightening discussion about the direct tax code. Today's focus was on Section 50, which deals with the taxation of capital gains on the transfer of certain capital assets. Good afternoon, Ravi. Ready to explore some fascinating tax concepts today. Mr. Sharma greeted him with a warm smile. Good afternoon, sir. Absolutely. I've heard Section 50 has interesting provisions regarding capital gains, Ravi replied, flipping open his notebook. Indeed. Let's illustrate this with a real-life case study. Meet Mr. Desai, an avid collector of vintage cars. He bought a rare classic car for 15 lakh rupees in 2010. Fast forward to 2023, he decided to sell it for 50 lakh rupees. Mr. Sharma began, jotting down the details on a whiteboard. That's quite a profit. How does Section 50 apply to Mr. Desai's situation? Ravi inquired as interest peaked. Great question. Section 50 specifically pertains to the taxation of capital gains arising from the transfer of certain capital assets like property and vehicles. It states that any gain from the transfer of a capital asset will be treated as capital gains, Mr. Sharma explained. Got it. So, if Mr. Desai sold the car for 50 lakh and originally bought it for 15 lakh, he would need to calculate the capital gains, right? Ravi clarified. Exactly. The capital gains are calculated as follows. Selling price minus cost of acquisition. So, in Mr. Desai's case, it would be 50 lakh minus 15 lakh, resulting in 35 lakh rupees as capital gains, Mr. Sharma elucidated. Ravi nodded, processing the information. But what if Mr. Desai had made some modifications to the car? Could he add those costs to the original purchase price? Excellent point. Any expenditure incurred for improvements or modifications can indeed be added to the cost of acquisition. If Mr. Desai spent an additional 5 lakh on restoring the car, his adjusted cost of acquisition would be 15 lakh plus 5 lakh, equaling 20 lakh. Thus, his capital gains would now be 50 lakh minus 20 lakh leading to 30 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Now, that's a significant reduction in taxable capital gains. But what if Mr. Desai had held onto the car for a longer time? Are there any special provisions for long-term assets? Ravi asked, intrigued. Yes. Section 50 also highlights the difference between long-term and short-term capital gains. If Mr. Desai had held the car for more than 36 months, the gains would be considered long-term capital gains. This is essential because long-term gains often attract a lower tax rate than short-term gains, Mr. Sharma informed him. So, if Mr. Desai qualifies for long-term capital gains, he could benefit from lower taxation? Ravi summarized. Exactly. But there's more. If the car was classified as a depreciable asset and Mr. Desai had claimed depreciation on it, there could be additional tax implications when selling the asset. This is where Section 50 comes into play further, Mr. Sharma said, shifting the discussion. Ravi's curiosity grew. What happens then? If Mr. Desai claimed depreciation on the car during the years he owned it, he would have to factor that into his capital gains calculation. The amount of depreciation claimed would be deducted from the cost of acquisition while calculating the taxable capital gains, Mr. Sharma explained. Interesting. So, if he claimed 2 lakh rupees in depreciation, the adjusted cost of acquisition would now be 18 lakh instead of 20 lakh. Therefore, his capital gains would be 50 lakh minus 18 lakh, equaling 32 lakh, Ravi concluded. Correct. Understanding these nuances is crucial for effective tax planning and advising clients, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Now, let's consider a different scenario. Suppose Mr. Desai decided to transfer the car to his son as a gift instead of selling it. How would that affect the capital gains tax? Ravi pondered for a moment. In that case, would it be treated as a gift? And would the capital gains tax still apply? Yes. According to Section 50, if the car is gifted, the recipient, in this case Mr. Desai's son, would take on the cost of acquisition as if he had bought it at the same price Mr. Desai paid for it. 
However, the tax implication would only arise when the son eventually sells the car, Mr. Sharma clarified. That's fascinating. So, if the son later sold the car for 70 lakh, he would calculate the capital gains based on Mr. Desai's original purchase price. Ravi asked, Exactly. The son would use Mr. Desai's cost of acquisition of 15 lakh, leading to capital gains of 70 lakh minus 15 lakh, resulting in 55 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. As their session wrapped up, Ravi felt a sense of accomplishment. Through Mr. Sharma's engaging storytelling and relatable case studies, he had gained a comprehensive understanding of Section 50 of the Direct Tax Code. With each lesson, he felt more equipped to assist clients with their tax planning needs and navigate the intricacies of capital gains taxation confidently. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a rainy afternoon, Ravi sat eagerly across from Mr. Sharma, his esteemed chartered accountant mentor. The two were ready to explore another intriguing section of the direct tax code. Today, they would delve into Section 51, which addresses the taxation of the profits and gains of business or profession, specifically concerning the treatment of certain payments made by an employer to an employee. Good afternoon, Ravi. Are you prepared for today's discussion? Mr. Sharma greeted him, his enthusiasm palpable. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, I'm excited to learn about Section 51. Ravi replied, adjusting his notebook. Let's kick off with a real-life case study to understand this section better. Meet Mr. Kumar, a successful entrepreneur who runs a manufacturing business. Last year, he decided to expand his operations and hired several new employees. To motivate his team, he implemented a performance bonus system. Mr. Sharma began, writing Mr. Kumar's details on the whiteboard. That sounds like a great strategy. How does Section 51 come into play here? Ravi asked, intrigued. Good question. Under Section 51, any payments made by an employer to employees that are classified as business expenses can be deducted from the total income of the business, which ultimately reduces the tax liability of the employer. Let's say Mr. Kumar set aside 2 lakh rupees for performance bonuses, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi nodded, absorbing the information. So, this means that Mr. Kumar can deduct that 2 lakh from his business income? Exactly. This section aims to encourage employers to invest in their employees' growth and productivity. If Mr. Kumar's net profit before bonuses was 10 lakh rupees, after deducting the bonus, his taxable income would be 8 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma clarified. Got it. But what if Mr. Kumar decides to give his employees additional benefits, like health insurance or training allowances? Would those also be deductible? Ravi inquired, wanting to understand the nuances. Great observation. Yes, the direct tax code allows deductions for certain fringe benefits as well, provided they meet specific conditions. For instance, health insurance premiums paid for employees can also be claimed as a deduction. Let's say Mr. Kumar paid 50,000 rupees for health insurance. He could deduct that too, Mr. Sharma elaborated. So, if we sum it all up, Mr. Kumar's total deductions would include 2 lakh for performance bonuses and 50,000 for health insurance. That totals 2 lakh 50,000, reducing his taxable income even further, Ravi deduced. Exactly. But there's more. Section 51 also highlights the concept of perquisites, Mr. Sharma added, flipping a page in his notes. Perquisites? What are those? Ravi asked, intrigued. Perquisites refer to additional benefits provided by an employer to employees, which can also be subject to taxation. If Mr. Kumar offers his employees a company car for personal use, the value of that benefit would be considered a perquisite. However, the employer must account for it when calculating their taxable income, Mr. Sharma explained. Interesting. So, if the value of the car for personal use is estimated at 30,000 rupees, Mr. Kumar would need to include that in the calculation of his expenses, right? Ravi asked. Correct. However, the value of perquisites is not directly deductible from the employer's income. Instead, it becomes taxable income for the employee. This means the employee must report the value of the perquisite while filing their income tax returns, Mr. Sharma clarified. Ravi's eyes lit up as he connected the dots. So... In the case of the company car, Mr. Kumar could claim the costs associated with providing the car, but the employee would need to pay taxes on the value of using the car personally. 
It's a two-way street. Exactly. Understanding the balance between employee benefits and tax implications is crucial for both employers and employees, Mr. Sharma affirmed. Let's take a look at another scenario. Suppose Mr. Kumar, as a goodwill gesture, decides to pay for his employees' family vacation expenses as a bonus. How would that impact the provisions of Section 51? Robbie pondered this for a moment. Since it's a personal benefit, I assume the vacation expense wouldn't be deductible as a business expense for Mr. Kumar? You are absolutely right. Personal expenses do not qualify for deductions under Section 51. The law is quite clear that such expenditures are considered personal in nature and therefore not deductible, Mr. Sharma explained. As their session drew to a close, Robbie felt invigorated by the wealth of knowledge he had gained. Mr. Sharma's engaging storytelling and practical case studies had illuminated the intricacies of Section 51 of the Direct Tax Code. Robbie now understood how crucial it was for business owners like Mr. Kumar to navigate employee-related expenses judiciously to optimize their tax liabilities while fostering a motivated workforce. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a sunny afternoon, Robbie arrived at Mr. Sharma's office, eager to continue his exploration of the direct tax code. Today, they would delve into Section 52, which discusses the taxation of income from capital gains. Mr. Sharma welcomed him with a warm smile, ready to impart his knowledge through engaging storytelling. Good afternoon, Ravi. Today, we're going to unravel the complexities of capital gains taxation under Section 52. Are you ready? Mr. Sharma asked, settling into his chair. Absolutely, sir. I can't wait to learn. Ravi replied enthusiastically. Let's start with a real-life scenario involving Ms. Gupta, a middle-class investor. A few years ago, she purchased a residential property for 50 lakh rupees. After a decade, the property's market value appreciated to 80 lakh rupees, and she decided to sell it. Mr. Sharma began, jotting down the key figures on a whiteboard. Ravi nodded, following along. So, if Ms. Gupta sells the property for 80 lakh, how does Section 52 come into play? Good question. Under Section 52, the capital gains are calculated as the difference between the sale price and the purchase price. In Ms. Gupta's case, her capital gain would be 80 lakh minus 50 lakh, resulting in a capital gain of 30 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Got it. But how is this amount taxed? Ravi inquired as curiosity peaked. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The tax treatment of capital gains is categorized into two types, short-term capital gains and long-term capital gains. Since Ms. Gupta held the property for more than two years, she qualifies for long-term capital gains treatment, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Ravi took a moment to process this information. What's the difference between short-term and long-term capital gains? Excellent question. Short-term capital gains apply when an asset is held for less than two years. These gains are taxed at the applicable income tax rate. In contrast, long-term capital gains, which apply to assets held for more than two years, are generally taxed at a lower rate of 20%, provided that the gains exceed a certain threshold, Mr. Sharma clarified. So, in Ms. Gupta's case, since she held her property for over two years, she would be taxed at the long-term capital gains rate, Robbie summarized. Precisely. Now, Let's discuss the implications of this. Ms. Gupta can also take advantage of certain exemptions available under Section 52. For instance, if she invests the capital gains from the sale of her property into another residential property within a specified time frame, she may be eligible for exemption from long-term capital gains tax, Mr. Sharma added. Robbie's eyes widened. That sounds beneficial. How does she prove that she has reinvested the money? Great question. Ms. Gupta must maintain proper documentation, including sale deeds, bank statements, and proof of the new property purchase. This documentation is crucial in case the tax authorities seek verification, Mr. Sharma emphasized. Let's say Ms. Gupta buys a new property for 60 lakh rupees using the capital gains. Would she then be exempt from paying tax on the entire 30 lakh gain? Ravi asked, trying to connect the dots. Close. Since she reinvested 60 lakh, which is more than the capital gain of 30 lakh, she can claim full exemption on the 30 lakh. 
However, any amount exceeding the capital gains that is not reinvested could be subject to taxation, Mr. Sharma explained. So, if she doesn't reinvest the remaining 10 lakh, that portion would be tax, Ravi confirmed. Exactly. It's important for Ms. Gupta to plan her investments carefully to maximize tax benefits, Mr. Sharma replied, clearly pleased with Ravi's understanding. Now let's consider another aspect. Suppose Ms. Gupta had also sold some shares of a company she owned. She bought them for 10 lakh and sold them for 15 lakh. How would that fit into Section 52? Ravi queried. Ah, this is where it gets more interesting. The sale of shares is also subject to capital gains taxation. Since Ms. Gupta held the shares for less than two years, she would incur short-term capital gains tax on the 5 lakh profit, which would be taxed at her applicable income tax slab, Mr. Sharma explained. I see. So, depending on how long she holds the asset, the tax treatment changes significantly, Robbie noted. Exactly. Understanding the nuances of capital gains is essential for making informed investment decisions. If Ms. Gupta were to hold the shares for more than two years, she would benefit from the long-term capital gains rate, Mr. Sharma concluded. As their discussion wrapped up, Ravi felt empowered with newfound knowledge about Section 52 of the Direct Tax Code. Mr. Sharma's storytelling approach, coupled with real-life examples, had made complex concepts more digestible. Ravi was now equipped with the understanding of how capital gains taxation worked and how strategic planning could lead to significant tax benefits in the world of investments. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. One breezy morning, Ravi entered Mr. Sharma's office, ready to absorb more wisdom about the direct tax code. Today, they would explore Section 53, which addresses the taxation of income in the context of property transactions. Mr. Sharma, known for his engaging storytelling, welcomed Ravi with enthusiasm. Good morning, Ravi. Are you prepared to dive into the details of Section 53? Mr. Sharma asked, gesturing for Ravi to take a seat. Good morning, sir. I'm excited to learn more today, Ravi replied, settling into his chair. Let's start with a real-life example involving Mr. Varma, a successful businessman who owned a commercial property in the heart of the city. A few years ago, he purchased the property for 1 crore rupees, and recently, he sold it for 1 crore 50 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma began, writing the figures on the board. Ravi nodded, absorbing the information. What does Section 53 say about this situation? Great question. Under Section 53, the income arising from the transfer of property is classified as capital gains. The capital gain is computed as the difference between the sale price and the cost of acquisition. In Mr. Varma's case, his capital gain would be 1 crore 50 lakh minus 1 crore, resulting in a capital gain of 50 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Okay, I understand that. But how does this gain get taxed? Ravi inquired. Now, this is where it becomes interesting. Mr. Varma held the property for more than two years, qualifying it for long-term capital gains treatment. This means that his capital gains would be taxed at a flat rate of 20%, rather than the higher rates applicable to short-term capital gains, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Ravi pondered this for a moment. What if Mr. Varma had not held the property for two years? How would that change things? If Mr. Varma sold the property within two years of purchasing it, the gains would be classified as short-term capital gains and taxed at his applicable income tax rate. This could be significantly higher depending on his overall income, Mr. Sharma clarified. That sounds like a big difference. Are there any exemptions available under Section 53? Ravi asked, intrigued. Yes, there are. If Mr. Varma reinvested the capital gains into another property, he could be eligible for exemption under certain provisions of the direct tax code. For example, if he decided to buy a new commercial property worth more than the capital gains amount, he could potentially avoid taxation on that gain, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi's eyes lit up. So, if he invests all 50 lakh into a new property, he wouldn't have to pay tax on that amount? Exactly. However, it's crucial for Mr. Varma to maintain proper documentation to prove the reinvestment. This includes sale deeds, bank statements, and proof of the new property purchase, Mr. Sharma added. Let's consider a different scenario. Suppose Mr. Varma also inherited a piece of land from his father. 
which he sold for 2 crore rupees. He had no records of the purchase price. How does Section 53 apply here? Robbie asked. Good question. In such cases, Section 53 provides a mechanism for determining the cost of acquisition. Since Mr. Varma inherited the land, the cost of acquisition is considered to be the fair market value on the date of his father's death. This means that the capital gains tax would be calculated based on the difference between the selling price and this fair market value, Mr. Sharma explained. So, if the fair market value at the time of inheritance was 1 crore 50 lakh, his capital gain would be 50 lakh rupees? Robbie calculated. Correct. And since he held the land for more than two years, he would qualify for long-term capital gains tax treatment. This is beneficial for him, Mr. Sharma confirmed. Are there any other situations where Section 53 is applicable? Robbie asked, eager to explore more scenarios. Yes, indeed. Let's discuss the case of Ms. Joshi, a property developer. She often buys properties to develop and sell. If she purchases a property for 50 lakh and sells it for 70 lakh within a year, that would be considered a short-term capital gain since she held it for less than two years, Mr. Sharma illustrated. So, she would be taxed at her income tax slab rate? Ravi inquired. Exactly. This highlights the importance of holding periods in determining tax liabilities. Ms. Joshi's profits from quick property flips would be taxed more heavily than someone like Mr. Varma, who held his property for a longer period, Mr. Sharma elaborated. As their discussion came to an end, Robbie felt empowered with a deep understanding of Section 53 and its implications in real-life situations. Mr. Sharma's engaging storytelling and practical examples had made the complexities of property transactions and taxation accessible and relatable. Robbie left the office that day, ready to apply his newfound knowledge in the world of finance and investments. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. One sunny afternoon, Ravi entered Mr. Sharma's office, feeling eager to learn more about the intricacies of the direct tax code. Today, Mr. Sharma would be explaining Section 54, which deals with the tax exemptions available on the sale of residential properties. Mr. Sharma's reputation for weaving real-life case studies into his lessons made Ravi excited for the session. Good afternoon, Ravi. Are you ready to dive into Section 54? Mr. Sharma greeted him warmly. Good afternoon, sir. Absolutely. I can't wait to learn. Ravi replied, his enthusiasm evident. Let's start with the story of Mr. Kapoor, a middle-aged software engineer. A few years ago, he bought a flat for 50 lakh rupees. After living there for a long time, he decided to sell it for 1 crore rupees. He's now looking to reinvest the proceeds in another residential property. Can you guess what happens next under Section 54? Mr. Sharma began, setting the stage. Hmm, I think if he reinvests, he might get some tax benefits. Ravi speculated. Spot on. Under Section 54, if Mr. Kapoor sells a residential property and reinvests the gains into another residential property, he can claim exemption on the capital gains. The amount exempted would be the lower of the capital gains or the amount invested in the new property, Mr. Sharma explained, writing down the figures. Ravi leaned in intrigued. So if he sells the flat for one crore and buys a new one for 70 lakh, he can avoid paying tax on 70 lakh? Exactly. In Mr. Kapoor's case, his capital gain would be 1 crore minus 50 lakh, resulting in a gain of 50 lakh rupees. Since he is reinvesting the entire amount, he can claim the exemption and pay no tax on the gains, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Great. But what if he didn't reinvest all the money? Ravi asked, curious about the nuances. Good question. Let's consider another scenario. If Mr. Kapoor sold the flat for 1 crore, and bought a new property for 50 lakh, he would only be eligible for exemption on the amount he invested. In this case, he would be liable to pay tax on the remaining amount, which is 50 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi nodded, absorbing the information. Are there any conditions for claiming this exemption? Certainly. To qualify for the exemption under Section 54, the new residential property must be purchased within one year before or two years after the sale of the original property. Alternatively, if Mr. Kapoor constructs a new residential house, he has three years to do so, Mr. Sharma added, emphasizing the timelines. Ravi's mind buzzed with thoughts. 
And what if he chooses not to reinvest at all? If Mr. Kapoor does not reinvest the gains in a new residential property, he would have to pay tax on the entire capital gain of 50 lakh rupees. That's why many individuals opt to reinvest to minimize their tax liabilities, Mr. Sharma pointed out. Let's consider a different example to deepen my understanding. Suppose Mr. Joshi inherited a residential property from his father and sold it for one crore. He had no records of the purchase price since it was inherited. How does Section 54 apply in this case? Ravi asked. Excellent question. In cases of inherited property, the cost of acquisition is considered to be the fair market value at the time of the original owner's death. If Mr. Joshi inherited the property worth 70 lakh, then his capital gains would be calculated as 1 crore minus 70 lakh, which amounts to 30 lakh rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. Got it? If he reinvests the entire 30 lakh into a new residential property, he wouldn't have to pay tax at all? Ravi checked. Exactly. As long as he reinvests within the stipulated timelines under Section 54, he can fully exempt his capital gains, Mr. Sharma confirmed. As their discussion continued, Ravi was eager to explore the implications of this section in more depth. What about cases involving multiple properties? How does that work under Section 54? Great question. Let's take the example of Ms. Mehta, who sells two residential properties within a short time frame. If she sells both properties and reinvests the total capital gains into one new property, she can claim the exemption for the entire amount as long as it doesn't exceed the purchase price of the new property, Mr. Sharma explained. So, if she sells both properties for a total of one crore and invests all of it in a new house, she wouldn't have to pay any tax. Ravi asked. Exactly. However, she must be cautious about how much she reinvests relative to the gains. If she only invests 80 lakh in the new property, the remaining 20 lakh would be subject to capital gains tax, Mr. Sharma added. As their session came to a close, Ravi felt enriched with a comprehensive understanding of Section 54. Mr. Sharma's ability to relate the provisions to real-life situations made the complexities of taxation feel approachable and practical. Ravi left the office that day with a newfound confidence ready to apply these insights in his future financial endeavors. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. One afternoon, as the sun bathed the city in a warm glow, Ravi entered Mr. Sharma's office, excited to learn about another aspect of the direct tax code. Today's lesson would focus on Section 55, which deals with the provisions regarding the cost of acquisition and improvement of capital assets. Mr. Sharma was known for his captivating storytelling, and Ravi was eager to hear a new case study. Good afternoon, Ravi. Are you ready to explore Section 55 today? Mr. Sharma asked with a smile. Good afternoon, sir. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Ravi replied, settling into his seat. Let's dive into the story of Mr. Singh, a successful businessman who inherited a piece of land from his father 20 years ago. When his father passed away, Mr. Singh took over the property, which was valued at 10 lakh rupees at that time. Last year, he sold the land for 50 lakh rupees. Can you guess how Section 55 applies to his situation? Mr. Sharma began, outlining the scenario. Hmm, I think the cost of acquisition will play a role in determining his capital gains? Ravi speculated. Correct. Under Section 55, when Mr. Singh sells the property, he must determine the cost of acquisition. In inherited property cases, the cost is considered the fair market value at the time of the previous owner's death. Since the property was valued at 10 lakh rupees when Mr. Singh inherited it, that is his cost of acquisition, Mr. Sharma explained, jotting down the figures on a whiteboard. Robbie leaned forward intrigued. So if he sold the property for 50 lakh, the capital gain would be 40 lakh? Exactly. His capital gain is calculated as the selling price of 50 lakh minus the cost of acquisition of 10 lakh, resulting in a gain of 40 lakh rupees. Now, what if Mr. Singh had made improvements to the property, such as building a house or doing renovations? Mr. Sharma added, shifting the narrative. Would those expenses add to the cost of acquisition? Ravi asked, eager to understand the nuances. Absolutely. Section 55 also allows Mr. Singh to add the cost of improvements made to the property 
when calculating his capital gains. If he spent an additional 15 lakh on constructing a house on that land, his total cost of acquisition would now be 10 lakh plus 15 lakh, equaling 25 lakh, Mr. Sharma explained, expanding on the calculation. Robbie's eyes lit up. So if he sold the property for 50 lakh and had a total cost of 25 lakh, he would only have a capital gain of 25 lakh. Precisely. Mr. Singh would report a capital gain of 25 lakh, significantly reducing his tax liability, Mr. Sharma affirmed, pleased with Ravi's understanding. Are there any limits to the improvements he can include? Ravi inquired, curious about potential restrictions. Great question. While there's no specific limit on the cost of improvements that can be claimed, the expenses must be genuinely incurred for enhancing the value of the property. Routine maintenance or repairs, however, do not qualify. For instance, if Mr. Singh merely painted the house or fixed leaks, those costs cannot be included, Mr. Sharma clarified. Ravi nodded, grasping the concept well. So it's important to keep track of all the significant improvements and their costs. Exactly. Maintaining proper documentation of these expenses will help Mr. Singh justify the claims during tax assessments. Now, let's consider a different scenario to reinforce your understanding. Mr. Sharma suggested. Sure. What's the new scenario? Ravi asked, eager to learn more. Let's say Mr. Gupta, a friend of Mr. Singh, purchased a property years ago for 12 lakh. He then invested 20 lakh in extensive renovations. After many years, he decides to sell the property for 60 lakh. How would Section 55 work for him? Mr. Sharma asked. His capital gains would be calculated as the selling price minus the total cost of acquisition which includes the purchase price and renovation costs, Ravi deduced. Exactly. Mr. Gupta's total cost of acquisition would be 12 lakh plus 20 lakh, totaling 32 lakh. Therefore, the capital gains would be 60 lakh minus 32 lakh, resulting in 28 lakh, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi pondered for a moment. What if Mr. Gupta also inherited a property from his uncle that was valued at 15 lakh at the time of inheritance? If he sold both properties in one year, how would that affect his tax situation? Ah, good thinking. In this case, Mr. Gupta would need to calculate the capital gains for each property separately. The inherited property would have its cost determined by the fair market value at the time of his uncle's passing. If he sold it for 50 lakh and its value was 15 lakh, the capital gain would be 35 lakh, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Then, he combined the gains from both properties totaling 28 lakh from the first property and 35 lakh from the inherited property, resulting in a total capital gain of 63 lakh. Ravi calculated. Exactly. By understanding the provisions of Section 55, Mr. Gupta can strategically manage his tax liabilities. It's crucial to have accurate records of acquisition costs and improvements made to the properties, Mr. Sharma concluded. Ravi left the office feeling empowered with knowledge about Section 55. Mr. Sharma's engaging storytelling style made complex tax provisions feel manageable and relatable, allowing Ravi to appreciate the practical applications of tax regulations in real-life scenarios. As he stepped out into the bustling streets, Ravi felt confident in his ability to navigate the intricacies of the direct tax code, especially the nuances of capital gains and property transactions. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. One bright afternoon, Ravi found himself in the office of Mr. Sharma, a seasoned chartered accountant known for his engaging storytelling and practical insights into the direct tax code. Today, they would delve into Section 56, which primarily deals with the taxation of income from other sources, including gifts, money, and certain assets. Good afternoon, Ravi. I hope you're ready to explore some fascinating provisions of Section 56 today. Mr. Sharma greeted, settling comfortably in his chair. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, I'm excited to learn more about it, Ravi replied enthusiastically. Let me tell you a story about Ms. Mira, who recently received a substantial gift from her grandfather. As part of his estate planning, her grandfather gifted her a sum of 50 lakh rupees on her wedding. This gift, while generous, falls under the scrutiny of Section 56. Can you guess how this section might affect Ms. Mira? Mr. Sharma began. Ravi thought for a moment. If it's a gift, does she have to pay taxes on it? Exactly. 
Section 56 states that any sum of money received without consideration, like a gift, is taxable as income under the head income from other sources if it exceeds a certain threshold. As of now, if the total value of gifts received in a financial year exceeds 50,000 rupees, the entire amount is taxable. In Ms. Mira's case, since she received 50 lakh rupees, the entire amount would be taxable, Mr. Sharma explained, writing down the key points. Oh no! So her grandfather's gift could lead to a significant tax bill. Ravi asked, concerned for Ms. Mira. Indeed! However, there are certain exemptions under Section 56. Gifts from relatives, including grandparents, parents, siblings, and even spouses, are exempt from taxation. This means that Ms. Mira would not need to pay tax on the 50 lakh rupees she received from her grandfather. Mr. Sharma reassured Ravi. That's a relief. But what if she had received a gift from a friend? Ravi inquired, curious about the distinctions. Good question. If Ms. Mira had received a gift from a friend or a non-relative that exceeded 50,000 rupees, she would be liable to pay tax on the entire amount. This applies to any gifts received in cash or in kind from non-relatives, Mr. Sharma clarified. Let's say she received a luxury car worth 30 lakh from a friend. Would that also be taxable? Ravi asked, eager to grasp the concept. Yes, that's correct. The fair market value of the car would be considered. And since it exceeds 50,000 rupees, the entire amount would be taxable as income under Section 56. This highlights the importance of understanding how different sources of income are treated under tax laws, Mr. Sharma emphasized. Ravi nodded, taking notes. So Ms. Mira must be careful about the sources of her gifts to avoid unexpected tax liabilities. Absolutely. Now, let's consider another scenario involving Mr. Raghav, who is a well-known artist. He recently sold a painting for 10 crore rupees to a businessman. Upon receiving the payment, he realized that the transaction could also fall under the provisions of Section 56. Can you think of why? Mr. Sharma posed the question. Ravi thought critically. Perhaps because he received an unusually high payment for a single painting? Precisely. In addition to gifts, Section 56 also applies to certain transactions that might be deemed as income from other sources. If the sale price exceeds the fair market value significantly, the tax authorities may scrutinize the transaction. If Mr. Raghav had a previous valuation of the painting at 5 crore, the authorities could question the remaining 5 crore as a form of income, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Ravi frowned slightly, trying to understand. So Mr. Raghav needs to have proper documentation and justification for the sale price to avoid issues? Exactly. Proper documentation is crucial. If Mr. Raghav can demonstrate that the 10 crore sale was justifiable based on market conditions and demand, he can mitigate tax implications. Additionally, the excess amount over the fair market value could be taxed as income under Section 56, Mr. Sharma emphasized. Wow, so it's important for artists and sellers to maintain accurate records of their transactions, especially when large sums are involved, Ravi realized. Absolutely. And there's also the aspect of gifts received in kind, which can be tricky. For instance, if Ms. Mira received jewelry worth 20 lakh from her aunt, it would also be taxable unless the total value of all gifts from non-relatives stays below the threshold, Mr. Sharma mentioned. Ravi asked, what if she received multiple smaller gifts that collectively exceeded 50,000? Good point. Any combination of gifts from non-relatives, regardless of their individual values, that exceeds 50,000 rupees would be taxable. Ms. Mira would need to report the total value, Mr. Sharma explained. As their session came to an end, Ravi felt more confident in his understanding of Section 56 and its implications for various scenarios. Mr. Sharma's engaging storytelling had brought clarity to the complexities of tax regulations, especially concerning income from gifts and transactions. Thank you, sir. I now have a clearer grasp of how Section 56 operates. It's fascinating how tax laws impact personal finances, Ravi remarked, grateful for the insights. You're welcome, Ravi. Always remember that understanding these provisions not only helps in compliance, but also in making informed financial decisions, Mr. Sharma advised, smiling warmly as Ravi left the office.
eager to explore the world of taxation further. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a sunny afternoon, Robbie was back in the cozy office of Mr. Sharma, the renowned chartered accountant known for his engaging teaching style. Today, they were set to explore Section 57 of the Direct Tax Code, which deals with income from other sources and the expenses that can be deducted from such income. Good afternoon, Robbie. Ready for another insightful session? Mr. Sharma greeted, settling into his chair. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, I'm eager to learn more about Section 57, Ravi replied with enthusiasm. Let's dive into the story of Mr. Arjun, a freelance photographer. Arjun is passionate about his work and earns his income from various assignments, but he also incurs several expenses in the process. Last year, he made a profit of 3 lakh rupees from his photography assignments. However, he spent about 50,000 rupees on camera equipment, travel, and marketing to promote his services. How do you think Section 57 might apply to him? Mr. Sharma began. Ravi thought for a moment. Since he earned money from his work, he might be able to deduct his expenses from his total income? Exactly. Section 57 allows taxpayers to deduct any expenditure incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of earning income. In Arjun's case, he can deduct the 50,000 rupees he spent on equipment, travel, and marketing from his 3 lakh rupees of income. This means his taxable income would be reduced to 2 lakh 50,000 rupees, Mr. Sharma explained. That sounds fair. So, if he can prove that these expenses were necessary for his work, he won't be taxed on the full 3 lakh rupees. Robbie asked, trying to connect the dots. Precisely. Proper documentation is key. Arjun should keep receipts and records of all his expenditures. It's not just about having expenses. They need to be justifiable and directly related to his income-generating activities, Mr. Sharma noted. Can you give me an example of a non-deductible expense? Ravi asked, curious about the boundaries of the provisions. Great question. Let's consider Mr. Anil, who is also a photographer, but decides to splurge on a luxury car worth 10 lakh rupees. While he might claim that the car helps him reach different locations for his assignments, Section 57 wouldn't allow him to deduct this expense. Why do you think that is? Mr. Sharma challenged Ravi. Hmm, because the car isn't necessary for his work? It's more of a personal choice. Ravi speculated. Exactly. The expense needs to be wholly and exclusively for the purpose of earning income. A luxury car could be seen as a personal choice rather than a necessity for his business. This distinction is crucial for anyone looking to claim deductions under Section 57, Mr. Sharma clarified. What about expenses like insurance or utility bills? Ravi probed further. Good point. Expenses like insurance for his camera equipment or electricity bills incurred for a home office could be deductible provided he can demonstrate that these expenses are directly linked to his income-generating activities. For instance, if Arjun has a home office where he edits photos, a portion of his electricity bill might be deductible, Mr. Sharma explained. Ravi nodded, realizing the nuances of the deductions. So, it's about proving the connection between the expense and the income generated? Exactly. Now, let's consider a scenario involving Ms. Kavita who runs a small boutique. She earns income from selling clothing, but also incurs some expenses. Last year, she made 5 lakh rupees in sales, but she spent 75,000 rupees on fabric, rent for her shop, and advertising. Can you figure out her taxable income using Section 57? Mr. Sharma asked. Sure. If she deducts 75,000 from her 5 lakh rupees of income, her taxable income would be for lakh 25,000 rupees, Ravi calculated. Correct. By understanding Section 57, Kavita can minimize her taxable income effectively. It empowers small business owners to keep track of their legitimate expenses and reduce their tax liabilities, Mr. Sharma praised. What happens if someone has capital gains as well as income from other sources? Can they still apply the same rules? Ravi inquired. Intrigued by the complexities of taxation. Excellent question. If someone like Ms. Kavita also sold a piece of property and earned capital gains, the treatment would differ. Capital gains have their own set of rules under the direct tax code. However, 
any expenses related to earning that capital gain could potentially be deducted under the relevant sections. It's essential to maintain clarity and separation between different types of income, Mr. Sharma explained. Wow, it's fascinating how taxes work. So many details to consider, Ravi exclaimed. Indeed, let's summarize what we've learned today. Section 57 allows taxpayers to deduct expenses incurred to earn income from other sources, as long as they can prove the expenses are wholly and exclusively for that purpose. It's vital to maintain proper documentation to substantiate any claims, Mr. Sharma concluded. As Ravi left Mr. Sharma's office, he felt empowered with knowledge about Section 57 and the implications of deducting expenses from income. The real-life examples had not only clarified the provisions, but also sparked a deeper interest in the world of taxation. With newfound confidence, he looked forward to applying these principles in his future endeavors. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. One rainy afternoon, Ravi entered the familiar office of Mr. Sharma, the renowned chartered accountant, eager to learn about the provisions of Section 58 of the Direct Tax Code. Today, they were set to explore how this section deals with the taxation of income from capital gains, particularly concerning the sale of capital assets. Good afternoon, Ravi. Ready to dive into some intriguing cases? Mr. Sharma greeted, gesturing for Ravi to take a seat. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, I'm excited to learn about Section 58, Ravi replied as curiosity peaked. Let's begin with the story of Mr. Rohan who recently sold a piece of land he inherited from his grandfather. He sold it for 10 million rupees, but the cost at which his grandfather acquired it was just 1 million rupees. Now, according to Section 58, how do you think the capital gains will be calculated? Mr. Sharma inquired. Ravi thought carefully. Since the selling price is 10 million and the cost of acquisition is 1 million, the capital gain would be 9 million rupees? Exactly. The capital gain is calculated as the difference between the sale price and the cost of acquisition. So, Rohan's capital gain is indeed 9 million rupees. However, Section 58 also allows certain deductions. Can you guess what they might be? Mr. Sharma prompted. Maybe expenses related to the sale? Ravi suggested, recalling the importance of deductibility. Right? Under Section 58, Rohan can deduct any expenses incurred while selling the property, such as brokerage fees or legal costs. Let's say he incurred 200,000 rupees in these expenses. What would his taxable capital gain be then? Mr. Sharma asked. Ah, so if we subtract 200,000 from 9 million, that leaves him with 8,800,000 rupees of taxable capital gain. Ravi calculated, his confidence growing. Spot on. This is where understanding the provisions becomes essential. However, Section 58 has specific rules regarding the holding period of the asset. If Rohan held the land for more than 24 months, it qualifies as a long-term capital asset. This distinction is crucial because long-term capital gains are taxed at a lower rate than short-term gains. Can you tell me what happens if he held the land for less than 24 months? Mr. Sharma explained. If he held it for less than 24 months, then it would be treated as a short-term capital asset, and he would be taxed at his regular income tax rate? Ravi responded, piecing together the implications. Exactly. This is a significant consideration for taxpayers like Rowan. Let's move on to another scenario involving Ms. Priya, who is an avid investor. Last year, she sold shares of a company that she held for more than a year, earning a profit of 500,000 rupees. Can you identify the capital gains implications for her? Mr. Sharma asked. Since she held the shares for more than a year, that would qualify as long-term capital gains, which are generally exempt from tax under Section 58, Ravi recalled, recalling his previous lessons. Correct. However, the government introduced a condition where long-term capital gains above 1 lakh rupees are taxable at a rate of 10%. So, in Priya's case, since her gain is below 1 lakh, she wouldn't pay any tax. If she had earned 600,000 instead, she would be liable to pay tax on 500,000, right? Mr. Sharma clarified. Yes, that makes sense. I can see how important it is for investors to track their capital gains and losses, Ravi agreed, feeling enlightened by the discussion. Let's now consider Mr. Deepak, 
who had incurred a capital loss on the sale of his old car, which he sold for one lakh rupees but had purchased for one and a half lakh rupees. How does Section 58 come into play for him? Mr. Sharma posed another question. Since he sold the car at a loss, he might be able to set off that loss against any capital gains he has from other assets? Ravi speculated. Precisely. This is known as offsetting capital gains with capital losses. If Deepak has any other capital gains, he can deduct this loss from them, thereby reducing his overall taxable income. If he doesn't have any gains in that year, he can carry forward the loss to subsequent years, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Wow, that's a smart way to manage taxes. So, is there a specific process for carrying forward those losses? Robbie asked, intrigued by the tax planning aspect. Yes, to carry forward a capital loss, Deepak must file his tax return in the year the loss occurred and indicate the intention to carry it forward. He can then offset the loss against future gains in the subsequent years, but it's essential to do it within a specified period, Mr. Sharma explained. Thanks, sir. It's fascinating how all these provisions interact with each other. Section 58 seems to offer various opportunities for managing capital gains effectively, Ravi said, feeling grateful for the insights. Exactly, Ravi. Let's summarize what we've learned today. Section 58 outlines the taxation of capital gains, distinguishing between short-term and long-term assets, and allows for the deduction of certain expenses. It also provides opportunities to offset losses against gains, which can significantly impact one's overall tax liability. Mr. Sharma concluded. As Ravi left the office, the rain had stopped, but his mind was buzzing with new knowledge. He felt equipped to navigate the complexities of capital gains taxation and looked forward to applying these lessons in his studies and future financial decisions. The real-life examples had not only made the provisions clearer, but had also ignited a passion for understanding the intricacies of taxation. Please share, subscribe, like, comment, and press the bell icon. On a bright Saturday morning, Robbie found himself seated in the inviting office of Mr. Sharma, the well-respected chartered accountant known for his engaging storytelling style. Today's topic was particularly interesting. The provisions of Section 59 of the Direct Tax Code. Good morning, Robbie. Ready to delve into Section 59? Mr. Sharma greeted him with a warm smile. Good morning, sir. Yes, I'm looking forward to it, Robbie replied enthusiastically. Let's kick things off with a case study about Ms. Anjali, who recently inherited a substantial sum of money from her late uncle's estate. This money was not directly from a business, and she plans to invest it in various assets. Under Section 59, since the inheritance itself is not taxable, it would be treated as a capital receipt. But if she invests that money and earns interest or dividends, those earnings would be subject to tax as income from other sources, Ravi explained recalling the provisions he had studied. Exactly. Let's say she earns 50,000 rupees in interest over the year. How would that affect her tax liability? Mr. Sharma inquired. Since the interest is considered income from other sources, it would be added to her total income, and she would pay tax according to her applicable income tax slab, Ravi responded, starting to grasp the practical implications. Great. Now... Let's explore another scenario involving Mr. Suresh, who runs a small manufacturing business. Last year, he received a gift of shares worth 300,000 rupees from his friend. How would this gift be treated under Section 59? Mr. Sharma continued, Gifts are generally not taxable if they come from relatives, but if Suresh sells the shares later, the income from that sale would be taxable as capital gains, Ravi noted, remembering the nuances of gift taxation. Spot on. However, if Suresh receives gifts from non-relatives, and if the value exceeds 50,000 rupees, it will be taxable as income from other sources. Let's assume that Suresh received another gift of jewelry valued 75,000 rupees from a non-relative. How would that work under Section 59? Mr. Sharma pressed. Since the jewelry exceeds the 50,000 threshold, that amount would be taxable as income from other sources, right? Ravi answered, feeling more confident. Correct. Section 59 specifically addresses the income that arises from various sources, including gifts and winnings. Now, let's shift our focus to Mr. Vikram, who won a lottery worth 1 million rupees. What do you think about the tax implications for him? 
Mr. Sharma posed another scenario. Winnings from lotteries are treated as income from other sources, so he would be liable to pay tax on that entire amount. I believe there's a specific rate for lottery winnings. Ravi recalled, You're absolutely right. Lottery winnings are taxed at a flat rate of 30%. Therefore, Vikram would pay 300,000 rupees in tax, leaving him with 700,000 after tax, Mr. Sharma elaborated. Ravi nodded, impressed by the simplicity of the calculation. So, the tax treatment of income from other sources can significantly impact individuals like Vikram. Exactly. It's essential for taxpayers to understand the provisions in Section 59 to ensure compliance and effective financial planning. Let's discuss one more case involving Ms. Nita, who has a side gig as a freelance graphic designer. She earns around 200,000 rupees a year from her freelance work, which she has not declared yet. How would that income be treated? Mr. Sharma asked. Since she is earning from freelance work, that income should be declared under income from other sources as per Section 59. It is essential for her to report that income while filing her tax returns, Ravi responded, realizing the importance of reporting all sources of income. Absolutely, Ms. Nita must declare her freelance earnings to comply with tax regulations. Failure to do so could lead to penalties or fines. Additionally, she could claim any business-related expenses to reduce her taxable income, Mr. Sharma added. Thank you, sir. It's clear that understanding Section 59 is crucial for individuals dealing with various forms of income. Each scenario has its own implications that one must navigate carefully, Ravi concluded, feeling empowered with knowledge. Indeed, Ravi. To summarize, Section 59 addresses income from various sources, including gifts, winnings, and freelance income. It emphasizes the importance of declaring all income to avoid legal repercussions. Always remember that tax compliance is essential for financial health, Mr. Sharma said, wrapping up their discussion. As Ravi left the office, he reflected on the valuable lessons he had learned. The real-life case studies made the provisions come alive, providing him with a deeper understanding of how tax regulations affect individuals in their everyday lives. Excited about his newfound knowledge, Ravi was eager to apply it in his studies and future endeavors.